So uh, we'll call to order in just a minute here. Uh, stand by. Uh, if clerks could alert councillors on the chat that we're about to do roll call. Uh, we're just pulling all the technology together again. Thank you for joining us. Please bear with us. Good morning. Um, Good morning. Sorry, I have too many windows open here. Pardon me. So I will call this continuation on today, June 17th, of the non-statutory public hearing on the motion uh, regarding the Edmonton Police Commission that was uh, made last week, and this meeting started on June 15th. Um, it will continue for sure into next week, well, well, definitely into next week. Council added time uh, on Monday. I understand overnight there have been an additional 40 plus registrations. So uh, those of you who have heard back, uh, who are following along, um, who got a note indicating that the panels are full, what that means is that the panels that are available um, in the calendar right now are full. We will have to schedule additional time uh, for the additional uh, panels. Uh, to accommodate all folks who have registered to speak as well as anyone else who registers between now and noon, which uh, was uh, where the close of registrations was set by council by motion yesterday. So please get us your registrations by noon if you haven't already so that we can determine precisely how much time is needed to accommodate all of the other panels because we do wish to hear from everybody, of course. Uh, so the process for this, the fifth panel, uh, and all of the panels, but particularly for this morning and, and for uh, the two other panels this afternoon, is that uh, speakers have been organized into panels and will present to council in the order in which they registered with the city. Each speaker will have five minutes to speak. The clerk will run a timer in the room, but you may wish to run your own timer to pace yourself accordingly. Once you've finished speaking, please mute your microphone, but stay on the line as council may wish to ask you questions. After all speakers within the panel have made their presentations, each councillor will be given five minutes to ask one round of questions if they wish. After each panel, a short recess will be called to allow us to set up the next panel of presenters. In this case, that will happen over lunch. Uh, and, and panel um, seven or six will be at 1.30. Uh, if you wish to listen and follow along, in the meeting after your panel is complete, members of panel number five, please use the live stream which is available on edmonton.ca slash meetings. This process does require patience from all of us to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has an opportunity to do so. So please refrain from using the chat function during the meeting as it does create issues of decorum potentially. It can provide unfair advantage uh, and may distract speakers, and it does interfere technologically with the live stream. So uh, additionally, uh, please remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions from councillors. If you're experiencing any difficulties whatsoever, the Office of the City Clerk has resources available to facilitate communication with participants. Please reach out using the contact information provided in the reply to your registration. A speaker's list for each panel will be provided on edmonton.ch slash meetings for your reference. Um, I will now conduct a roll call of members of council and then we'll roll call the panel and then we'll dive into it. So uh, this morning I will start with Councillor Banga. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning. Councillor Carmel. Good morning. Welcome. Councillor Katarina. 
Good morning, Mr. Mayor. Good morning, Councillor Zadig. I am here. Welcome, Councillor Essinger. Good morning, I'm present. Good morning, Councillor Hamilton. Present. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Morning. Morning, Councillor Knack. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor McKean. Good morning. Welcome, Councillor Nickel. Good morning. Good morning, Councillor Paquette. Good morning. Welcome, and Councillor Walters. I'm here, sir. Good morning. Welcome. That's everybody. Appreciate uh, you all turning out this morning. Uh, I'll now check with uh, the panelists and make sure that uh, we can hear them all and they are able to handle their mute buttons. Uh, so, uh, um, Ashlyn Forrester, uh, Forstner. Morning. And please correct my uh, pronunciation um, if... Uh, and apologies in advance. Uh, speaker number two, Rene Vajois, has withdrawn. Uh, speaker number three is Tiffany Walsh. Are you there, Tiffany? Yep, I just unmuted myself. Good morning. Welcome. Good morning. Uh, speaker number four is Kadar Jama from Somaliland Community in Alberta. Yep, I'm here. Welcome. Meyer, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, fifth is Scott Fenwick. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Number six is Roma Schroeder. Roma, are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Uh, number seven is, and, and I should say, make note of the number and the order uh, in which uh, you are speaking so that you have a sense when you're coming up and, and can be ready to unmute yourself. Uh, number seven is Troy Alton. Good morning. Welcome. Number eight is Curtis Hoople from the Alberta Federation of Police Associations. Morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, number nine is Layla Baloney. Hi, good morning. Uh, Bellany. Bellany. Thank you. Thank you. Um, apologies for that. Uh, as someone who gets Iverson a lot, and I'm sorry, I know what that feels like, sorry. <laughs> um, number 10 is Chantel Phillips. Good morning. Welcome, thank you. Uh, number 11 is Sky Perry. Sky Perry. Good morning. Good morning. Um, number 12 is Dunya New from the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council. They have not checked in yet this morning. Okay, well hopefully uh, Dunia is able to join us by about 10.30 at the rate we're going here um, to be heard. Um, uh, 13 is Lan Bui. Present. Welcome. Uh, number 14 is Taylor Soroka. Who also has not checked in yet. Also has not checked in, okay. And 15 is Timothy Liu. Also not checked in, but we did have notice that they may be joining late. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, <clears throat> well, appreciate uh, all of you who've, um, who are early in the panel, who are, who are on deck, in case we get to you a little faster. The, the pace of these things is sometimes uh, unpredictable, but uh, uh, we appreciate you being here and hope the others are able to join us during their allotted time. Uh, okay, uh, Ashlyn? Uh, hello. Welcome. Go ahead. Oh, all right. Um, hi, uh, I live in Ward 10 in Pleasant View. Uh, my city council member is Michael Walters. Um, I would like to speak on my own experiences and kind of my relationship with this own, with this motion. Um, so a few weeks ago, uh, a friend and I experienced a physical assault, a stranger shot mace in our faces at point blank range. This was in broad daylight with many witnesses. Uh, and there was video footage of the incident very soon after, uh, we reported it to the police who then said they would follow up with us the next morning. Um, and it's been three weeks since then. We haven't heard anything, but, um, in a way, I guess I'm, I'm glad, obviously, I had to call the police to prevent him from harming others. Um, and right now, our only option for that is the police. But 
I don't want this man who is clearly not in the right mind to understand what was going on around him to be punished. It doesn't undo our hurt to relegate another person who is lost to the lost in the cracks to, you know, the racist police system and the prison system. But when I read this motion, I see a more just version of this incident play out. Um, I see the beginnings of a city where maybe before this happened, we could have called for emergency psychological services to prevent any, any harm or any further harm to both himself and to others, or of course, with the proper resources redirected to mental health, addictions, homelessness, whatever issue it was that he was facing, of course, this wouldn't have happened at all. Um, instead, the Edmonton police, which makes up hundreds of millions of the Edmonton city budget, has completely not responded to this call um, about a violent crime. We haven't heard anything back, even just a follow-up, like we're working on it. Um, but our mental health care system, which would have prevented this whole thing, continues to languish and is inaccessible for many who need it. Um, I very much believe, based on these experiences, that the funds and resources would have been better spent, diverted towards caring for our citizens before they resort to crime. And uh, that is why I am in support of this motion. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, next is Tiffany Walsh. Hi. Hi. Um, so I live in Ward 3, and I'm basically just speaking here today both um, kind of from a personal perspective and also um, from a professional who actually does advocacy and intervention work in family violence in our city. Um, so it's kind of twofold. I support this motion, uh, one, because police response and uh, more broadly, the carceral system in and of itself uh, is not effective in terms of meaningfully intervening with and preventing family violence and sexual violence. Um, and I see this play out not just in my professional experience, I've seen it play out in my personal experience, and it's also um, within the research. In terms of evidence-based practice, um, we all know that punishment and, and retributive justice are not actually meaningful ways to engage with and deal with things that are largely caused by uh, poverty and mental illness. Um, and so what I'm seeing the EPS do is, instead of really addressing the issues, um, we're funneling money into a system that simply just criminalizes poverty and trauma, whereas if we took our funding and put it into initiatives like affordable housing, um, like increasing our uh, 211 services and our mobile mental health unit, um, I think we would see a lot more progress happen, um, whereas now what I'm seeing is um, largely inexperienced officers who have, uh, you know, a variety of ways of um, dealing with mental health crises come in and either make situations worse and escalate the situation such that myself and my team have to actually tell police to leave so that we can try to deal with the situation. Um, or, on the other hand, I see a lot of survivors being very terrified to even report their experiences with their abusers. Um, another thing that I'm seeing is a lot of dual charging, and I won't lie, it's predominantly happening only to Indigenous people and people of colour who are reporting um, situations of family violence to the police. And I don't know where that's coming from, but I do believe that there is a level of systemic bias that is very present within our force. And so, um, with all of these different barriers, People don't feel supported. Um, a lot of individuals don't trust reporting uh, their you know, situations to the police, and rightfully so, because oftentimes it can backfire. And I've even seen this in my own personal life, where um, my little brother is a young boy of color, and um, on several occasions he's been pulled over and accused of stealing his own vehicle, even though he owns it. Um, he's tried to reach out to the police for support with a violent relationship before, um, and they listed him as the abuser and, you know, they tried to say that he's just wasting the police's time and all these kinds of things. So, um, again, that's just a personal experience, but more broadly, as someone who's also done research in this field, um, the literature does demonstrate that police response and intervention to family violence and broadly to poverty in general um, is not effective. And so I do support the motion. Um, and so that's why I'm here speaking today. But that's my two cents. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Walsh. Uh, next is Kadar Jama. Hey, thank you, Mayer, and uh, thank you, everybody. My name is Kadar Jama, and uh, from people call us Home Youth Services Foundation, and 
they call us like a colon. Everybody knows colon. Colon means gathering in Somali word. And uh, I'm representing from my community and the experience we have so far is when it comes to discrimination and, uh, and, and, and racism, both in job sites, in, in the systems and in, in community. The, the recent incident of my community reporting is mainly on the job sites that they 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 calling them names and uh, discriminating them when it comes to getting offer times and getting hires. They saying that uh, one of the senior foreman and and senior employers and on the job sites calling them. If I were in your country, would you give me a job or offer times? And and. They couldn't even answer what to say in that case. And the other thing is, when another guy was thrown over during the winter time, because the winter time is a little bit darker and people going home, going to the parking lot, he ran over and, and he stopped. And instead of apologizing, he said that, oh, fuck, I, I, in, in, a, in a bad way, he's saying that I couldn't see you because of it's dark and you're, you're black. It's black time, you're black. And that kind of discrimination. But the other experience they have is uh, that with no reason is police can stop any time with our youth, our you know, boys and girls driving on, in the city with no reason is stop pull, pull out and, and stopping with no reasons. So the reason I'm, I'm supporting for this motion is, is at least to create some youth initiative is give more funding to the community organization is, and, and building the relationships and youth driven initiatives will be more helpful and creating more and connections with the communities and community integrations. And the other uh, and things that currently we're doing in this current situation, although the resource we have from the city or from the government is to provide uh, a food for the COVID-19 victims. And also we created a system that our elders are uh, helping us uh, to stop family violence and mental health issue because it's all coming back to the culture and, and who the community trusts. When the trust is lost, then the things that who do they going to go back and, and ask you for uh, for assistance? So the reason I'm, I'm here today is to at uh, least support this motion and create more uh, funding for community organization. It's more funding initiatives to to uh, the, the youth and the young people is in Edmonton and at least change some systematic racism on the schooling system too. Thank you very much. Thank you um, uh, very much, Mr. Jama. Uh, next is Scott Fenwick. All right, uh, Your Worship Council, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, my name is Scott Fenwick, uh, he, him pronouns, a settler and resident of War 3. I wish to speak about the School Resource Officer Program, but to get two things out of the way, I do support the motion, but I also support defunding EPS as a means to abolish them and replace them with more community-driven solutions. And applying the old labor principle of last in, first out to police union contracts is in fact uh, systemically racist. But anyway, I wish to speak about a freedom of information request about SROs that Mr. Bashir Mohammed submitted to EPS early last year. I submitted a copy of the request scope and fee estimate to the clerk's office last night. But to summarize for people listening, uh, Mr. Mohammed requested the program's policies, briefing notes, and communications since 2012, which schools SROs are assigned to, how many for each, and how many since 2012, data on the incidents per month for each school, criminal and non-criminal, the bait phone program's policies, briefing notes, and communications, the bait phone program's discipline data, and student, student demographic data, including race and English language learner status regarding incidents that both programs recorded. So the fee estimate for this is $64,000. Uh, 
uh, this is more than a person's annual salary. And yet, even if we were to cut out the documents request, the data production alone is still 60 grand. Now, although this fee estimate is under appeal, here's what I propose council and the, <clears throat> excuse me, and the police commission do. <clears throat> Use section 32 of the VOIP Act, the public interest disclosure section, and expedite processing of this request and post it for free on the City of Edmonton Open City website. Now, I do appreciate that this request is big, but please consider two things. First, the school to prison pipeline is real and SROs all over North America facilitate this. And this phrase school to prison pipeline isn't a phrase that people invented this week. There are mountains of scholarly literature that shows that the school to prison pipeline is a Canadian and American thing. The 49th parallel does not protect us. We are putting kids through the justice system when a punishment from the principal will be enough in many cases. And second, we know nothing about the SRO program in Edmonton outside of talking points and message boxes. Now, even if you believe the SRO program should exist, I still believe we should release these records and data and see if they support your assumptions. I cannot emphasize enough how releasing the data is essential for the city and this council having an honest debate about the SRO program. In fact, publicly posting the raw data enables third parties to analyze the data and discover problems that even the authorities don't know about this, excuse me, that the authorities don't know about. So two examples from recent history. Uh, when Mr. Mohammed Foyd's carding data from EPS, the analysis showed that Indigenous women were nearly 10 times more likely to be street checked by Edmonton police. And going further into the past, in 2002, the Toronto Star analyzed data obtained under, excuse me, obtained data under freedom of information and found that Black people charged with simple drug possession were taken to police stations 50% more often than whites facing the same charge and were twice as likely to be held overnight. Similarly, in 2017, a Toronto Star analysis found that between 2003 and 2013, Black people with no history of criminal convictions were three times more likely to be arrested by Toronto police for possession of small amounts of marijuana than white people of similar backgrounds. Councillors, this is the power of FOIP laws and FOIP requests and independent data analysis. So I am asking you to enable this by posting the data and information that Mr. Mohammed is requesting so that we can learn more about the SRL program as a city. Uh, please do this under section 32 of FOIP. And remember, in our case, Post Media, CBC, and Torstar are not making this FOIP request. It is just the guy acting on behalf of our city's black community. And with that, uh, I yield my time. Thank you, Mr. Fenwick. Uh, next is Roma Schroeder. Uh, Roma, are you there? Hi, hello? Hi, go ahead. Hello, my name is Roma Schroeder. I will speak on the motion to defund the police. I am a representative of the newly formed Edmonton First Aid Collective. We volunteered for these protests and therefore demand to see change. I am a 17-year-old high school student here in Edmonton that wants to see change in school resources so that there are more psychological and addiction services available on the campus. The, first, the Edmonton First Aid Collective has some questions themselves, such as, what types of community support is the municipal government willing to create for vulnerable Black, Indigenous, people of color citizens? With the 2021 Edmonton Police System Service budget being cut by $16.3 million for re reallocation, where is that money going to be invested? And when will, they, when will there be a public transparent fiscal report regarding rationing the money? Through, through concern of our community, we have deemed education and medical supports for community as essential. Therefore, what types of educational or medical refunding will be occurring to further support police and the safety of our community? What new requirements will the city be imposing on officers, such as diplomas, degrees, or new programming to include topics such as sexual assault training, diversity and cultural awareness, 
de-escalation and mental health first aid. Why are we finding that police officers can retire if under investigation to maintain a clean record? Why is government source literature telling us it is not a legal obligation for a police officer here in Canada to provide a badge number when requested? Can you please weigh in on these topics? Personally, I am a youth of color who has experienced sexual assault in the city. The first person I spoke to about, spoke to about it was an officer we called to report the offense. When he came into my home, I was terrified, not just of him, but the grueling system I would have to power through for justice. He asked me some very specific details about the trauma I experienced and offered little empathy. How could he? He had a job to do, and that did not include consoling a frightened child. It should have been a mental health therapist with a sexual assault background to come take my statement. And in order, to, in order to do that, I believe a significant portion of the budget should be administered to mental health professionals and education programs. Dealing with mental health concerns myself, I was personally sent to Alberta Psychiatric Hospital as a young adult, not for being violent, but for medication re-evaluation. My experience there was traumatic and suffocating, but there was nowhere else to send me. The budget is so low that people who need a medication change are being sent to psychiatric hospitals for help rather than, being able, rather than being able to access resources in the community. A portion of the $75 million promised to Edmonton Police Service should be put towards mental health and addiction counseling and treatment programs in the community. Lastly, I had an emotional outburst in school in 10th grade. I again was not violent, but just crying and seeking help from school counselors. A brawny and armed police officer was called to escort me, a 5'1", 14-year-old, to the hospital. I was again terrified. I never want that to happen to another youth in my home city. I believe that the funds of Edmonton Food Services should be redirected to the needs of the community by addressing social issues and promoting progressive development to challenge violence in the streets and in homes, therefore reducing the need for our police officers. No justice, no peace. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Schroeder. Um, that's deeply personal testimony, and and we recognize it's difficult for folks to bring that forward. So, thank you. Um, Troy Alton is next. Hello. Good morning. I'm Troy Alton. I'm currently an engineering student at Nate. I'm not here to talk about Black Lives Matter, Indigenous peoples, or police brutality. That is not my lived reality. I'm not, as Chief McPhee referred to them, one of the really, really, really angry people calling for the police to be defunded. I am a regular, white, university-educated, soon-to-be college-educated, tax-paying homeowner who has lived in Edmonton all of my adult life. Edmonton is not Minneapolis, and we are not the United States. But our current course of ever-increasing police spending and militarization is leading us down the path to becoming them. And we know how that works out. A $107 million Northwest police station, a fourth tactical squad, a fourth electronic surveillance team, an armored personnel carrier, and a proposed $83 million shooting range so our police can train with handguns and rifles. Yet for days we've heard from the community and the leaders of numerous agencies working on the streets that not only is this not working, but that they don't feel safe with our police force patrolling, that they hesitate or won't call them for assistance. I've watched that armored tank roll down 50th Street with an escort of unmarked police cars myself, past homeless people taking carts of bottles to the depot. I am not impressed with our new military police. I am disappointed by our spending priorities. The question has been asked, what role do we see for the police in the future? This is an excellent question, but it's the last question we need to ask in this process, not the first. You begin by systematically removing police funding and investing it in the numerous grassroots, community-driven organizations who have spoken out over the last few days. As these groups tackle the root causes and drivers of the incidents that police are currently dispatched to, it will become apparent over time where the police fit, if at all, into this new system. We do not need to choose a role for the police today and then attempt to shoehorn them into a future system. Today, we need to choose to start a new system and act immediately on funding and beginning down that new path. 
I want to encourage council not to hide behind bureaucracy and red tape to delay changes so desperately needed that should have begun decades ago. We do not need a year of committees and reports and studies to chart our way forward. We simply need the strength and conviction to start down the correct path. The power to make these changes resides with city council, nowhere else. We do not need the provincial or federal government's permission, only the permission of the city's citizens. We've given you that permission. 15,000 protesters risking their lives during a pandemic to be heard have given you that permission loud and clear. The agencies best suited to get to the root causes of homelessness, addiction, and poverty that currently drive police calls already exist. Many of you on city council know them well. You've worked for them and with them during your decades of serving the community. They are chronically underfunded and yet continually impress both yourselves and the citizens of Edmonton with what they accomplish with so little. Fund them. Do it now with the police budget. Repeal the $75 million budget police, police budget increase and invest that directly into our communities, into affordable housing, into mental health programming, into community-led organizations, and into free public transit. Immediately provide 30% of the current $373 million police budget to social programs and mental health professionals. The data provided by the police themselves shows that 30% of their caseload is social work, work that the police are ill-equipped to address and have admitted would be better handled by other experts. Chief McPhee himself has said, and I quote, policing cannot solve social issues. He's right. Listen to him. He has advocated for data-driven local solutions and collective outcomes. That is what is being advocated for here, being advocated for here. To Chief McPhee's concerns that any budget cuts or lack of funding will result in layoffs, particularly of the newer, more diverse recruits. Thank you for pointing out just how white and undiverse our police service has been for so, so very long. The fact that only your newest classes of officers have any diversity just emphasizes how slow the police service has been to react and reform over the years. While I applaud the work Chief McPhee has done, I do. He has demonstrated just how impossible it is to change this system even from within, even with more funding than any other city agency and the best people at the top. It's not enough. The city council has proven with its COVID-19 response that large sweeping changes can be made very rapidly. While not perfect, the mobilization of this response has demonstrated that the ability, skills, and knowledge to make life-altering changes is readily available in Edmonton when all of our lives are on the line. Well, lives are on the line. They just aren't white lives that look like mine. But I'd like to believe that our response to the peril of lives which do not look like our own would be just as swift and all encompassing. Rather than continue to huddle under a torn umbrella of policing that does not shelter us all, let's come in from the storm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Alton. Next is Curtis Hubel. Thank you. It is a great honor to be speaking to all of you today as the president of the Alberta Federation of Police Associations, commonly referred to as APA. APA represents 4,500 plus municipal police officers in Alberta. We provide support to our individual municipal partners while expanding our voice to the Alberta Association of Chiefs of Police, AACP, Director of Law Enforcement, various members of Legislative Assembly, including the Solicitor General. The AFPA board consists of seven members from agencies that include Edmonton, Calgary, Medicine Hat, Lethbridge, and Blood Tribe. It's important for all to understand that I'm also a 17 year serving member with the Edmonton Police Service and currently the vice president of the Edmonton Police Association. I've been promoted as a sergeant for eight years and have worked in various areas that include patrol beats, training, and human resources. I have a degree from the University of Alberta and I'm a proud husband of 25 years and a father of three kids between the ages of 18 and 22 years. I wanted you to hear the above to make sure all of you recognize that I'm one of 4,500 police members that provide incredible service, training, knowledge, education, life experience, diversity and skill sets to the citizens of Alberta. Like others, I'm committed to serving our communities as a police officer, coach, volunteer, role model and invested partner. The police family want to ensure their families and all citizens that live in Edmonton, in the Edmonton community and surrounding areas feel safe and confident they are protect, protected and unlikely to be victimized or harmed. AFPA felt it was necessary to address the motion that is on the floor, recognizing that elected officials like myself need to provide real context during times of tension, unrest and uncertainty. 
This is the time we need to li intently listen to all sides and determine a common ground. Police Act reform. I've attached and forwarded all city councillors the AFPA discussion paper, Alberta Police Act Modernization, drafted in May 2018. AFPA has brought these recommendations and considerations forward to AACP, NDP government, and the current UCP government. AFPA participated in the Police Act reviews conducted by the former NDP government. We ensured we were at the table to listen to all parties and all partners. AFPA has met with the Alberta Justice Minister, Doug Schweitzer, on numerous occasions to discuss topics important to policing. Minister Schweitzer has reviewed the AFPA proposal and has invited further consultation. Both he and the Director of Law Enforcement, Bill Sweeney, recognize the value of the recommendations provided in the discussion paper. AFPA has been pushing for Police Act modernization for at least four years and has made recommendations in relation to police accountability, independent oversight, disciplinary hearing process, to name a few. Outside our discussion paper, we've also offered the provincial government input on the role of Alberta peace officers. Defunding the police, APA wanted to ensure the entire audience of the City of Edmonton public hearing truly knows what defunding means to policing. To summarize, it means less policing service to the citizens of Edmonton. The hearing is addressing the citizen, City of Edmonton concerns, but I want to be clear, this is not just about Edmonton. Decisions made here, good or bad, have the potential to reshape policing across Canada. If Edmonton considers the motion and defunds their police budget to an alarming level, that decision will influence other municipalities and will have an overall negative impact. What would that impact look like? Police officers' mental health. Police officers would be overtasked and working well beyond their capacity. The quality of service that some are currently questioning would undoubtedly become more concerning. Problem. Officers' mental and physical health will be impacted, resulting in increased sick leave, resignations, and mental health concerns, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Problem. The above will all lead to an increased demand for mental health and wellness programs, which are already tasked to stretch to budgetary limits. This could lead to police suicides, divorce, permanent mental health trauma, or other physical concerns. Problem. Police recruiting and retention. The City of Edmonton relies on its diverse and professional police service to keep its citizens safe. The Edmonton Police Service is recognized as one of the best in the country and has worked hard to develop that reputation. Now an event that occurred in another country is threatening to destroy all that. Over time, continued criticism of the police profession and a lack of support from our elected officials will negatively impact police recruiting. It will become more difficult to recruit and replace members that have retired or resigned problem. We need to mentor and inspire future police recruits, not alienate and drive them away. In conclusion, we need to find a balance and calm so we can all work together to determine what the future of policing should look like. We need our leaders to listen and insert reason and clarity during critical times. We need our media to report both sides of the story and present a balanced product that will encourage informed dialogue. We need to all participate and find a way to build a better policing model. AFPA is committed and will do whatever it takes. Is everyone in this hearing ready and brave enough to step forward? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hoople. Next is uh, Leila Belloni. Bellany, pardon me. Thank you. Police as an institution is problematic because both the root and the support systems of the profession are based in oppression, control, and white supremacy. Although individual police officers may not personally subscribe to these views, the inherently racist practices of the profession is why we see Black and Indigenous communities having such tense interactions with police in Canada today. Yesterday, I realized that in 36 years of life, I have never called police for aid because I do not fall within the narrow demographic of people who have positive interactions with police. That demographic receives what their tax dollars pay for. They are served, they are protected. But we, as black and brown people, do not receive the same kind of assistance. The call to defund the police has less to do with the police force and more to do with police culture, brutality, aggression, and abuse of power. The police have created a divide between themselves and the communities, which, in, which is evident in the us versus them mentality implied in their words and actions. Despite this, a valid, sorry, despite this, um, and as valid and as necessary as it may be to defend the police, I believe that for BIPOC communities, this would have dangerous effects. 
Since the idea of defunding was introduced, it is evident that many people are not able to see the merit in this concept. Those people are mostly cops and middle-aged to white, to, sorry, middle-aged to elderly white people of settler ancestry. Due to the highly polarized thinking of these groups, what is understood is that the public is against the police, which feeds their us versus them confirmation bias. My fear as a racialized person is that there will be retaliation against our communities, both physically and via negligence, if funding is diverted from the EPS budget. Commissioner McPhee has already alluded to this type of retribution when he stated that cuts would affect diversity within the EPS. That comment was a warning shot. The EPS will use financial restrictions as a scapegoat for a multitude of sins in the coming year if defunded. For the safety of black and brown people in this city, I offer this. If the budget is to be increased as planned, the money should be applied to, to the following initiatives. Mental health and psychological care for, of officers. This would include mandatory psychological evaluation after major incidents, as well as annual psychological assessments, ongoing intensive mental health supports, overly aggressive policing, and excessive force are symptoms of a bigger problem. Officers experience fear, frustration, and anxiety often, and struggle with PTSD and trauma. Therefore, it is up to you, Commissioner, to ensure the mental health of your officers so they are not brutalizing the public at the first perceived threat. Mandatory ongoing training and continuing education. Example, cultural awareness, de-escalation, ethical decision-making, anti-racist practice, trauma-informed care, mental health first aid, and motivational interviewing, just to name a few. Annual recertification. There should be continued monitoring of fitness to perform duties that include physical, cognitive, cognitive and intellectual assessments, as well as ability to emotionally regulate and control distress response. One year of active police duty followed by six months of administrative duty. Officers could use this time to complete recertifications and trainings. More and permanent interdisciplinary teams or collaborative efforts like IC Pact, 211 and community agencies are better equipped to assess and refer people in mental health crisis, but lack the adequate resources to respond to the volume of cases. Working in tandem with these services would be mutual, mutually beneficial. If the police wish to keep their funding, then the expectations and standards placed on them should also increase. If the above measures cannot be implemented, then I support the budget freeze for 2021. I also have suggestions to improve relations between pol police and BIPOC communities. My suggestion is as follows. Firearms should be holstered inside police vehicles to be retrieved only when absolutely necessary. Officers would have pepper spray, tasers, and handcuffs on their person for their protection. Officers should be held accountable for instances of excessive force by being placed on unpaid leave while an investigation is completed by an independent agency or committee with equal representation from relevant disciplines. Officers should police in their own communities to ensure an understanding of the social dynamics, needs, and culture. Body cams should be worn and functional while on duty. Officers should face increasing disciplinary action for each instance of noncompliance to this rule. Complete transparency. Instances of officer misconduct, disciplinary action, length of time on the force, number of times an officer has discharged their weapon during their career, complaints, etc., should all be public record with select details available in relevant situations. Complaints against police officers by citizens or officers uh, or other officers, sorry, should obviously be handled by uh, not be handled by the police department. Um, there's an undeniable lack of trust and respect between police and the BIPOC. Um, our communities are often treated as if they are of no value, and the, this, the priority must be to reverse this narrative immediately. I believe reforming the standards of policing could create a culture that would begin to positively impact police and BIPOC interactions. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Bellany. Next is Chantelle Phillips. Hi there. Um, sorry, I'm just turning on my camera. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, I am, I'm, today I'm speaking as a mental health and addictions counselor here in the city of Edmonton, as well as an Indigenous woman. Um, I do have to say I'm not representing anybody specifically, and I'm not representing my employer by any means, um, but I will be using a little bit of anecdotal uh, material from the work that I do to kind of talk about my points today. 
I am in support of the motion to reallocate that $75 million um, 2021 budget, but not necessarily completely away from um, EPS. And what I mean by this, and this is echoing some of the things that even Layla just um, mentioned in her in her talk, but um, I have concerns about what happens if that budget goes completely away from EPS. I... I um, I am very concerned that there won't be a plan um, for the um, for the funds to be um, distributed evenly, and I worry that things like administrative staff and things like that are going to be the first to go, which then puts way more on the plate of the officers that we are talking about who maybe don't have the resources and training needed um, to be effective when working with um, uh the population uh, of people of color. Um, so with that said, um, I would really like to um, see the, those funds being allocated into something like um, a training program and then bringing in additional resources into working with the police. So, um, you know, the, I, I'm not sure, I, I couldn't find any exact information, but as far as, I'm con as far as I know, there's no trauma specialists or, um, you know, mental health um, psychiatrists, things like that, that are working directly with the Edmonton Police Service that are on the ground and out in the community. I know that there are plenty of services like um, FACS, the mental health crisis team, things like that, but, um, they are not, the, even those programs themselves are not effectively dealing with and handling the population that I work with. I have been in this industry for 11 years now, working in the city of Edmonton for 11 years, and it has not improved. I have participants on a daily basis who are dealing with every kind of um, trauma and mental health issues and substance use issues and homelessness and all of those things, they're dealing with that on a daily basis. And as a community agency, um, we are very much, our hands are very much tied into the types of resources that we can refer our participants to. Um, and, there, and with that said, we're not often... Um, eager to involve Edmonton Police Service because the majority of our participants would then be being punished for um, the things that they need help with and support with. So very often we are left kind of in the dark in navigating um, a system that doesn't have the proper support. So we need, we need to see funding go towards a better training for our Edmonton Police Service officers. And that means, you know, very in-depth trauma-informed um, care, very in-depth um, working with, you know, Indigenous peoples and people of colour and, and what that entails. Um, and, I, and again, I, I also um, agree that a lot of these resources could be um, geared towards the mental health of police officers as well. Um, I don't think anybody is saying that they have an easy job, but but it's not adequately dealing with what we deal with here in the city of Edmonton. Um, I have a, I just, just to kind of talk about a recent experience, I have a participant who was recently feeling quite suicidal and actually made an attempt on her life and her landlord called 911 and Edmonton police were sent out to deal with that. And um, rather than going through the process of quote unquote forming her um, and like making sure that there was um, adequate care in place for someone who had just made an attempt on their life, they brought her to, they transported her to a hospital but did not stay. And she very quickly left after they um, they dropped her off. So um, I don't think that that's necessarily the fault of the two officers who were involved in that specific situation, but it does speak to what's happening um, in terms of lack of training and lack of um, resources that they even have themselves. So I absolutely um, support reallocating that $75 million dollars um, but um, I would like to see some of that go towards helping our police system become a better system for Edmontonians. Thank you. 
Thank you, Ms. Phillips. Next is Sky Perry. Sky, are you there? It shows that they just left the meeting. Perhaps they're trying to rejoin. Okay, let's try Dunya New. Dunya, are you there? Yeah, hi, I'm here. Hi. Sorry, I'm just. Go ahead. Trying to turn on my camera. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, Sorry. go ahead. I'm just. Oh, okay, perfect. Um, hi, my name is Dunya Nur. And thank you so much for having me today. I'm the president of the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council. And there's a lot of discussions that's going on about police practices and defunding the police. However, I'm here to talk to you about how organizations like mine provide a practical community structure that can actually further uh, this much needed conversation. I know that both our mayor and the prime minister talked about listening and that they are listening and, it, and the importance of listening. Therefore, I wanna to talk to you about what listening really looks like and give you concrete examples of what listening doesn't look like as well. Since 2017 to 2019, the African Canadian Civic Engagement Council in collaboration with RIS Foundation advocated for the creation of the City of Edmonton's Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. I remember that our mayor and the city councilor said that they were listening. Unfortunately, the end product clearly highlighted that no one was listening and felt that no one cared because it did not represent what we asked for and what was promised as well in terms of the, in terms of the motion that has been passed. Now we are back at this table. We're discussing how people of color and black people can be treated as equal by institutions that are governed by the city of Edmonton, the province, and the federal government. I, I feel that conversations like this that go back and forth and leaves communities' voice unheard is a concrete uh, example of hiding behind bureaucracy and also red tapes. Our communities are concerned with the criminalization of Black youth and the significant increase of our youth in Alberta justice system. Trauma coupled with mental health and the lack of community supports and meaningful opportunities uh, severely impact youth of African, Caribbean, and Black communities' quality of life, physical, emotional, and cultural, and mental health. Many women of African descent face disproportionate amounts of gender violence and live with higher rates of poverty and marginalization. Also, we equally need to talk about the mental health of people that serve front lines, that work with communities, and also communities themselves that consist of young people, elders, families, people living with adverse trauma, and systemic structural trauma and violence as equal as we need to talk about the mental health of police officers. I want to tell you what community involvement and community solutions really look like. And the truth is, as tensions grow and we have these conversations back and forth, the people that are really losing out are actually our youth and their families. I want to tell you what community involvement looks like and give you a story here. The storytelling is very important in our culture. As a young organization, the African Canadian Civic Engagement's first funders was actually our community that consisted of single, but single mothers, elders, and youth that really believed in the work that we do. Our first funding that we received from our community was $17,000 to support youth, which I am sure you all are familiar with, the story of Junior Matuba and Abdullahi Admi, two young people that experienced adverse childhood family and community disconnection and fell through the cra cracks and found themselves in what is now recognized uh, of um, what is now recognized as crimes of poverty. With the $17,000, our organization rehabilitated and prevented their deportation. Over the last year, Edmonton Police Division, particularly the Edmonton Police or Youth Division, reached out to us because our youth directly requested for our organization's support and their direct community support. Edmonton Police funded our first pilot project with us with $20,000, and the results were, were astonishing. As we were able to serve many youth of our community with education, with employment, with community connection, advocacy, cultural learning, healing, family reconnection, and life skills development. One of our youth is actually leading this conversation right now and is becoming the first CEO to opening his own businesses. 
I have a redacted report on this if anyone wants in terms of the evidence behind our work and what best practices of blueprints look like in terms of investing in community. Our point is that when communities, our point is that when the communities who are affected by the issues and are truly discussing and sharing their pains, when someone says, specifically our government, that we hear you, we are listening, what hearing looks like and what truly listening look like is implementing solutions and addressing the root cause of what makes these communities feel that their voices are lost and not heard. And the conclusion of what I would like to present to our city councilor and mayor today is to pay attention to what communities are asking for and also to pay attention to the systemic oppressive systems that truly allow communities to feel disempoverished, marginalized, not heard, and is a root cause of perpetuating uh, violence and also is what really contributes to our young people finding themselves at being highly represented in the justice system. Thank you for having me today. Well, thank you very much. Um, Sky Perry, are you back on the call? She is, thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for the opportunity to address this matter. Please note that I'm going to specifically speak about racism, but that everything I say here can be applied to other forms of systemic oppression, and that I will also use the acronym BIPOC to encompass Black, Indigenous, and people of color. I have worked directly with police many times, including EPS and specifically Councillor Ranga, and I generally regard them as hardworking, well-meaning individuals who do their best at a difficult and stressful job. That being said, this current motion does not go far enough. To make our community more peaceful and safe, the city should immediately and significantly divest from policing and instead invest in direct community supports. There's a myth that police brutality can be trained away, that officers perpetuate systemic violence on BIPOC because they don't know any better. There is little to no objective evidence to support this myth, so I've been surprised to hear it repeatedly throughout this consultation. However, there is evidence from social sciences, including the discipline of psychology and from neuroscience, supporting a different basis for racist brutality. Police perpetuate racist violence because they are humans who are part of a racist culture, period. They, like everyone else in our racist culture, learned at a very young age and in a very foundational way that it is appropriate to respond to BIPOC folks more violently and with less care than one would a white person. I mean this at the level of brain circuitry. This learning is unconscious, reflex. Reflexes are fast, simple, thoughtless, and very, very difficult to change. Essentially, reflexes cannot be trained out. Even if a person consciously learns about systemic racist harm, it does not change their reflexive behavior when they are under stress. This makes anti-bias training essentially useless as a tool to prevent the imminent harm of racist violence. Because when police, a cohort of people with badges and guns, are brutalizing oppressed people, they aren't thinking with their higher brains. They are reacting based on lower brain hierarchy rules, and those rules are violent. Would it help to hire better educated recruits? No. Studies show that while higher education sometimes increases lip service to anti-racism, it has no effect on actual oppressive behavior by privileged folk. So if we can't teach EPS members to stop harming oppressed people in moments of stress, what can we do? Should we give up and accept racist government violence as the cost of modern society? Of course not. While we slowly, slowly do our individual and systemic top-down anti-racist work, we must also protect our oppressed people by taking away the power of the police to harm them. AKA, we need to take their money. We need to take away the money that they use to buy tools of violence. We take away the guaranteed annual increases and we roll back their budget. We take away the money that allows for over-policing of struggling neighborhoods and communities. We take away the money that keeps kids in schools under police surveillance rather than teacher supervision. We take away that money and with it, we let go of the white supremacist myth that a standing civic army is what makes a community safe. We take away that money and we give that money to organizations that provide street level social supports, organizations whose budgets have literally been shrinking for years and that have never had the luxury of guaranteed annual increases like those enjoyed by EPS, organizations that are run by staff specifically and genuinely expert in providing what people need for a peaceful community. Those are the things that make a community safer, and they are the things that EPS is neither qualified nor able to provide, no matter how much money City Council gives them and no matter how well-meaning their membership is. Personally, I would consider this consultation process to be reasonably successful if, 
In this time of financial hardship, and as a result of this feedback, City Council immediately rolled back EPS's budget by even just the equivalent of the helicopter's operating costs. Then take that money and put it into viable community supports. That would be a good start, and would hopefully be followed by annual decreases of EPS budgets and corresponding increases in social services budgets, until we, as a community, achieve equitable balance of actual supports for our citizens. As I said, I have generally liked and respected the police officers I've worked with, but since objective evidence shows that there is no way for EPS as a cohort to exert force without that force being racist, let's dial back the resources and then instead put our money into programs that can actually help us build a happy, equitable community. I can provide references for all evidence mentioned in this statement. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Uh, next is Lan Bui. Good morning, Mayor, City Councilors, panelists, and viewers. Thank you for hosting a public hearing and creating space for our stories and perspectives to be heard. My formal background is in adult education. I'm a learning consultant, so I do things like learning design and curriculum planning. Throughout the public hearing, there have been calls for training as one piece of the solution, and I want to offer my assessment for all listeners and city councilors to consider. Obviously, my position is for the investment of training and continuing education for EPS. For that reason, I do not support the motion to defund the police. Instead, I want us to change the way we do business, to align with our moral values, and to include the people we care about most. I have reviewed the EPS strategic and business plans for 2020 to 2022. As a business stakeholder, I want higher accountability and oversight over the way EPS plans to operate in the next three years. Specifically, I have three requests. Adjustments to the key performance indicators to represent meaningful anti-racism action and for EPS funding to be tied to those results. An immediate status update on EPS accountability bureaus and the level of community representation within those bureaus. I also have some observations on the Academy Foundation's training and EPS continuing education unit. The business and strategic plan is the result of an organized effort by the Edmonton Police Service, the Edmonton Police Commission, and the Edmonton Police Association called the Vision 2020 Project. The planning involved, and I quote, asking employees across the organization on the challenges, gaps, and potential solutions, and interactive group sessions, one-on-one -on -one interviews with deputy chiefs, focused sessions with executive leadership, and presentations to extended leadership. I am not dismissing the extensive valuable and knowledge within EPS. I'm asking if there was community representation in those meetings when developing the three-year plan. This is the perfect opportunity for EPS to invite a diversified member to inform them on decisions they have made, which may be racist or have hurtful impact on Black and Indigenous people. The business plan also outlines key performance indicators in which EPS will measure their progress and success. This includes, but is not limited to, feelings of safety in public, proportion of incidents where alternate measures were used, referrals to social services by type, usage rates for partner services. This is a decent start. I am suggesting additions to the indicators to reflect anti-racism action as a way to remove systemic racism in, e in the EPS. As a metric, this can look like the number of community service hours per active member the rate at which carding activity continues on Black or Indigenous people, and the number of participation in youth safety centers. From a business perspective, I would like to see EPS funding tied to the results at which they're able to achieve the desired outcomes. The strategic and business plan identify EPS bureaus who are accountable for handling key activities. I want to highlight the Community Policing Bureau, Value and Impact Division, and Community and Safety and Wellbeing Bureau. In 2020, some of their planned activities include developing a community engagement strategy, developing a vulnerable people strategy, and developing a partnership framework. EPS intends to summarize its progress annually, giving it to the Edmonton Police Commission in the first quarter of each year. I am asking for an immediate status report on the development of these divisions, including what they're doing to ensure there is community representation and diversity at these tables. Finally, the Academy Foundation's Training and EPS Continuing Education Unit. In the current and forecasted operating budget, the line for EPS personnel is set to increase each year. Before we hire more personnel to invest 27 weeks of training into, I would suggest it prudent to review the current curriculum to make sure it reflects the community's needs going forward. The current outline does include, and is not limited to, 
communication and de-escalation training, and community-based policing and problem solving. What about an education on Black and Indigenous lives, emotional intelligence, substance abuse and mental health, and relationship building? As for the continuing education unit, there was not much information I could find. And perhaps it's a unit that is seriously lacking resources. A lesson on racism is much needed for the new and existing EPS members in case they miss the message of the Black Lives Matters movement over the past few weeks or over the past few generations and centuries. To reiterate, I am not in favor of the motion to defund the police. I am advocating for the reallocation of funds within EPS, adjustments and ties to the key performance indicators, an immediate status update on their accountability bureaus, and a critical review of their training and program and curriculum all to reflect their participation in the battle against systemic racism. If the EPS truly wants to live up to its values, which are integrity, accountability, respect, innovation, courage, and community, they should be more than willing and open to your influence about these suggestions. Councillors, please demand affirmative action from the Edmonton Police Service on behalf of the City of Edmonton. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Taylor Soroka. They have not checked in. Okay. Um, last call for Taylor Soroka. If you're listening along, we'll go to uh, Timothy Liu. Was Timothy able to join us? Okay. Go ahead, Timothy. Then we'll do one more check in for Taylor. Hi. Sorry. Uh, I was in my test this morning, so I wasn't able to join a little earlier. Sorry. Oh, no worries. Glad you could join us now. Floor is yours for five minutes. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. So hello everybody, my name is Timothy Liu and I'm a grade 11 student at Old Skona Academic. I'd like to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to be here today, uh, but given that five minutes isn't really a, a long time to speak, I'll really just get right into my speech. So a hot topic these days is a proposed defunding of police. Uh, I'd like to spend the first part of my speech clarifying on, on what this means. So defunding the police doesn't mean uh, immediately removing all funds for police, and it doesn't mean getting rid of the cops entirely. In fact, Defunding might actually be a, a bit of a misnomer because it actually means divesting from police. It means taking away unnecessary funds from police and excess funds and moving that same money into community initiatives. Uh, so for example, more mental health services or youth counseling services. Having police act as people with authority over private citizens, to having police act as friends of the community. With a shift towards rehabilitation and defunding Police means shifting those money towards other things, again, such as those mental health services and affordable housing and mental health programming. An idea of what this looks like in Edmonton, currently the Edmonton Police Service is supposed to increase in funding from $356 million to $406 million, which is $50 million. The City of Edmonton's operating budget 2019-2022 holds the uh, social development funding to be total $38.2 million, which is actually set to decrease over the next few years. Act adequate time to talk about this subject in depth, but I'd urge you all to look at the city of Camden in New Jersey. They didn't completely abolish police or completely defund the police, but what they did do is they actually shifted funding away from the police by temporarily disbanding the police force and creating a new one from the ground up that was more suited towards the needs of the community. So what are the benefits of this kind of police restructuring? The most simple is that it's practical. Currently, these are asked to play too many jobs. They have to be uh, community guardians, they have to provide youth counseling, they have to fight crime, and they have to support uh, at-risk people in our communities. In terms of police, we can also simultaneously take that money and give it to the community. We have to take it off the police's hands and give those same tasks to people who can uh, uh, tackle those uh, objectives better. It's very hard to argue that police are better at mental health supports than dedicated mental health services, or they're better at stopping drug overdoses than investing in community health initiatives. Think about it this way. So you can have the most expensive, the best hammer in the world you can spend. You can drop $1,000 on a hammer, but it will never be better at screwing a screw than a screwdriver is. Instead of spending more and more money on getting a hammer to do every single job uh, in your toolbox, you can instead just uh, spend a little less money on a hammer and buy a screwdriver instead, and you'll get much, much better results and do a better job overall than if you just spent all that money and asked the hammer to do every single job. Similarly, we think that it's better to have lots of community support services than have uh, basically a monolithic titanic police force which has to do them all. 
by funding these uh, community services, they can do a better job and a better targeted job than asking the police to do every single one of these jobs just adequately. An example of this, which is firefighters. I don't think I've ever heard anybody complain about defunding firefighters or complain about abolishing firefighters entirely. And the reason for this is that firefighters do their jobs. Instead of pulling more money from firefighters into the police, we ask firefighters to fight fires and we give them the resources to do that. And that's why we like firefighters, because they do their jobs and we don't just give it to the police and add more work to their stress load. So these community initiatives simply put, uh, address the problems at their root rather than treating the symptoms of the system. If medicine isn't working, you don't go and buy more and more of that medicine. You switch and find a new alternative of medicine to treat your, uh, your, your illness. Police need more armored cars or shooting ranges as much as the, poli uh, the public needs community services to better the quality of life. Well, I think I can speak for all youth when I say that when we look for positive role models, we don't think of a police officer who has better shooting skills or a police officer with more guns. We think of in the community who we know personally and we can trust as an example of moral virtue and healthy living. Into these initiatives can help create that new role model. And off, I'd like to add that Black Lives Matter isn't something to be swept under a rug after it sweeps its course. So I think it's a potent force for the foreseeable future. And just like how Edmonton is a leader in uh, green initiatives like recycling or green energy usage, I think that if we become a leader in social issues such as the best of the police, we can continue being ahead of the figure of curve. So I think I can speak for many youth when I say that I strongly believe that this motion is a good first step. Uh, I'm going to go uh, like 15 seconds over time, though, if that's okay at its first step. Real change has to be continually striven towards. Change is not always easy or quick, and structuring, restructuring Edmonton's second biggest spending obviously isn't an easy task, but we wish City Council continually strives to make progress on this matter, and we hope Thank that our you, dream does not Mr. die with this motion. So long as there's positive change, Thank we you, hold Mr. on to the for a better future. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll check one more time for Taylor Soroka. Has Taylor been able to join us? No? Okay, then thank you to all members of panel five for your comments. Uh, I have some questions from members of council. So far I have Councillor McKean, Councillor Henderson, and Councillor Knack lined up. Councillor McKean, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and I really want to thank everybody for their presentations <clears throat> this morning. Um, Ms. Perry, um, I was hoping to ask you a few questions. Um, I thought it was really interesting what you were saying because I, uh, I've been hesitant to say this in this current climate, but I, uh, it's been my experience to get to know uh, some police officers who are uh, smart, well-educated, compassionate, um, lead programs for Somali youth, and all you know, and partner with. Um, programs to uplift the lives of vulnerable people. So it's been a bit of a struggle for me putting that group of people I know into a category that some on this hearing have called, uh, has gone, uh, gone as far as to call them uniform thugs. Um, and yet your um, submission today is fascinating, I thought, that and there's, you're going to provide references, I hope, to us. I can email them to the city clerk. Yeah, is that the best way to get them to you? Probably, yes. yes. That would be okay, great. So it's, I think what you're saying is it's, it's a bit contextual um, that um, we put police in a position, we put um, citizens in a position as police officers to carry out duties that you would describe as uh, oppressive, and, and, and unconsciously racist, yes? Yeah, when people are stressed, they aren't thinking, they aren't putting their best foot forward, essentially. They aren't thinking with their higher brain functions. And yeah. so they fall back on reflexes. And reflexes are cultural and you learn them young. And it depends who you think is a member of your personal group and who you think is an out-group member. Your yeah. personal group you treat better. Out-group people, when you're under stress, you will treat worse. Can I ask you, because I'm curious, what is your, uh, what do you do? What do I do? Well, uh, funnily enough, I actually suffered a brain injury about five years ago. So right now I do nothing. Um, 
but we're working on that. But I have a psychology degree and because my injury is neurological, I've spent the past five years doing neurological research with the time that is available to me. Um, and I'm particularly interested in this matter for several reasons. It's an intersection. My family is multiracial. Um, I myself am white identified, but I'm often not like I white, I identify as white, but often people identify me as non-white. So that's a really interesting line to walk. And I have lots of experience with sort of large administrative organizations. And my experience of them is that the individuals really mean well, but that often when they are rolling as a collective juggernaut, they don't do their best work. I just want to tell you, uh, I was out doing a walk along, having a look. Our, our goal was to go have a look at some of the encampments in the River Valley. And I was with one of these cops that I think is just a fantastic human being. There was a, a man um, passed out on the lawn or sleeping on the lawn. And I suspect it's uh, a police officer just couldn't walk by that. They have to go check on the welfare of that individual, which is what he did. Sort of gave him a little bit of a shake. And the man started to come to. Um, and after a few seconds realized it was a, there was a police uniform there and he was on the fight. And what ended up, uh, so then they, this good police officer had to restrain him in ways that I think to most of us look sort of um, physically aggressive. And so I think we sometimes, like it's almost like both sides are doomed to have these fights because this vulnerable person has probably had many encounters with police in the past that he would deem to be traumatic. You sort of, you see that as well? That uh, I think I, I understand what you're saying. I would disagree with the term doomed. Um, in terms of like, in terms of reflexive behavior versus learned behavior, uh, learned behavior is effective for things like I am less racist than my grandparents were. Right. Right. That's a result of conscious work by several generations of people and society. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that if I was in a situation that police officers often find themselves in, where they're being physically attacked, they don't know what the physical layout of the land is, they don't know what they're dealing with, their all their adrenaline levels are high. Yep. They're not going to be thinking about their anti-bias training in that moment. They are going to be reacting for their own safety as they perceive it and the safety of their band of brothers and sisters. Um, and that encourages a more violent, less thoughtful, and unfortunately racist response. Because again, okay. it's not about whether or not the individual officer is a good person. It's about whether or not the officer is part of a racist culture. And the office is, officer is because I'm part of a racist culture. And yeah. that, yeah, that makes us have reactions. And because our reactions are not always going to be the most productive, proactive, pro-social reactions, we need to make sure that those reactions mitigate the harm that they can. Well, I, wanted, we I just want to thank everybody for these stories that we're hearing today, which are really painful for us to hear because we represent people in our community and to hear uh, of the trauma and pain that our uh, constituents suffer is, is, is painful. Uh, but I, and I just would add, uh, Ms. Perry, that I hope that you are hired uh, by uh, someone that can help us work through these issues uh, smartly and quickly. Thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Councillor McKean. Uh, Councillor Henderson. Yeah, uh, Ms. Perry, I was going to put you on the spot as well because I'm I, I'm, in, I'm I'm interested. I mean, and uh, maybe to describe what some of my questions are right now, or what the last few days are bringing up in my mind. And I think to some point, it's what Mr. Lewis bringing up as well. That we have, I think, it seems to me like we have made some choices in terms of trying to deal with this that have actually encouraged or pushed the police more along the lines of going into the going into the social work end, all of those kind of things as a kind of solution that we thought was the right way to go. And I'm beginning to wonder if that in itself um, may have been an error um, for some of the reasons I think you're stating, because it, but the, the question that, that I then struggle with is, I think there are some basic assumptions that are being made 
that probably sh that we're not questioning, um, but that around what we actually what the police should be for, what they should be doing, how they should be interacting. If it's if it's not in that, then what? And I I think we're make we're making assumptions about that. We're not questioning that, but but that for me is a fundamental question that I'm beginning to think up in my own mind. That I think we need to ask questions about it. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Um. I'm not sure I'm clear on what your question actually is. You're wondering sort of about the, like figuring out the larger philosophical implications versus well, sort of if the, not this, if if what we're doing right now with the police is not what what they is not working, which it isn't. Um, if we're if we're going to be doing something different, what is it the police should be doing? That is a very broad question, and it needs to be determined by the community at large. But if I think my perspective on it is. We know that what's happening right now isn't working. Um, if we as a community value the safety and security and participation and citizenship of all of our residents, we need to deal with the imminent problem, mm -hmm. which in this case, in, in this context, is racist violence and lack of access to civic resources. So if we can tamp down that imminent harm, because it, it is imminent harm, um, then we have time to figure out the larger philosophical implications of it and how we apply those. If I can draw a parallel um, to what's been happening now with public health, I don't think any of the things that we've really done in the past three months as a city, as a community, as a country, as an international system are things that were really plotted out in detail. There was an imminent harm that needed to be dealt with. We tamped down the imminent harm and we've been sort of catching balls ever since. It's not ideal, but we've managed to keep lots of people alive. Um, we have not crumbled into anarchy and fire. We're still basically functioning as a society. And I think that even if we cut, if we cut the police budget, I heard one gentleman say 30% because that's how much seems to be 30% of what they do seems to be social services. Um, even if we cut the police budget by 30%, I know that EPS would not enjoy that. I'm aware of that. But they could still basically function. And as long as they're basically functioning and we're further supporting social services, then we're starting to shift. We're starting to change direction. We're spinning yeah, the wheel of the ship. Yeah, I, I guess I agree. And I, I, I guess it seems to me there's an opportunity here to ask a more fundamental question is if they're still functioning, functioning, doing what? And, 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 I, and I think that's the essential question that I'm struggling with, because I think if you want real change, that's the question we need to ask. I agree. Um, that is the question that needs to be asked. And I think that this consultation is a really good first step. But I also think, and I think that you on council know this as well, you have organizations and people and expertise in Edmonton who are already sort of moving towards that. I know that there have been um, programs that I think may have been canceled where there's sort of like a movement towards sort of police with social services working together. I'm not aware of all those details or the history of them, but I know that there is history in this city of movement towards that and I think that we can continue in that direction and that in moving in that direction we are going to be lessening the demand on EPS lessening the resources that they think they need um, hopefully engaging in a certain amount of demilitarization I'm still confused about why we have a helicopter that I hate I, I everybody assumed I was going to ask you about that because I have never voted for it but I hear you um, but yeah um Great, thanks. I, Mr. Mayor, I forgot to start my time, so I'm guessing I'm pretty close you got to out. Sixteen seconds, my friend. Uh, that's very well. Thank you very much. Thanks. That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, I'll just let you know who's next in the queue: Councillor Knack, Councillor Banga, Councillor Walters, Councillor Zadik, and Councillor Paquette. Councillor Knack, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to uh, all of the members of the panel for the contributions to this this panel. I want to ask uh, Ms. Nur, uh, you expressed a lot of concern around the Anti-Racism Advisory Committee. Uh, recently, the, the committee unanimously sent us a, a request so that they could propose uh, their own recommendations on mandate fund, funding and governance. And I guess I want to ask the question, can, can through doing that, can we actually fix the problem that, that you identified from the beginning? Because the suggestion is that, that I think the mandate or, or how it was formed was 
was not uh, the ideal situation. So does that, will that be able to get us there or did, did we mess that up too much at the beginning in your opinion? We lose. Oh, there. Perfect. I see you're unmuted. Hello. Hi. Sorry. I apologize. I was just receiving a lot of calls. Can you please repeat that again? Oh, Paul. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No, 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 no problem. So I was just mentioning that because you had expressed concerns with the Anti Racism Advisory Committee, they had recently sent correspondence to council asking to propose their own recommendations on mandate, funding, and governance. And I want to um, know. Can by doing that, can we fix the issue that you raised at the beginning? Because it sounds like we've messed up from the beginning of, of, of how it was formed. So can we can we get to a place where, where it is shown that it's going to work and it's going to achieve its goals? Thank you so much, Councillor Andrew Nack. I actually really appreciate you asking that, uh, that question. Uh, I believe that in terms of what a collective solution looks like, it's a we have it's something that we constantly have to work towards. It's a marathon. It can't be a quick fix. Mm -hmm. However, with that being said, um, I feel that what one thing I can say as a person that also led um, and and co-created the whole purpose of what the council was supposed to serve, we, we we felt that we were not heard. Our recommendations was not implemented. And to be more concrete about it, one of the things that we actually asked is that the Anti-Racism Advisory Council itself um, should have some sort of power that they can recommend directly to the city of Edmonton, and they can also directly recommend to city councillors. And at the same time, while they're you know doing that community dialogue, focus groups, and researching what the true barriers and challenges look like for the community, what we received is a council that just gives consultation. So consultation looks very different than recommendation, and recommendation looks very different than implementation. So it was something that um, at the same time, we also asked in terms of the selection criteria of who are the people that are going to be sitting at that council. Because this was a community initiative, we wanted the, the uh, selection criteria to also include cultural sensitivity, particularly in regards to anti-Black racism. One thing that we were promised that this council would focus on specifically, which is very different than other existing councils that looks at, you know, gender based analysis or ethnocultural or, or multiculturalism is the concept of anti black racism and how it manifests across all of our city. And that was not met. We were not included in the conversation. We were very appreciative that the councils listened. We were appreciative that we had, you know, um, individuals that were part of the council that truly believed in this initiative. We specifically elected Councillor Aaron Piquet and yourself, Andrew Mack, because we felt that you both were the best people to help the community develop that solution. And one of the things that we were also expecting is that we would constantly be updated throughout the whole process. The motion had been passed and then we were cut off. Another thing that I do want to highlight that's very important is for three years, we were researching about the city bylaws. For three years, we were looking at what best practices look like. For three years, we were engaging our community about civic engagement. For three years, we were presenting to our MLAs. We were talking to our MPs. We were actually, you know, directly addressing certain questions to our mayor. And then finally, it got passed. When it got passed, we were exited out. And we were just CC'd in this huge email that over hundreds of people were also CC'd and we had no clue what was going on. And then we end up talking about the community symposium. Let's have a conversation again. Let's talk about racism again. What does it actually look like? And then it just brought us back. We, what we specifically also requested is not only to focus on anti-Black racism, but also how people, of the, people from the LGBTQ community also face anti-Black racism. Right? We also talked about how First Nations people face being excluded and police brutality. None of that was actually included. So in terms of our hope, we're not too sure how we can remend that, but it's worth giving a shot because honestly, collabor collaboration is our currency. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm out of time. I'm sorry I can't ask you more questions, but maybe we can chat another time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Councillor Banga. Councillor Banga? Oh, 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead to Councillor Walters and uh, come back to see if we can get Councillor Banga. Councillor Walters, I see you there. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to everybody uh, for being here today. This, to a person, was an outstanding panel. Appreciated all the uh, submissions. And for those of you who haven't uh, sent them through to the clerk's office, I would really be grateful if you did. Uh, so I wanted to start with, uh, with Ms. Uh, Buey. Am I saying that correctly? Um, yes, Bui. Yes, thank you. you. So uh, your submission was excellent. Uh, I wondered if you could shine any more light uh, or if you have any more knowledge about what, if any, anti-racism, anti Indigenous history and BIPOC history, uh, education and training exists for recruit classes today. You talked about continuing, ed you talked about continuing education stuff. Part of it, also in the recruit class. Right, and that's something that I don't have information on because all the research that I did was just public information that I could find on the Edmonton Police Service. Right, so they just listed out the subjects that they had, which understandably, like I, I did look at some of the resources that were available as for prep material, and those looked quite outdated as well, too. So I can't exactly speak to the nature of them, but if they are similar to what I found online, then yeah, there might be an, an update, and I could probably expect that there wasn't any subject matter well, on there. I'll ask uh, Mr. Hoople that same, same question in a minute, but in terms of the, the adjustments to the KPIs, uh, any success in, in meeting those would depend on some more robust uh, education on, on anti-racism and, and on race, racism historically in our, in our community. Uh, so thank you for, for that submission. Uh, thank you. I did want to ask you about that. Uh, you know, I, I appreciated Mr. F uh, Fenwick's uh, shining the light on the f uh, last in, first out problem that exists. And I think the chief got unfairly characterized as threatening uh, recent diversity hires as a response to this motion. But I think what he was, was the world he's living within is the current labor rules where, uh, so, so can you talk a little bit about your knowledge of the kinds of training that's available to officers, uh, both recruits and continuing education related to anti-racism and Indigenous and BIPOC history in our communities, Black, Indigenous, people of colour uh, history in our communities? Um, sorry, is the question directed to me or the chief? Oh, the question is, I was just referencing your excellent point, but okay. I was asking question. Sorry, Mr. Walters, is that for uh, Curtis Hoople? Is that the question? Yeah, that's for Curtis Hoople. Sorry. Thank you. Mr. Hoople, that is for you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, you know, the training has uh, actually evolved quite um, a lot in the last few years. I do understand when the chief was referring to the, net, the last you know, for the diversity that would be lost in the five years. And that's the mark usually uh, looked at upon as when they're look, considering layoffs. Uh, I've personally been involved uh, with training. I used to be the police training officer uh, sergeant that was in charge of the program of when the officers go out to field training, that they're uh, um, partnered with a police training officer and provided, uh, you know, that field training that's necessary to succeed uh, throughout uh, probation. We've seen many programs uh, that uh, uh, involve diversity. We've uh, community partners uh, speak to the uh, recruits quite frequently. The recruits are, uh, you know, trained in relation to communication, uh, in relation to um, conflict. Um, they're trained. Uh, is, it, is it specifically anti-racism training and training about historical trauma in our community? I know we do that for City of Edmonton employees. So I wonder if that happens. Well, I'll give you, a, give you an example. So when the, some of our community partners come in, so the Indigenous uh, uh, families that come in to provide their stories to our recruits, um, it's that first person kind of reflection on how uh, they have been dealt with by police officers in the past. It gives that recruit an idea as to okay, what are the challenges they're going to be faced with when they go out and police these communities. So these are programs that are, are very successful and our partners come back continuously uh, to ensure that they're providing these recruits first reflection, first person reflection on 
uh, what they're going to uh, encounter when they're out there. But I want to be very clear, Mr. Walters, they're also trained in use of force and they're trained in tactics training as well, which is a necessity due to the due to, due to the uh, um, kind of exigent circumstances that members are faced with every single day. So I want to ask you one last question. Can you, as a sure. leader, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit, but you are clearly a leader in the, in the profession. Is yep. if you were able to tell us about a time when you've had to stand up to racism in the force? When I had to stand up to racism in the force? Yes. You know, I used to patrol, I was a beat officer for 118th Ave, so for Albert Avenue. I've been a constable on that Ave, and I've been um, a member, a sergeant, and a supervisor in that Ave. Uh, we've dealt with families on numerous occasions where we mutually agree to disagree at times. And I'll be honest with you, I've been called a racist many times, but I actually have those opportunities where I can have those discussions with the people so we can truly understand where we're both coming from. It is important for police to actually educate the public when we're challenged on those type of, and those issues. And racism has always been a main point of contention, especially on 118th Ave. When, and I've ch been challenged numerous times on whether I was a racist or not. So that was the opportunity where I could educate, inform, have those conversations. And it's okay sometimes, I'll be honest with you, it's okay to listen. And it's okay to reflect. And you know what? Just like the speakers here today, they've brought up some brilliant points. I'll be honest with you. Like, I'm pretty impressed today. I've been on all morning, and some of the things that have been presented um, are brilliant. So that's what I think these public hearings are doing, is bringing some amazing people at the front to ensure that city council is informed, and I'm quite impressed. Okay. Thank you. I'm sure I'm out of time, Mr. Mears. Thanks, everybody, for the time to be here. Thank you. Uh, I have uh, Councillor Banga. You're online again. I am, Mr. Mayor. Go ahead. Sorry for the tech glitch. No worries. Um, Happens to all of us. Go ahead. A couple of questions. Uh, uh, Ms. Perry, I would uh, like to ask you uh, some questions because you totally uh, expressed a different point of view. Uh, what most of the folks are telling us that there needs to be better training, better um, education for the police officers. But you are saying that, uh, again, uh, I mean, fight or flight uh, syndrome is, uh, I guess, basic uh, human instinct. What you're saying, if the training goes out, there is no training. Uh, what do we do? How do we resolve that issue? So I'm, I think I'm not quite clear on what your question is, Mr. Banga. Okay, the question is, uh, are you uh, totally in favor of abolishing any training at all for the police no, officer? I, no, I didn't say that. And uh, Bias training is useful from a long-term perspective. I sort of dis discussed this to another counselor's point earlier. I'm less racist than my grandparents, and that's because of conscious change over the generations. Um, but in terms of people reacting in the moment when they're under stress, and as a city, that's, that's a police officer's job, is to go into a situation that another person doesn't want to go into. They're, it's a stressful situation, and it's extra stressful because they don't know what's coming at them. In situations like that, they will react with their reflexes and their reflexes are not, it's not their higher brain. It's not their most pro-social self. And because that's why we see acts of violence in those situations. And the only way to tamp down the effects of that violence is to lessen the number of times people interact with police, to lessen the force available to police to use and then from a preventative standpoint, to invest in social services so that there are fewer of those, those stressful situations. So I'm not saying throw the baby out with the bathwater. Don't do cultural training, anti-racist training, anti-bias training. But when you're doing that training, you cannot expect that the officers who spent that two hours in that session or watched that 30-minute video, you can't expect that training to completely and the likelihood that they will be engaged in an unfortunate racist incident. 
And that's no. just because of how human brains work. No, I totally agree with you. Um, then you said we should lessen the police in- interactions. Yeah, who, I think I, I do think there. I do think. Sorry. Who would eventually do that? Is it police's job or is it somebody else's job? Who would do what? Sorry. Uh, reduce the number of police interactions. Well, the, I think I I think that that's where the whole sort of police divestment discussion is coming from. If there are fewer police on the street, if they are less armed, if there are not SROs in the schools, if instead of the money that we put to those resources, we are putting that money towards supportive, educational, anti-violence, um, community sustaining, basic income, affordable housing, if we're paying for those things, there are going to be there's less need for policing. I don't think, yeah. Yeah, Ms. Noor, a couple of questions for you. I know you were uh, uh, involved uh, in the initial, uh, I guess, setting of uh, anti-racism advisory committee. And then for three years, you worked hard enough to get to a stage where we got. And uh, then all of a sudden, uh, we did, uh, the city council did what was asked of them then did i i don't know where uh, where you didn't uh, get the information or did not uh, uh, for some reason your participation was uh, not exactly as enthusiastic as it was before could you shed some light on it yes i can thank you for asking um uh, just for, um, I just wanted to correct uh, something that you said, Councillor. Um, no, what we have requested has not been implemented. So it's not the fact that we requested it, it's been implemented, then we walked away feeling unenthusiastic. That's, that's not the rhetoric we're giving here. What we're saying is we worked three years very, very hard to engage with diverse African, Caribbean, Black communities who have diverse experiences, diverse histories, and, you know, various of different expertise and lived, uh, lived experiences that they wanted to share. We brought all of those reports back to city councillors. And we asked... Okay. And, sorry, I'm just going to finish. We asked for an anti-racism advisory committee that directly looks at these issues and not also looks, not also, not only researches, but also recommends to the city of Edmonton for policy change, exactly similar to the power that is given to WAVE, right? And also has a direct access to city councilor. What we got instead was just a consultation advisory committee about multiculturalism and anti-racism. And that's not what we asked for. Therefore, the city did not fulfill what was requested and the motion that has been passed. Thank you. Um, Mr. Mayor, do I have uh, more time left? Or I'm, done? I'm afraid not. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Zadig. Thank you very much. I want to thank the whole panel, and I'll echo what others have said. I think it's been a, a well-balanced conversation, and each submission has complemented each other from the various members of the panel. So, so thanks for that, uh, which is also, of course, a compliment to what we've heard in other panels. I have questions for, I'm going to ask first uh, Ms. Welsh, and then I'll ask Mr. Fenwick the same question. So if you both are prepared or um, this is what I would, would want to ask you. After listening to what you advanced, I believe that uh, you're in agreement that a core amount of policing is required in a city of a million people in the, in the city of Edmonton. So we need a, a core amount of police. So you're not talking about abolition. And then you say that social workers should respond to a lot of the calls that are more appropriate for, for social work. And I think we'll all agree with that. But then to the conversation about training for police, I, I was wondering what training should that core group of police have in some future state where we have more social workers being dispatched? So really the options are, should the police that are responding to 911 calls that involve violent crime and, and other more traditional police scenarios should what to what extent should they be trained in social work because right now 
uh, I believe that the police service tries to strike a bit of a balance with with having like well with training and social work. But in some future state where we have more actual social workers, where do you find that the training for police should fall upon? So, Miss Walsh, if if you want to start, otherwise, I see Mr. Fenwick is is ready to go. Oh, okay. Um, me, right? Tiffany Walsh, yes? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I guess like more broadly, um, cause I'm kind of thinking from a systems level. So I am definitely for uh, the abolishment of police and that's, um, purely because some of the research that even I've done has been, um, you know, the police system in and of itself is really only uh, meant to, it, it functions to control people of color and to protect the state and property. It doesn't actually do anything to protect people. So in the broad scheme of things, I would advocate for the abolition of police um, and instead divest into, um, instead invest into sort of community reconciliation and traditional healing approaches. Because um, when you kind of see some of the research that has been done in terms of engaging people in that way, particularly in situations of violent crime even, so whether that is sexual violence, family violence, um, murder, any of those kinds of different forms of crime, um, definitely like transformative justice approaches have been a lot more effective. Um, but I get what you're saying because, of course, we can't just completely divest altogether all at once. We do need alternative solutions. Um, and so when it comes to training for the police in the interim, um, it's hard to say. I do agree that, again, racism is programmed in a sense, um, and it's also reinforced within uh, the, the force in and of itself. And so it manifests in that way. But I think a broader focus potentially on sort of that social justice piece within police training will help to mitigate some of the interim impacts. I do find that, um, you know, a lot of individuals do become quite defensive when they are challenged with these issues. And, and when you actually, you try to challenge people in the ways in which their actions are perceived as racist. Um, I've noticed in my own interactions with police officers that they um, don't actually take that time to self-reflect. So I think um, part of those key trainings is, is really important. Those are the kinds of things that you would get within social work practice and other forms of crisis work is that self-reflection piece. And then I think emotional regulation, honestly, is a huge one that a lot of police officers lack. And it's simply because, as um, some of the other speakers were saying, like you're not thinking in terms of your um, higher executive functioning. You're going purely from your primal brain. And so I think um, emotional regulation training is a huge piece for anyone who's navigating crisis. And it's pretty common for a lot of crisis workers to have to do that kind of um, training. So why would police officers not also be expected to do something very similar? And more than just like an hour or in-class one-day session, like it, it would be a, it would need to be a very comprehensive sort of approach. I don't know if well, that answers the question. But. Yeah, that, that was very thoughtful. And I just wouldn't mind Mr. Fenwick weighing in on that, then uh, I'll be done with questions. Yeah, sure. Uh, so when it comes to my position on police uh, abolishments, like I readily admit that for many of us in this city, like it is going to be a process and we don't have all the answers in front of us at the moment. But as soon as we get the ball rolling, on divestment and people start getting used to the idea of divestment, especially when it comes to, say, the people that would be given newfound responsibilities. I think that, yeah, we don't have all the answers at the moment, but we will be able to find the answers when we begin doing the process. Um, now, when it comes to training, uh, what was previously said was, Excellence. Uh, but uh, two things that I would add, um, obviously, depending on the person, um, like the training, even on a conscious level, is not going to work. Uh, you can certainly look up uh, news articles regarding a certain uh, Canadian senator on uh, that uh, from the last year. Uh, but also, when I think about all the calls to reform police in North America, depending on the jurisdiction, it goes back to 1960s, 1950s, 1950s, depending on where we're talking about. And yet we have all the people that have presented uh, before me uh, this week sharing a lot of their trauma on their painful experiences. So 
like when it comes to things that we can do on training, like it's still necessary while we even do a transition for the conscious parts. But everyone that is legitimately a good police officer is still part of a system that harms so many people. And yeah, I think that's going to be my answer. Thank yeah, you very much. Next is uh, Councillor Paquette, then Councillor Essinger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to everyone who presented today. Um, you know, these are these are very important conversations to be having, and um, I'm glad we're having them. The some of the stumbling blocks here is that um, we've got uh, very emotional stories, which we need to hear and which are real, and we're talking about trauma and. PTSD and alienation, criminalization, and on and on. And this is a very real social uh, illness in our society. We also have police officers who are feeling like, that they are under attack personally. And so what I'd like to do is sort of back it up. And, uh, you know, let's take a look at this by the numbers, by the facts, by the data, and what it tells us about... Um, our systems, because one thing we heard uh, from many, many people, and we're hearing it more and more, is the admission that there's a systemic bias in our systems and in the foundation of policing, uh, especially in Western Canada. And these things echo, and they are alive today. But we also know that people don't generally go into service in order to be a bad guy. They're going into service to be a good guy or a good woman and or other. Um, so my question with that sort of basis is based on shared community values and by the numbers itself, not only the stats, but also the economic numbers. Does the current system deliver the most bang for the buck? Are we utilizing our dollars the most efficiently to get the re desired results on community safety? And, Maybe I'll ask um, uh, Ms. Perry to weigh in at this point. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm not totally clear on the question. Okay, so based on all of these things, based on all of our understandings and all of the things that we've heard in this week and, and today, when it comes to allocation of funds, when it comes to public dollars, are we getting the most bang for our buck with the current system? Or should we be reimagining this in order to maximize the, the, the dollars that we have in order to ensure community safety? Uh, I'm going to say I have an unequivocal no <laughs> is my answer to that question, I think. Um, something that the previous police chief, I used to work at civic events briefly, that's part of my career for the city of Edmonton, and something that the previous police chief used to say repeatedly to event organizers was, why do you need a guy with a badge and a gun? at your event to do whatever it was, usually security. Um, I'm gonna say that we send people with badges and guns who are unionized, expensive city employees out to do work that can be better done by individuals with more, with professional designations, professional training in whatever the particular conflict is, who are cheaper. Um, a very illustrative fact of that is RSOs in schools. Uh, an RSO costs, upward of 100K, half of that gets covered by Edmonton school boards. Um, a first year teacher is less than half of that. So that's an interesting uh, point. So, you know, just considering that idea, we're talking about training uh, police officers with more social work. Would we give a social worker, if we're interested in community safety and, and well-being and health, would we send a social worker into situations armed with a gun? That's that really what we want our social work service. I, I, I do understand what you're saying. Um, I and I agree that it's a complex question. I myself have called various police services at various times to do things like report domestic violence. I've never it's never been very useful. So even from that, from my subjective experience, it has not been effective to bring in a police officer who I know is expensive to come in and deal with that problem. Um, it is, we do also need to ensure the safety of the professionals who are capable of dealing with those problems. 
And I agree that there are really, really significant intersectional challenges to do with that. But I still think that it is better to send in a person with specific training in the area of difficulty than it is to send in a generic police officer. I think it's less likely to result in violence. I think it's less expensive for the public purse. Um, and I think it's better for the police officers. So can we say in a time of crisis, you're going to use the tools you have? I think that right now we're using the tool that we've decided is the ideal tool. And I think that that is actually a sign of pretty intense institutional bias and also a white supremacist hierarchy if I'm going to go all out. I think that we are thinking within a very small box. And I think that this discussion process is a great beginning for us to knock down the walls of that box and actually see the horizon, see the lay of the land. But we are just at the beginning of it. And I think that because of that, we have to really be aware of what discomfort we're feeling and whether or not that discomfort is because the idea is crazy and wouldn't work or because the discomfort is just the discomfort of being presented with something that is novel to us. Thank Does you. that answer your question at all? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Councillor Essinger. Thank you. And uh, I appreciate this conversation. Uh, like, I won't repeat any of the questions, but I do have some questions around... Um, and I think I'll speak to uh, Mr. Hoopel and Ms. Walsh. Um, often in a family violence situation, a social worker and a police officer are deployed together because they don't know what they're walking into. Um, so I've heard from many social workers in that area that they would feel unsafe going into some situations. Um, so they value that. Um, Mr. Hoople, I don't know if you have any experience in that or if you're aware of that. Uh, yeah, yeah ma'am. I, actually, I can speak to hundreds of examples. I used to do uh, some shift replacement with a child at risk response team. So I did, I've done that for a few months where I was actually partnered up with a social worker uh, or child uh, care worker. And uh, we went to numerous calls where uh, there was that element of violence or risk uh, to the people that were either in the residence, to the children, or to uh, the social worker that had to address the issues that sometimes we got right from the actual uh, office of child welfare that they, you know, basically it's like an action plan that we actually have to go and check and ensure that the children are safe and they're in an environment that's conducive of growth, uh, safe, um, you know, basically, um, so the police officer is that element and that partnership to ensure that all parties are safe, but the social worker or the child worker does a lot of the heavy lifting once that determination is made. But I tell you, it's a partnership that I've witnessed uh, time and time again that works incredible. And the training of both parties, the worker and the police officer, uh, complement each other uh, unbelievably. So uh, in that case, do you, when you're on the, in the field, do you defer to the social worker to de-escalate it? I, you know, I'm just taking who's taking the lead here. You know what? That is a good question because I'll, I'll tell you what, sometimes the, the, uh, the worker that I was with, they're brilliant. Like their skills are unbelievable. Uh, they're not in a uniform, so yes, but they do have a lot of markings that are, you know, a vest to ensure that they're safe. Uh, so we take those steps to ensure that we're at another level to, uh, so all parties are safe. But man, their skill set, and you work in a partnership where you're like, yeah, you've got this, you know, take it, and uh, you're doing great. And I just stand by and I watch in amazement. But then I also, the police officer also provides that, you know, where that basically the children respond and say, hey, are you a police officer? What do you do with this? What do you do with that? Uh, so we complement each other really well, but yes, you're right. We default to our skill sets, and uh, yeah, it works out great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Walter, I think you indicated you worked in uh, the family violence field. Did I understand that correctly? Yes, I am in uh, nonprofit leadership, and I've worked in a couple of different shelters at this point. 
So have you responded directly into homes or is it, do they report? Um, so I've never done home uh, visitation, but I do know the process because generally after those visits do happen, oftentimes uh, clients are escorted into shelter premises. Um, but then from kind of a, another perspective, I've done a lot of research in this area too. So I am aware of how the home visitation works and I have liaised with um a lot of the family violence units that we have. So specifically, um, we do have the domestic violence part of EPS. And um, I have talked to the social workers there. Um, I guess like my biggest criticism with that current process, though, is the lack of access. Um, Because one thing we have noticed is that like, you can pair a social worker with a police officer and have them come into the home. But then the follow up care after that is um, significantly lacking. And then another situation um, that I've, you know, heard from the clients that I serve, who are predominantly 76% of the individuals that I serve identify as Indigenous, a lot of them have um, basically identified to me differences where, you know, they, they see the presence of someone in uniform and all of a sudden their guard kind of goes up and they're uh, a little terrified because, you know, sometimes these survivors may have outstanding warrants for other things that are a direct result of poverty. Um, a lot of the people that I serve who have been survivors of violence are also subsequently um, targeted by poverty and criminalization in that sense. So there's a lot of different layers. It's not always just as simple as, you know, going into the home, a man and wife fighting with kids. Um, and so when you work with people in shelter, you hear sort of the flip side of that narrative where, yeah, like, you know, they came into the home and have been escorted into here, but there's also the individuals who don't feel comfortable even reaching out to the police for support. And as we know, um, family violence is very, very incredibly underreported, um, specifically because there is that fear and because we do have um, systems at play where, you know, people are getting dual charges. So the abuser and the survivor are both getting charged um, after an altercation or um, you witness the incident happening on the street and, you know, the, there's no social workers available. So then officers are trying to go in and de-escalate and it's not really working. So there's a bunch of different kind of factors at play in a lot of different ways in which someone navigating family violence would come in contact with the system. And so having a social worker present definitely helps mitigate a lot of things. But the presence of a uniformed officer also escalates a lot of things. And that's just because of the sort of systemic violence that these systems have caused, right? And the history of policing. Like there's a very long history that I think is a huge barrier to moving forward when it comes to family violence response, if that makes sense. No, and I appreciate that. Uh, and I and I think that the value is trying to understand, you know, how do you keep people safe, but how do you yeah. support them through the system? And, you know, we might need a continuum of services, but... Uh, working together seems to make the most sense. Uh, I think that's all my questions. I must be out of time, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any other questions from members of council? Councillor Paquette, if you could uh, take the chair. I've got a few. I have the chair. Um, I think... trying to figure out who to direct this to. There have been so many excellent points made about mental health here um, for people interacting with police, uh, for people, uh, for police members, um, and even just the stress and challenge of confronting systemic oppression and what it is like for decision makers like ourselves even is something I've been reflecting on in the course of this panel because this has been very challenging for, for us and very challenging as a public discussion. But I think that that's what needs to be happening right now. Um, uh, and so a, a, couple of, a couple of questions around that. Um, um, I'm curious, Ms. Bui, your reaction uh, uh, to uh, those, that general theme, and specifically as it relates to to training, um, and to the extent that we need a service to respond to 
all these different kinds of calls for service that exists. Maybe some don't need a badge and a gun, some still may, and we, we need to equip people with extraordinary force to protect themselves in the line of duty and, and in their work. So given all of that complexity, uh, you had excellent comments about training, but, but uh, training around mental health, mental resiliency, somebody mentioned emotional regulation training, which I think I need urgently. Um, what would your advice be for us around, uh, around uh, training and mental health as a, as a regime? And I thank you for asking me, Mayor, because as um, some of the commentary came up, um, Tiffany as well too, as her experience speaks exactly to that, um, is that emotional regulation. And talking about how, of, of course, anybody in a stressful situation, you can't respond in a logical way. Personally, for myself, what I do when I'm in a stressful situation is I manage my emotions. And that's a critical component of training, which is not typical of what training looks like today. Training, I think what people assume it is, is like, okay, I'm going to speak to you and you're going to learn this and then you're supposed to observe this and change your behavior. And that's exactly why people think that training doesn't work. But if we implement a type of training program that includes mental health, how to regulate your emotions, part of that self-reflection piece is a really important piece because what we're doing today at this public hearing is self-reflecting on ourselves. And to have that space in training is necessary. So there's different training techniques that we can use to include, but... Um, some of the suggestions that were brought up today were really important and crucial alongside the knowledge piece, which is the anti-racism, the history behind um, our communities as well, too. So it's a multifaceted. And I also do want to say that training is also, and this is applied this to my business, is not the one and be all solution. It is, I believe, from my position, a necessary solution to educate, um, but it is not the only solution. And again, to reiterate, um, like the whole mental health. Uh, the stress awareness and how do we manage that and also to support our police officers and our victims um, is going to be a crucial part of that training. So to, to Mr. Hoopel, are you getting that or do you need us to press the commission and the service to make sure that your members, uh, and, and I know this whole conversation I would acknowledge has been really tough for serving members right now and people on the front line who do feel attacked right now. And, and I want to acknowledge that and say not just in the context of these very difficult community conversations, but in general in your work, do you need more support and, and can we help you <laughs> on behalf of your, your colleagues and members in securing that? Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I appreciate that. Yeah, we do need help. But this is what we're doing. We're at the table and we're, we're having these discussions. There's some legislation that needs to be changed uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, proper processes are in place. The training program that uh, the Edmonton Police Service has is amazing. Uh, the people in that area do an incredible job. Their curriculum has a lot of these things that we're already discussing around this table. It's just I'm not the subject matter expert that can speak to that. Sergeant Hickey, Staff Sergeant Goodkey, uh, Inspector Trevor Hermanutz are all incredible leaders when it comes to training. Uh, Staff Sergeant uh, Andy Wasilishin, who was in there for five years, done an incredible job. We've got incredible members that are going to be able to provide counsel and anybody in this hearing details on what training offers currently and maybe what are the tweaks that are required uh, to get better um, at what we do. Thank so, you. So, yes, just, we need support. Sir. Just before I run out of time, I... Um uh, I think that would be very helpful. Normally, all of that sort of information gets shared with commission, and so there's not broad public awareness necessarily or counselor awareness. So I think that would be really helpful for us to learn more about um, as part of the, the further discussion here for, for learning for all of us. Uh, finally, for, for Ms. Nur, uh, I, I hear your point about the ability to not just hear more because there's been a lot of dialogue, but, but your challenge to us to empower uh, a group to actually make recommendations. And I'd like your advice, because I want a place to send the Frank Oliver question. I want a place to send the Dan Knott question. I want a place to hear all of those historical and current issues that are wounds in the community, particularly for, for BIPOC Edmontonians. Um, and is that committee with a stronger mandate the right place to do that, or do we need and I don't know if a Civic Truth and Reconciliation Commission is, is, is the right or wrong way to frame it, but do we, do we need a, it sounds to me like we need a more robust place. What is your advice for us about what is the right venue 
to hear from and make real substantive transformative recommendations across a spectrum of issues that need to be healed in this city. Um, thank you, Mr. Mayor, for asking that. I think that's a very important question and really does show in terms of the, the amount of reflexivity that we have been doing as a community, including our governmental officials. I feel that when it comes to, uh, I don't want to be quick to giving an answer because I, I have a way that our cultural protocols is always to sit with our elders, to sit with our communities and talk about what does a concrete solution in terms of moving forward look like. Even for me to be part of this meeting and speak on behalf of the community, I had to get consent from the elders, from the youth and from the mothers and families that we serve. So if you do give us an opportunity, we would love to continue this relationship that we now are developing and actually submit what anti, you know, anti-black racism really looks like and what, um, like, what concrete solutions we can implement and, and their tangibles and put a timeline around it. That's one aspect of answering your question. The next one is um, I would highly encourage revisiting the Anti-Racism Committee Advisory Group. Civic engagement is something that is highly valued in Canada. It's Canadian culture, democracy is Canadian culture. And I would like our, our, our city councillors and mayor to also acknowledge that it was young people that advocated for that for three years straight and put their work and their effort not being paid, not being recognized, not doing it for fame, but just so nobody dies or, or everyone's life is valued. And I would highly recommend for that, um, for, for it to be restructured and actually look again, what was the purpose of that um, anti-racism council? And is it serving that purpose? And it's okay if it's not, you know, change takes time, but how can we go back and actually put those layers of changes, which is something that the community directly asked for. And then the last piece is actually investing more funding into communities. Um, I know that, you know, you have mentioned that REACH has a 24-hour crisis line. Um, ASAC has a 24-hour crisis line. We have youth that experience psychosis in the middle of the night that call us. We are social workers. We graduated from criminology. We graduated from uh, psychology. We graduated from public policy. These are directly people from the community that have expertise that are serving these youth. As I mentioned, even... Our community recognized it and gave us small funding and we've directly allocated that to the youth. Edmonton police acknowledge what we're doing because the youth said this is the best organization to help me out. And they allocated funds for us to help the youth. So acknowledgements have been coming, but it was it kind of did question us that if REACH gets all the like most of the proportion in terms of the 24 access, um, um, 24 access of um, sorry, request for mental health and crisis, what happens to organizations like ours who are uh, found by young people, who are found by young professionals, who are found by people of African descent that have the cultural knowledge and the cultural safety of healing, reconciliating, and also creating blueprints of how to move forward. We're not working in, in silo. The city of Edmonton is part of our community and we are part of the community. So when we give this recommendations, it's not to cause tension, but to say, how can we preserve life and truly create a vibrant city? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Clare. I return the chair. Well, thank you. That's all um, very thoughtful and powerful testimony this morning from this panel. So I, on behalf of uh, uh, my council colleagues in the, in the city, I wanna thank each of you for taking time. Um, uh, you've had, an impact by speaking here uh, and, and very constructively as well. So, and that, that makes it easier for us to hear hard truths. So thank you uh, to each and every one of you. Uh, and um, uh, again, it's, it's a continuing dialogue, not the end of, so I look forward to further dialogue uh, with many of you in your follow-ups as well as we engage on this. Uh, um, so so uh, that is, uh, Unless there are any other questions, last call from other members of council. Not hearing any, then again, to those of you who are on the line right now, uh, we will have an opportunity to, uh, you're, you will have an opportunity to obviously continue to monitor this meeting uh, at edmonton.ca slash meetings. Um, 
and to continue to provide us other feedback by email and other mechanisms as well. So thank you all. Uh, we, a number of you have indicated you'll be sending up your notes or links or references along. Uh, you can send those to city.clerk at edmonton.ca and they'll be distributed to members of council um, and as, uh, attached as part of the meeting records. So thank you very much again. Uh, I've learned a lot this morning. I'm grateful. Thank you. Okay, so we'll recess um, uh, until 1.30, uh, at which point we will hear from panel six. Thank you.
Good afternoon and welcome back to panel six. Uh, before we, before I uh, orient a little bit, I will um, just do a quick roll call <coughs> to establish attendance of members of council, starting this time with Councillor Cartmel. Good afternoon. Welcome. Councillor Katerina. Councillor Zadig. Present. Great. Councillor Essinger. Mr. Mayor, I'm here. Oh, thank you, Councillor Katerina. Councillor Essinger. Oh, she she had sent me a note. She's just uh, uh, finishing up a, a piece of business and she'll be along as quickly as she can. So look out for when she joins and we'll make a note. Um, <coughs> so she intends to join us very shortly. Councillor Hamilton. Present. Welcome, Councillor Henderson. I'm back. Hello, Councillor Knack. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor McKean. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Super, Councillor Nickel. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Councillor Paquette. Good afternoon. Welcome, Councillor Walters. Hello, I'm here. Hello, and Councillor Banga. Present. Super. Okay, Councillor. I'm Essinger. here now, Mr. Mayor. Oh, welcome. Glad you could. Uh, glad you could make it. Thanks. Okay, so that's all members of council. <clears throat> I'll just outline uh, the process for the panel here before us uh, uh, in the non-statutory hearing on the referred motion regarding the Edmonton Police Commission. Speakers uh, will have been paneled and will present to council in the order in which they were registered. Each speaker will be given five minutes to speak. The clerk will run a timer in the room, but you may wish to have your own timer to pace yourself accordingly. Once you've finished speaking, please mute your microphone, but please stay on the line as councillors may wish to ask you questions. And after all speakers within the panel have made their presentation, each councillor will be given five minutes to ask one round of questions if they wish. After each panel, a short recess will be called um, to allow for setting up the next panel of presenters. <laughs> if you wish to listen and follow along in the meeting after your panel is complete, of course, you're always welcome to do so on City Council's live stream, which is available at edmonton.ca slash meetings. This uh, process does require some patience from everybody to ensure that anyone who does wish to address Council has an opportunity to do so. I would ask that you please refrain from using the chat function uh, in the virtual meeting during the meetings as it can create issues of decorum uh, and fair participation in the meeting for and safety for all uh, participants and it can also technically interfere with the live stream so please refrain from using the chat function. Additionally, uh, please remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. If you're having any challenges whatsoever, the Office of the City Clerk has resources available to help facilitate your participation. Please reach out to the City Clerks using the information provided in the reply to your registration. Uh, I'll also note that a speakers list for each panel will be provided on edmonton.ca slash meetings for your reference. Now before I roll call the panel here, um, uh, I can report back to you that there were a total of 49 additional registrations uh, since yesterday when we were last updated. Uh, that is about three panels worth and in consultation with uh, the city clerk and the city manager the recommendation is that we add Wednesday of next week as a full day meeting so repurpose the morning uh, and then use the afternoon to accommodate the balance of the panels and that way we'll have an opportunity to hear from everyone who has registered. Uh, in order to allow the clerks to expediently reply to those um, uh, requests that have come in in the last um, 18 hours or so, uh, I'd like, if I could get it, a motion to adjust orders for this meeting to um, extend into Wednesday from 9.30 to 5.30 to add the, 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 the final three panels so we can hear from everybody. So moved. Thank you, Councillor Knack. Need a seconder? I'll second it. Second. <clears throat> okay, so uh, the motion to extend orders to complete the hearing um, uh, by adding all of, all day next Wednesday uh, is before us. To be uh, really clear though, uh, all that will do is finish the hearing. Pivoting back to uh, questions 
uh, of the original presentation and issues arising, as well as debate on the motion. We haven't scheduled that yet. Um, and hopefully by next Wednesday, we will have an answer to when that's going to happen. But we do have to work around this, the schedules of many officials to be able to do that. Uh, so uh, so we, we simply haven't been able to schedule that yet. So bear with us on that. We'll let you know when the discussion will continue past the public hearing next week. So um, with that clarification, let me just see if there are any questions from members of council on the schedule change to accommodate all the panelists. Uh, Mr. Mayor, quick question. Go ahead, Councilor um, Anderson. Uh, well, only, only because we, we've now left ourselves half a day for council next week. It's not a huge agenda, but there may be a couple things on there. So I'm wondering if in the way we schedule this, if we do end up, with, if we end up a panel not going to full time, which has happened a number of times to us, whether or not that time is grabbable back to, to, to try and continue with the council meeting as we go. Um, just because otherwise I, I just, I, that will miss that piece of the puzzle as well. So just, that's, a, just a thought. That's, that's a very well-meaning suggestion, Councillor, and in a real pinch, we could uh, um, ask the clerks to do even more somersaults than they already have. But yeah, gonna, I hear you. Gonna, okay. But I'm going to suggest, I'm gonna <laughs> suggest, yeah. I'm gonna suggest we not All do right. that because spinning down one meeting and spinning up another is, has a lot of IT Point uh, taken. complexity. All right. Okay, but, I withdraw the suggestion. But I would, I would remind you that we have uh, repurposed Tuesday afternoon after the land use public hearing to complete the end and evening if necessary to complete the council business for next week. So uh, so we have more than half a day for that. Um, and uh, we should ha we have a day a day and a half essentially if we need to go into the evening. I really hope we don't. But <laughs> but that's that's of course up to us. Um, so so I appreciate the suggestion, but we'll try to keep them distinct uh, so we're not hopping around. So. But, uh, but your eagerness is noted, uh, Councillor Henderson. <laughs> I'm not sure it can be described as eagerness, but that's all right. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Okay, I um, just realized I hadn't uh, turned on my system fully here now. Okay, I think I'm fully on deck. Um, so what I would like to do, having described a few moments ago the process for the hearing, is just uh, roll call our uh, panelists we here. We still need to vote, Mayor Iveson. Oh, pardon me. Thank you. Uh, please vote on the uh, changes to the orders to add next Wednesday. Yes. Yeah. So that's a verbal yes from Councillor Nichol. We've got 12 votes so far, waiting for one more. Hmm? What? I thought I, anyway. That's 13. Okay, please display the vote. And that's carried unanimously. So appreciate council's flexibility. <laughs> um, that's very democratic of us, I will say. Um, but that's our job. So now uh, uh, I will roll call the, uh, the, the panel. Um, and uh, just if you can unmute yourself uh, and, uh, and just indicate that you're present when I call your name. Uh, and also make note of the order and who is before uh, you uh, so that you can be ready when um, uh, when we come to you. That would be great just to keep things moving. So first up is Alexander Donovan. Present. Great. Second is Mo Tesfay. Uh, Mo Tesfay, clerks indicate that you're in the meeting, but uh, we haven't been able to hear from you yet. Can you turn your camera on and give us a wave if you can hear us? And unmute yourself. Okay, well, we'll um, hopefully uh, in the next few minutes you'll be able to um, connect. Next is, uh, third is Nigel Roll or Rolly. They did not check in. Okay, Nigel has not checked in. Um, I understand. So then next would be Franklin Moore. And same, no check-in. No check-in, okay. Uh, fifth is Shelley Johnson. Present. Fantastic, welcome. Uh, next thank is you. Matthew Campbell. Here. Welcome, thank you. Uh, next is Srosh Hassan. 
It's Saroj, and I'm present. Saroj, thank you. And uh, please do correct me uh, if uh, I get it wrong. Apologies in advance. Uh, thank you for that. Next is Adam Bentley. Present. Welcome. Next is Allison McIntosh. Here. Welcome. Next is Alexandra Konkina. Haven't checked in. Okay. Next is uh, Jas Panisar. Next is Rakesh Walters. Present. Welcome. Uh, next is Audrey Redman. Present. Welcome. And last in this panel is Rahik Handu. Present. Welcome. Okay, well, if uh, Nigel, Franklin, Alexandra, or Jazz um, uh, join us, we'll try to fit them in uh, in their allotted time here. Uh, but uh, we'll, um, we'll carry on first with Alexander Donovan. Go ahead, you've got five minutes. All right, first, oh boy. Um, thank you, uh, Council and Mayor. I'm in Ward 8. I'm an educator, historian. Uh, an artist. Uh, I'm for the motion, but believe it needs to go further. Uh, these issues are not new. Many activists and leaders like uh, Bashir uh, Mohammed and uh, Dunya Nur from this morning, amongst many others, have been articulating them for years. Uh, time and time again, we ask Black, Indigenous, people of color, and queer peoples to justify their pain and their experience without any guarantee of change. Um, we've been socialized to believe that cops are these heroes who catch bad guys, chase bank robbers, and find serial killers. And we know that's not entirely accurate. They spend majority of their time responding to non-criminal issues like noise complaints and issuing parking and traffic tickets. And time and time again, we've seen, even through the last few days, proposed reforms to try and train out systemic racism from cops. But the issue is that policing in Canada is mired in racist roots, um, as is most of our society at this point. For example, the creation of the NWMP in 1873, now the RCMP, was operated like a military organization tasked with suppressing Indigenous peoples in Western Canada. I mean, John A. Macdonald got the idea from the paramilitary police forces the British used to suppress the Irish. And I know, yes, EPS is not the RCMP, but they were created in 1892 after the RCMP had been policing Alberta for years. And since the start of 2020, five Indigenous and Black people have died at the hands of the police out of eight reported deaths by police this year. This is just what we know because reporting of fatal police shootings is not well documented or even required. We should have required reporting of all incidents of violence by officers, suicides that happen while in police presence, slash custody, and shootings for effective statistics. These previously mentioned deaths did not happen in Edmonton, but from 2000 to 2017, EPS had the fifth highest number of people killed by police in Canada. In that period, 23 people were killed by police. According to EPS, only one officer died in that period. All of these deaths are tragic, but the disparity here is evident. In Canada, 212 white people were killed by police from 2000 to 2017. White people make up at least 75% of the population. 112 Black and Indigenous peoples were killed by police between 2000 and 2017. Black and Indigenous peoples make up 8.4% of the population combined. If the police are killing that many Black and Indigenous peoples, just imagine how many more face violence and harassment. We can defund the police. We're in a pandemic right now where we looked and said, this is going to kill a small percentage of us. That was obviously not okay. So we're going to take drastic measures to protect those who are at risk. Has it been easy? No. Has it been effective? Yes. We can defund the police. Will it be difficult? Probably. Is it possible? Yes. We must invest in social programs. We've heard from many excellent outreach organizations these last few days who are severely underfunded. Working as an educator, I receive cuts every year. I work in the language and instruction for newcomers and every single year we just lose more and more of our services that are helping um, uh, citizens who need it and, and permanent residents. Um, we must eliminate carding, we must remove school resource officers from schools. Oversight committees also, while they're a good idea, they rarely have ever worked effectively. Um, you can look at the SIU for an example in Ontario. It starts out of good intentions, but they're mostly made up of former law enforcement and have rarely done much. Um, social programs do so much better work with so much less. The police work for us, the public, and at this moment they've failed us. Um, I highly suggest you read Robin Maynard's excellent work, Policing Black Lives, for countless well-researched factual reports on the violence Black and Indigenous Canadians deal with from police. And even her work has been hindered by the lack of 
um, statistical reportings. Um, finally, the police seem to be using their funding in less than effective ways. Just this week, I watched a patrol of six bicycle officers just biking around my neighborhood. Um, why on earth do we need six officers patrolling at once? Uh, like, what are they going to even do? Um, it just feels like a waste of resources. And we also don't need police helicopters. As a last note, I've heard mention of the excellent people who are officers. And I know this seems paradoxical, but if we defund the police and rethink what policing is, we'll have a chance to actually help those officers who truly feel that they want to do well. I mean, wouldn't they rather people see them as positive helpers in their community and not immediately be frightened when they see them? I mean, even I get frightened when I see the police and I'm white. I know they're not going to come at me probably and attack me. Um, this isn't about vilifying the cops. It's about being honest about how our society is made up at this time. Um, so defund the police, invest in community. Oh, and black trans lives matter. Thank you, uh, Alexander. Next up is Mo. Actually, sorry, before I go to Mo Tesfe, uh, I want to uh, just double check. The um, clerks have asked me to ask the person registered under the handle, quote, respect the greats, um, identify themselves. We need you to unmute yourself and identify yourself, otherwise we'll have to remove you from the hearing. Hello? Hi there. Who's this? Hey, uh, this is Nigel Rowe. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay, you, you'll, be, uh, you'll be the next speaker. Thank you for uh, um, matching a name to a handle. That's helpful to us. Welcome, and uh, glad you can join us. Okay, you'll be up uh, after uh, Mo Tesfe. Thank you so much. And uh, I see Jas uh, Panasar has just joined us as well. Uh, we will uh, get to you as number 11 on the panel, sir. So uh, welcome, glad you could join us. Um, is, uh, has Franklin Moore been able to join us? No, and Alexandra Konkin? Hello, uh, I'm present, I'm here. Sorry, Franklin? Hello? 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 Uh, is this Mo? Can you uh, hear me? Yes, yes we can, Mo, thank you. So we'll go oh. to you, it's your time now. You have five minutes, sir, welcome. Uh, can you ever see my address oh, there? Give me a second, I got a technical problem here, so. Uh, uh, Do you want us to come back to you, or? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Can, yeah, just come back to me. Okay, okay uh, if, if you don't mind, then we'll go ahead to Nigel, uh, since you're there now. Uh, go ahead, and then we'll come back to Mo. Hello, am I on now? Yes, go ahead. You have five minutes, sir. Go ahead. Welcome. Okay, thank you so much. My apologies about the name. I had no idea that I uh, came up there. Um, so I just want to put that there. No problem. Um, okay, so, so as I get started, um, I don't want to go and touch on all the emotional things, really, because we've heard all the cries. We understand the injustice, um, the injustice of people and on the police force. We have understand that we've heard that. I think it's well known. I just have a few points here that I think will truly help out as far as solutions um, into making the force better, and the people at large, and to make people feel more safe. Um, so we believe that police policemen should start policing themselves, uh, such as if they see other policemen deviating from their training or acting volatile towards others, they should be able to check the other line officer and also be able to place him under arrest because of, because no one is above the law. Um, I also believe that if officers from different races are in fear of another race, then there should be more of the same race of people that look different from those officers um, going into other neighbors and policing Sorry, I have no reason. I have no idea why I'm stuttering like this. This is weird for me. Um, <laughs> there should be other uh, nationalities placed on the force that shows um, 
other policemen that it's okay to have conversations with other nationalities or races of people. It's okay um, to allow other people to feel safe around you, things of that nature. Um, because we also understand that other races of people um, can deal with different situations better than others who have no idea of actually being in that situation based off of, um, just based off of, how can I put this? Uh, just based off of different realities and coming from different backgrounds, really. Um, and we also believe that for families that have lost their loved ones to injustice of any kind, especially from police brutality, should be given some some sort of atonement due to the loss of life, grief, trauma, and everything else that families have to go through. Raising kids up on their own. Um, reparations of this sort can be in the form of not only having officers placed in jail, but having this paycheck even given to the family for a number of years. Uh, it can be based on monthly paychecks to the family because of the necessary funding needed to assist broken families. And an example of this, we see this happen when it comes down to things like child support, when the family's not, when the father's not around anymore to take care of his responsibilities. We feel that um, that can be a way to pretty much help support broken families. So that's just a few points that I have on this. Um, and I think that's, that's just, hopefully some of those ideas can help out and can start the conversation on some things. But thank you guys for having me for sure. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you for making the time, Nigel. Next, uh, we'll go to uh, back to Mo Tesfe. You got your technical situation sorted out there? Oh, you got to unmute yourself, Mo. Welcome. Yeah, uh, there you go. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, just uh, I'm, uh, regarding. Uh, my name is Mo. I'm a previous owner of uh, Niala restaurant downtown. But before I use my five minutes, I'm just going to ask you guys uh, to give me extra three minutes. So because the reason why uh, I'm here, uh, it's not only representing myself, I'm representing most African Canadian businesses downtown. They, I'm, I'm sorry, they, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Tesfaye. The rules are have to be consistent for for everybody. If I give you three more minutes, I'd have to give other people three minutes. So I'll have to ask you to confine your comments to the five minutes out of just fairness to everybody. So I I, I hear you. I wish we could uh, give everybody more time, but um, we'll start the time now, uh, and and everybody gets the same five minutes. All right, okay. The reason why is a lot of most uh, African business owners, they don't come in the front because they, they scare for the retaliation of the police and the city. So, the, so be, I, I'm going to speak behalf of them. That's why the reason I ask is three minutes. But that's okay. It's not fair for like other people. But at the same time, uh, we're the one we've been abusing and harassing for more than three years by the police. So five, five minutes is not really to explain everything on it. But I'll, I'll try that. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you a video, uh, and uh, the video itself sp speaks themselves, and it's, it's not really need my, my word. Uh, this is a video, the one, uh, the police officer, they're going through every African bar in Edmonton. It's not only my place. This is basically targeting all African business and downtown area. Uh, the reason why, uh, I don't know the reason why, the reason. But the only thing my point is here is, the problem is, it's not about only police officer. The city itself, is, they have a problem. Uh, you guys, you don't even listen to us. Unfortunately, the murder of George opened the door for us. We've been, we've been targeted by police officers the last five years, every single day in inspection, militarized wise. You can't look at it in the video. They opened the fridge, they opened, you guys, you never even ask us. The problem is it's not about only police officers. The problem is about the city. The city is the one, you guys provide them all the ammunition to do it. 
So even if you ask the police officer, oh, we got order from the city. So the problem starts from the city. You guys, you have to listen to us. The only time we heard from you guys when election come or when the bills like uh, property tax bills come or uh, business bills come. That's the only time you get, we can hear from you guys. You guys, you have to come down to contact the community. Hear the community is a problem. We, the, we have a problem. Defund the police is not going to make any difference for us. It's going to make it worse. They're going to retire. Re, 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 they're going to they're going to revenge to us. So defending the police is nothing for it's going to change for black community. I'm telling you here. So the only thing I'm going to ask you guys is just there is a virus goes through to that virus racism goes through to the police department and the city. You guys going to find out the vaccine. That means if you arrest this person in the military and in, in the police department, fire them. Take the power from the police. That's why the for solution, if you guys want to help us. I've been 20 years in the military. Within my 20 years of experience, I never get issue about my color of the skin. There is nothing. The chain of command there, they perfect. It's a training. So the city, the city itself has to be responsible for the police action. It's not only the police. The police, they're doing the job because you got order from you guys. Look at that, how many police officers they, 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 they come. Three times a week, 10, minimum is 10 police officers, maximum up to 20 for the last three years. So add them up. And you can calculate how much, how much money they spend only for Niala. Forget about another bar. They do it every single day. You guys never even ask us the question, what's the problem? The problem is just only not the police. Again, I'm going to repeat it twice. You guys you have to also, the city. The city is part of it. But I, 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 I'm going to, uh, one more thing I, I'm going to say regarding for the chief. The, the chief is, is really is doing a really good job. Uh, actually, I, I met him and uh, he's trying to communicate with the, the community. But I'm going to suggest to him, when you hire minority, make sure hire the minority, he knows the community, he knows the people. Don't hire the black guy, he's a part of the community. That's going to be a puppet for us. That's a, it's going to be the worst one. So when you hire minority, the police officer, make sure hire someone helping the community, someone communicate with the people. It's not you don't hire someone puppet for you guys. I don't have no more question. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Tesfe. You, you stayed within the five minutes, uh, but you covered a lot of ground, and, and thank you very much for doing so. And I, I hear your point about uh, overcoming fear to come and speak to us, and that's, that's really important. So thank you for, uh, for sharing. I'm sure there'll be some questions for you, so please stay on the line. Uh, next, I uh, just want to check Franklin Moore. Did Franklin hasn't been able to join us? Okay, then next up will be Shelley Johnson, followed by Matthew Campbell. Hi there. Hi, go ahead. Okay, I just want to start off by saying that I am white, and I have two white children and two biracial children, and I brought them out here from Nova Scotia, and I'll tell you, I've seen the racism since I've been out here. I want to say how sad it is that some of the police officers think that they're untouchable, and they're supposed to protect and serve, and how tragic it is that it took George Floyd being murdered to start opening some eyes. We've all seen the videos of the Edmonton police that did the, uh, what they did to the indigenous man after he was already down. You see the officers taking a little run, then drop down with his knees, like this isn't WWF. I've also seen how the Edmonton police treat the black businesses in my 13 years of living out here. I've been gone, you know, I've gone to many clubs and bars and whatnot, some of them prominently white and some prominently black. And the white clubs, I've barely seen any police walk through, if I've even seen any. And then my time in the club, clubs that are like mostly black customers, it just blew me away to see the amount of officers that go through there, including police, the AGLC, the fire department, and they come in and intimidate the customers, even put their hands on them. And why do they show up so often in that kind of a manner? It seems like it's like a, a raid or something. 
ID machines and looks like they're looking for somebody? And how can black business owners thrive when the police come through on an overly regular basis, along with ADLC and fire in the city? No one is going to want to go to a club that's being stopped by these officers from the very, you know, different places, like I said, ADLC and whatnot. And we've all seen the, the videos on the news, the internet, and black people have no reason to feel safe in this situation. The police treat black customers and black owners like they're second class people. And to come into a small black owned business with 99% of all black customers in a military style fashion, it seems like it's obvious their mission is to let these black people know their place. And I've seen a dramatic drop in the customers and the club that I go to. About two and a half years ago, I started to go. And who wants to go to a place, you know, you're trying to relax, have some drinks, with some music, dance, whatever, and then have more than 10 people. Like, again, police, the ADLC, everybody from the various places come through as often as they do. And I've seen, and I've seen it in a few other black home bars, too. And, I mean, black business owners have the right to make a living and have a right to be, you know, have their business and not be constantly harassed. And the owner of Niella, he's been in Canada for, what, over 30 years? I know him. He's been in the Army. He was in the Army for over 20 years. He was taken away and caught and held for 24 hours. And for what reason? Because they said he was a flight risk. He's made his life here. He served in the Canadian Army to protect. And this is how he's treated. Police brutality, it really needs to stop. And Black Lives Matter. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. Next is Matthew Campbell, followed by Sarosha Sun. Good afternoon. My name is Matt Campbell, and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today. Initially, I was unsure in the value of me speaking, as in many ways, I will more than likely be sharing comments you've already heard during public hearing, but I believe they all bear repeating. As we are all aware, we are living during a global health crisis, a pandemic whose impacts will touch everyone in this city, this province, the country, and the world. However, COVID-19 is not the great equalizer that many claim it to be. It disproportionately harms Edmonton's Black and Indigenous communities. As the City of Edmonton looks to prioritize and allocate funding to build its future, it needs to do so with these communities in mind. That's why I do not believe that the motion before you goes far enough. It's long overdue for the City to divest itself from policing and invest in community-led organizations that focus on affordable housing, mental health programming and supports, and other community-led organizations organizations that support and center the experiences of Black, Indigenous, and other marginalized communities. Just last week, Dale McPhee, the Chief of the Police Service, said 30% of the calls that EPS take are themselves social services calls. How many of these end up with a Form 10 under the Mental Health Act? A Form 10 allows officers to apprehend a youth, adult, or a senior who they feel requires intensive long-term and or more comprehensive mental health services and supports. Those that meet this criteria are then admitted to, to the hospital and then detained under the act. I'd be curious to know how many of those apprehended by EPS are then taken to a hospital and are not subsequently detained under the act when they're assessed. This forms a revolving door in our emergency rooms in which an intervention by a non-policing entity would be a better gateway to our healthcare system. Policing, with its history of violence against communities of black people, indigenous people, people of color, the unhoused, LGBTQ2S+, sex workers, and people with disabilities should not be a band-aid to cover up gaps in underfunded and undersupported social services. Dismantling and rebuilding these systems of oppression is difficult. It's complex, and it won't happen overnight. But it needs to start now, today, with real and meaningful action. Acts of decolonization and reconciliation are so much more than just non-anglicized indigenous names on our streets or our city wards. I mentioned earlier that I don't believe that this motion goes far enough. That's why, in the meantime, I'm calling for an immediate end to both the school resource officer program as well as street checks and carding. I, as a white cis man, have only been carded once in my life. I asked the officer why he was stopping me as I was just crossing the street on my way home from a friend's house. The officer told me, quote, 
This is how we make sure you're not one of the bad guys. End quote. As council is also aware, in 2016, Black Lives Matter YAG released statistics obtained via a FOIP request on carding and street checks in Edmonton. Statistics which affirmed the lived experiences of Edmonton's Black and Indigenous communities. A Black person is 4.7 times more likely to be carded. An Indigenous person is 6.3 times more likely to be carded. Indigenous women specifically are 9.7 times more likely to be carded. Carding, as the officer who stopped me once told me, is how they, quote, look for the bad guys. Are the bad guys 4.7 times, 6.3 times, or 9.7 times more likely to be Black, Indigenous, and Indigenous women, respectfully? The first steps of anything this meaningful, anything this important, are the most difficult. It's not going to happen overnight. Making real meaningful change is hard. It's going to put a lot of folks who are used to being used to feeling powerful, feel awkward. Mr. Mayor, I would like to close with words you yourself spoke in September of 2016, following two filmed incidences of Black Edmontonians being subjected to racial slurs. Quote, it's going to be a little bit awkward. That's how we're going to make change. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Campbell. Uh, Sarosh Hassan, followed then by Adam Bentley. Sarosh, go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Please go ahead. Excellent. My name is Roche Hassan, and I'm an immigrant settler who's lived on Treaty 6 for over half my life. It's where I call home. I speak in favor of the motion and strongly believe council needs to go further as this political action is strongly overdue. I grew up knowing not to call the police for help because I knew firsthand the repercussions that would come to disability and safety to myself and my loved ones if I did. In the few times that I have unfortunately had to, I know that a crisis response team or a trauma-informed health professional would have been better suited to the task. I do not want to call the police for help. They cannot serve me, nor are they capable of serving my loved ones regardless of their good intent. I know many households and people that share my sentiments, people who are usually racialized, Black people, Indigenous people, people whose voices seem to be not heard in these discussions. Ask yourselves how severely police have failed that po people would rather deal with life-threatening situations themselves than involve a cop. Fortunately, this means that resilient marginalized communities, especially Black and Indigenous ones, have adopted and maintained systems of mutual community care, wherein police are fully obsolete. Police do not serve racialized populations. Police do not keep people in this city safe. If you find yourself becoming defensive over this fact, then you are weighing your positive sheltered interactions with police over the real repeated trauma that many people have experienced solely at their hands. The reason you're hearing such starkly different accounts and perspectives of police is because people are being policed differently and thus people are perceiving the reality of policing differently. Racist policing to me is a redundant phrase, and I know firsthand how we being policed has harassed and humiliated me and undermined my right to belong in my own community. Policing means I have to explain and reaffirm over and over my reason for being, and I know that's my account. I know I don't face the same discrimination or risk the same way Black and Indigenous friends of mine do. When you over-police racialized neighborhoods, it says volumes about who you see as criminal. People are being over-policed and victimized for circumstances they do not choose to be in. Police are not and cannot be the institution that gives us our humanity. To wear the uniform and do the work that they do, regardless of the compassion of the human beings underneath, is to enact a racist system. Recognize that policing and by extension prisons do not disappear problems of homelessness, drug addiction, mental illness, or poverty. They hide away people that need help and community care. Policing gives us an excuse to not engage with the problems in the city, and thus nothing short of eventual abolition of police will be sufficient. Reforms don't work. Anti-bias and diversity training will never be enough. You can ban chokeholds and police will still use them. You can train police in de-escalation and they will still escalate. Because to police is to choke and police is to escalate. Police intimidate and bring imminent harm. And echoing Ms. Perry's comments from earlier today, you cannot train out police brutality. If you accept that there is systemic and institutional racism at play and your proposed response is to modify individual behaviors, then you do not understand the definition of systemic. 
They say if the only tool you have is a hammer, then you'll treat everything like a nail. Similarly, if the only tool council has to address gaps in social services is a cop with a gun, then they'll treat every problem like a target. Giving money to police only exacerbates problems. Police are a reactive, failed answer to root problems that need proactive, compassionate solutions. When you, when we hear you say you can't afford cuts to the EPS budget, I hear that you can afford to keep harming Black and Indigenous people in this city. Every returned attempt at reform is a loud message about y'all being comfortable with casualties, Black casualties, Indigenous casualties. Even one instance of brutality is one too many. I do not blame people worried about defunding for wanting to be safe. We all want to be safe. And the reality is that many of us are not safe explicitly because of the policing in the city. Everyone is safer when everyone is cared for through compassionate community support and programming. Council and others in this province boast about diversity efforts and social programming and yet cut them at the first opportunity they get, claiming they have no funds to give them while repeatedly giving EPS hundreds of millions of dollars. We've thus seen militarized police creating environments of fear in Black neighborhoods, especially in times of austerity, and using that to justify more police. We need to look at the conditions in the city that exist so that we can shift to making police obsolete. I'll end with a few takeaways. Those in the city desperate to keep their sense of security are not the ones who've ever been subjected to policing. They're the ones benefiting from the policing of everyone else. When we think of a world without policing, we... I apologize. I know I'm running short of time. Do your research, read and follow the action plan presented by Black Lives Matter Edmonton. The city is watching what you will do. Remember that you are accountable to them and Thank not higher you. level politicians that you claim you need to see leadership from before you can act. These people on these panels have given Thank you more you, time Lissette. and energy and pain than you frankly deserve. And if you refuse to act, it will say a great deal about how people in the city cannot rely on you. Thank you, Give Ms. Them humanity. Thank you for your time and be the leaders we elected you to be. Thank you, Ms. Hassan. Next is Mr. Bentley, followed by Ms. McIntosh. Good, good afternoon, Council and the brave participants speaking today. I am an artist and a settler on the lands we call Edmonton. I naively produced a short documentary called ICUP back in 2013 about the people who use Edmonton's transparent public bathrooms on White Avenue. The documentary may have harmed the users more than they have helped. Part of the production involved filming one police officer locking the washrooms to highlight the police's recent decision to lock the washrooms for a few hours when they're needed most. On the day of the production, what really happened was, on a busy Friday night, no less than four officers showed up to support the one officer in this brief scene. After the filming, the other officers harassed young people simply sitting around the public area on benches, and they also forgot to unlock the washrooms, keeping it unavailable for the people who needed it most all night long. I am ashamed that my film's production reinforced the Edmonton Police's continued oppression and marginalization of young peoples, Indigenous peoples, and Black peoples, and now no longer involve the police in my productions, as it seems whenever so-called policing is present, trouble seems to follow. While I'm not a member of Black Lives Matter Edmonton, I'm present today to amplify and echo their response to what policing really means in Edmonton. BLM Edmonton drafted a public policy positions that, from my understanding, were achieved by consensus within the movement. Overall, BLM Edmonton calls to abolish EPS to end its capacity to harm the community. The following are initial steps uh, intended to achieve this goal. First, dismantling and banning their military-grade arsenal of weapons, such as armored vehicles and helicopters, LRADs and tear gas, all of which they should not have even have according to the Geneva Convention, of which Canada is a signatory. Two, ending the normalization of police and their guns in public places, such as on social media, schools, in schools, parks, and on roads while conducting minor bylaw enforcement. Three, ending special protections of the police through their collective agreements. The police are not the military. They are ordinary citizens like the rest of us and must be subject to the same uh, accountabilities and responsibilities. And four, reducing EPS's role to core functions by ending all their special programs that target people of color in schools, through drug enforcement, in active recruiting, and also those programs that prevent social workers, doctors, nurses, teachers, and other public officials 
from doing uh, what they were trained to do, including mm-hmm. de-escalating, mediating, caring for, and educating the public. The problem does not does not rest simply with individual racist police officers, but with the entire concept of policing visible human bodies. When corporate billionaires get away with sucking communities dry of their local wealth from high above in hidden corporate boardrooms, but a teenager gets a lifetime criminal record when a police officer happens to see them steal a chocolate bar from a corner store, you know the, con- the entire concept of policing is a failure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next is Allison McIntosh, followed by, uh, let me just check if Alexandra Konkina has been able to join us. No? Okay, then it'll be uh, uh, Mr. Panasar after Ms. McIntosh. Allison, go ahead. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Um, my name is Allison McIntosh, my pronouns are she, her, and I'm a born and raised settler here in Treaty 6 territory in Amiskwachi, Waskahaigan, or Edmonton. I'm for this motion, but believe it must go farther in lines with the demands made by Black Lives Matter Edmonton. As a white woman, I have been learning a lot about the ways in which white women and white womanhood uphold white supremacy and are used to justify anti-Black racism. My interactions with police are relatively few and far between, but I learned through my own experience and wisdom from queer and racialized people that police do not keep us safe. I'm an activist with Climate Justice Edmonton and often marshal at protests. Marshals are trained in de-escalation tactics and nonviolent communication so the general public can feel safe and enjoy the opportunity to express their views in public. We often come into contact with counter protesters who are right-wing extremists and fascist sympathizers who threaten, harass, and physically push and shove our members. And we, they do that while police watch. Police do not keep us safe when we are exercising democratic speech. As the popular protest slogan goes, who keeps us safe? We keep us safe. Black Lives Matter Edmonton's demands show us how investing in community care with money used from defunding the Edmonton Police Service keeps everyone safe, not just people who live in neighborhoods that do not have active police presences. So often young people, especially young people with radically better visions of the future, get dismissed. We hear that our big ideas do not fit into Edmonton's tiny box of opportunity. When hashtag YAG boosters talk about Edmonton's world-class city potential, their vision is a city like Toronto or Vancouver or New York or San Francisco, where investment capital has hollowed out a capitalist hellhole with rampant gentrification, populated only with empty skyscrapers that park wealth in safe cities for capital growth. Considered safe only because they keep poor and racialized folks out with high rents, intense surveillance, and police intervention. Black Lives Matter Edmonton is showing us a better vision, one that puts the entire community first by addressing the needs of Edmontonians most vulnerable to exploitation by police, landlords, bad employers, racism, and uncaring colonial structures. We so-called Canadians love to talk about how much better we are than the United States when it comes to healthcare, racism, and police brutality, but we aren't, and thinking that holds us back. Edmonton has the third most deadly municipal police force in Canada, according to the CBC. We have all listened for the past two and a half days from people racially profiled, unlawfully detained, harassed, and traumatized by the EPS. Our violent colonial past is shared with the United States, and we live in a province that is doubling down on healthcare privatization initiatives and just passed Bill 1, a bill with racist motivations against Indigenous land defenders that chills free speech by criminalizing protest in almost any public or private space that's designated as critical by the provincial government. This could include roads, squares, and even sidewalks. Bill 1 aligns with similar bills passed across the United States that attempt to silence land defenders and environmentalists that will be violently enforced in the interests of extractive capital and repressive governments by the police, that's RCMP, provincial sheriffs, and EPS. Black Lives Matter show, Edmonton shows us how Edmonton can be a caring and compelling exception to these trends. Some councillors express concern that we cannot just dismantle EPS in a month or even a year, but the roadmap to abolition has existed for decades, paved by Black women activists and scholars like Angela Davis, Miriam Kaba, and Rakesh Walters, whose presence and testimony today is a true honour. You ignored this work because it wasn't politically palatable. Now, finally, it is. In fact, it is the only politically legitimate option. And there is a plan, you just need to implement it. Black Lives Matter Edmonton shows us that the money that goes to police could grow community instead of hollowing it out. It could create good, low-carbon, well-paying jobs that keep our community safe instead of escalating violence. 
It is a vision for a better Edmonton. By the end of the meetings next week, you will have received over 10,000 emails and heard hundreds of powerful testimonies from Black, Indigenous, and other racialized Edmontonians and their allies, all demanding that you defund EPS. If you do not act on these demands, you will have asked Edmonton's most over-policed people to spill their trauma for your entertainment, and you will have failed all of us. You cannot retain your political legitimacy if you do not act now and act decisively. I yield my time. Thank you, Ms. McIntosh. Next up is Mr. Panasar. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, uh, members of council. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I'm gonna try to uh, contribute what I feel I can in a time that there's so much for everyone to learn. Um, I have experiences from a few unique intersections. My name is Jazz Panasar, uh, and I'm here as a tech entrepreneur who works in industry regulatory safety and competency training for the, nearly 20 years, a lot of it online. I live downtown for the past 20 years at a street level condo with over 50 feet of windows at street level. Um, my reason for being here is not rooted in my own lived experiences. But there is a shared sense of this consciousness that I've experienced uh, in these stories the past few years. So I want to thank all of Council for making this accessible. I want to thank everyone who put this on YouTube, found a way to make the Google Meet happen. You're really making this accessible to people that otherwise wouldn't. And I hope that really continues. Um, prior to this, uh, you know, I have some interesting experiences. Uh, I served as a founding member of the Police Chief Indo-Canadian Liaison Committee, along with a few other Edmontonians. I've been a past board member of the Edmonton Interfaith Centre. Prior to this, I was even a member once upon a time of a student crime stalkers club with my SRO in my high school. I also grew up in a time where hip hop music and a folk dance from Northern India was banned from places in Edmonton. So I, I remember my mayor once said, privilege is opportunity hoarding. And that's really stuck with me for the last three or four years. And it's really shaped my lens, I, I would say. It's one of the ideas I've learned from. And it's taught me to learn about experiences of others, not just me. Black, indigenous and racialized people often are not aware of their rights or are afraid to exercise them out of fear of retaliation or incurring undue hardship or difficulties if they try. Some of this is institutionalized, some of it is systemic, and some of it is intergenerational from different continents. But it's real, it's in Canada, it's in Edmonton, in every neighborhood. Whereas the non-racialized experience with authority is very different non-racialized people feel that they have the right to exercise their rights without fear. If you Google racial contract, it's an entirely new area that I've been learning about the past few weeks. This ex experience in it of itself shows that institutionalized racism, not in so many branches of our society, that we're afraid to ask for help, support, or stand up for when we're being treated unjustly. You know, a, if the smallest of my interactions with any institution is not inviting, welcoming, positive, full of care, thoughtful, conscientious, uh, receiving the benefit of discretion, you can see how even serious things could be really hard to talk about. We have an obligation to practice compassion, care, and equity towards all of the citizens of Edmonton, because participating in that citizenship is our, all of our duty. No one's exempted from that. It doesn't matter whether you're elected, the law affords you something. And we all have a, a, a responsibility to demonstrate it. It's not just about the rights. And, and looking at that through a mindset of change, I've been reading this proposal and, and the motion and, you know, something I could say could be used to justify anything. And I don't want that. But being asked to change in a few days or weeks seemed crazy a, a few months ago, but did it with COVID. You know, this year I was shown that council took on a file of technology innovation and they were willing to try to find new ways. They listened un unbelievably 
and didn't have all the right answers. We didn't agree, but there was a new start line that was figured out. So could 4% of a police budget for supporting community to support the voiceless, helpless, most vulnerable neighbors that I have be worth it? I'll leave that to you guys to vote on. Are we here demonstrating how we're openly entertaining viewpoints that might not be our own? Are we here saying that there can be no understanding in someone's position because we can't, I can't understand it? When we learn about light being shed on ignorance, it becomes negligence if we don't do anything sustainably. And while our newest recruits may or may not get training and there's all this stuff going on, I'll say this, the city sure. pays Mr. for the sorry, I gotta get you to wrap up there. Oh, I apologize. Um, don't pay for data in carding and SROs that you can't back up, that you're paying for upfront. And let's maybe take the time to turn strangers into people so we can't treat them bad. Thank you for Thank your you, time. Thank you, Mr. Panasar. Um, yeah, I was quoting Eula Bliss there about privilege is opportunity hoarding. Uh, it's a great interview with her on um, Krista Tippett's podcast, if anyone wants to look it up. It's very applicable to this conversation. So next, um, uh, thanks, Jazz. Next is uh, Rakesh Walters. Welcome. The floor is yours. Have to unmute yourself. We'll start your time again. There we go. Every time. Hello, council members. Thank you for having me. My name is Ray Cash Walters. I'm a descendant of Jamaican Maroons, and like my fellow panel members, I care deeply for this place that we now call Edmonton. I recently graduated law school, and one of the things I learned in my studies was that the Charter of Rights and Freedoms was created to protect marginalized folks from being oppressed by those in the dominant group. The folks who drafted the Charter thought about how dangerous the status quo can be when it is comfortable for the majority or comfortable for those with power, yet painful and harmful for those with less power. In this moment, each of you have the opportunity and I would argue the responsibility to take action that honors the charter's original intent. Here's the thing. For some people, the police are an entity that conjure up feelings of safety and security. And folks are fearful of losing the police because although many of those same people rarely interact with police, they are attached to this idea of having someone to call when something goes wrong. You know, I believe each of you on this panel consider yourselves folks who fundamentally believe that Black and Indigenous lives matter and are worth protecting, that marginalized groups also deserve to feel safe from harm. But the problem is under the current system, when something goes wrong, some of, us, some of us don't feel comfortable calling the police because they too often put us in grave danger. Now, if you vote to maintain this current system of policing, you are telling Edmonton's most marginalized communities that we don't deserve to have anyone to call. And in fact, our lives don't matter. A few years ago, I was in distress. Someone I thought I could trust acted violently towards me. And when I called my mom to ask for help, I begged her not to call the police. Although I wanted to secure my safety, I was terrified of what could happen to the black man I cared for, or even to myself, if the police arrived. Now I'm lucky. Like an emergency crew of my own, my friends and family came to my rescue that day and brought me to a place of safety. But not everyone has access to social networks that they can mobilize as an alternative to calling the police. But all of us deserve to feel like if something goes wrong, there's someone we can call to help us out. As you've heard over the past few days and over the past few hours, some of us have no one to call. Is that public safety? Now, despite the anti-bias training and diversity hires, you can't accessorize the police out of the violence that they embody in our lives and in our histories. We are still dying. EPS officers' knees are still pressing on our necks. So rather than tinker with something so clearly ineffective, why don't we build something new together? We have what it takes right here in Edmonton. 
to reimagine public safety and develop systems that make all of us feel safe. Now, it'll take hard work and courage, but I would hope that that's exactly what each of our city councilors signed up for. Now, quickly for the how. You might be sitting here overwhelmed thinking, how are we going to create this city that you people are demanding? And the answer is you're not. Well, not on your own. Participatory budgeting and co-design approaches to municipal development is, in my opinion, the only way forward. Participatory budgeting is a model wherein those communities most affected decide how to spend public dollars. Historically marginalized communities have been finding effective, creative, free or almost free ways to keep each other safe and problem solve for a very long time. We have the tools, ideas, creativity, and initiative to cultivate a safer Edmonton, as you've heard from Demya Nur earlier today. So to be clear, I'm not talking about consultation or advisory committees. This is about giving actual community members, some of the folks you've been hearing from this week, the decision-making power to spend municipal funds. And we have examples from New York, Greensboro, California, 2,700 cities across the globe about how this can work. When we divest from policing, and when I say when, I mean when we divest from policing, those funds must be reinvested in spaces and places that center the needs of Black, Indigenous, and otherwise marginalized communities. Not only should those funds center our needs, we must be able to decide how those funds are deployed. Essentially nothing about us without us. So defund, demilitarize, dismantle the police now. Thank you, Ms. Walters, and congratulations on completing law school. Um, good for you. That's awesome. Uh, next is uh, Audrey Redden. Thank you, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Audrey Redman. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a white cis settler here on Treaty 6 territory. What I want to speak on today is not solely from my own thoughts. It's based on the work that's been done for years and decades prior to this, including but not limited to the work of Bashir Mohammed, Sandy Hudson, Ray Cash Walters, who it is a tough act to follow, and Angela Davis. I'm here to speak in support of this motion, but also to request that it go further to defund EPS completely. In my work adjacent to children's services, when we identify a problem, we work on what's called a map to help think in and through what those actual problems are and how to move forward. There are three columns to this map. The first column deals with harm. What specifically has happened that has caused this harm? And if this harm continues, what would, be, what would we be worried about in the future? We know what the harm is. We've heard from dozens of presenters over the last three days, and we'll continue to hear from speakers that tell you what harm has happened, continues to happen, and what we are all worried about if this harm continues. The fact that people, Black, Indigenous, and otherwise racialized people specifically, must continually tell you their stories of trauma to be believed is reckless and harmful, especially when these issues are, quite frankly, obvious, known, recorded, and accessible. They have been for decades. Our second column deals with what existing strengths there are in the situation and what's being done really well. When I think about policing, I get stuck at this column every time. I've heard counselors ask, even today, wondering about what the police are excelling at and what I want the role of policing to be. Instances that I can think of as they relate to community safety no matter how I approach them, are simply better solved without uniformed and armed presences. Safety comes from supporting each other, having appropriate and effective resources available and a shared value of care. There's too much history and ongoing actions from police that are brutalizing and terrorizing my friends and neighbors to think that this system has a core value of care attached to it. The last column is determining the goals and the next steps. BLMYEG has already laid out excellent areas to immediately address as well as address longer term. And I'll quote some of what's on their website as some of these goals. To reinvest EPS's $383 million budget back into grassroots infrastructure that prioritizes community safety for Black, Indigenous, and otherwise marginalized communities. To never vote to increase the EPS budget. 
and to immediately repeal the $75 million budget increase promised to EPS in 2019 and reinvest that $75 million back into affordable housing, mental health programming, making public transit free, fair, and accessible, and funding community-led organizations. I've also heard previously, today even, that there is fear around having social or community workers enter into potentially dangerous situations without police. As a person who has worked in um, human services fields and has been in these kinds of dangerous situations, I have never, ever once wished that I had a firearm on me or that police were present. In these situations when police have been present, especially when it involves children, it changes what is a distressing situation into what is a terrorized situation. People experiencing marginalization are terrified of the police, with good reason to be. And we know that when people are acting from a terror zone, they're reacting with base brain signals and not with their higher executive functioning. Having a uniformed armed personnel present does not de-escalate anything. It has the opposite effect of escalating any situation. Retraining and re-educating individuals is also not the solution here. There is no amount of individual change that will impact the system enough to properly end the systemic racism present in policing. No matter how educated or trained individual officers become, they are still going to exist under a system that was created and continues to brutalize and terrorize Black and Indigenous bodies. Budgets are reflective of the values of this city. And this moment in time offers each and every one of you an opportunity to demonstrate concretely where your values lie and to demonstrate what matters to you. What matters to me is having communities that are vibrant, that people are connected to each other and connected to appropriate and effective supports and resources, and that there will be an end to violent condemnation of involvement in the justice system just because of the color of someone's skin. So I ask to you counselors, what matters to you? I yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Redman. And finally, uh, Rahik Handu. Good afternoon. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Thank you. Go ahead. Perfect. Uh, my name is Rahik Handu. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm here to ask the City Council to immediately defund the Edmonton Police Service and commit to work towards the abolition of Edmonton Police. I don't think the present motion goes far enough. Um, I think we all recognize that the Edmonton Police was modeled after the RCMP, which was started to displace Indigenous communities to make way for white settlement. And after 150 years, the police still today are harming Indigenous and other racialized communities. So why do we still invest so much of the community's money into them? What purpose do the police really serve today? The reason I'm asking for defunding the police is two part. Uh, one is a grave harm that they do to racialized communities, spe communities, especially black and indigenous communities. And the second is that these funds would be much better utilized by investing in the community. One of the ways that the police is harming racialized communities is the SRO program. I truly personally do not understand the need to have police officers in our schools. I would be happy to hear if anyone has a valid reason we need that. Um, I think over the past few days, it's been abundantly clear that the presence of police is stressful for racialized people, especially Black and Indigenous people. So why are we subjecting Black and Indigenous children to the stress in a supposed safe place for them? Uh, one of the programs that the SROs do in schools, and this information is from an EPS presentation to the police commission, um, and it can be found on Bashir Muhammad's website, um, is the bait phone program, where police officers leave a new phone with a tracking app unattended and wait for students to take the phone and then punish them. And in this presentation, I would like to highlight that the EPS presentation, the word they used for students was not students, it was suspects. So essentially, the SROs are creating problems and then punishing students for the problems that they created. And 50% of the salaries of the SROs are also being paid by the school. So isn't this money better invested in hiring mental health professionals for students instead of criminalizing them at such a young age? Um, over the past few days, many American cities have ended their relationships uh, between schools and police. And since we love to wrongfully say that we're better than our American counterparts, I think we should have ended the SRO program yesterday. 
Um, our call to defunding the police is also not radical when the gap of the budget spent on the police compared to social programs in the city is so huge. Um, the city had a tax increase in property taxes for 2020 of zero, sorry, 2.08%. 1% of this increase went to the police and only 0.8% went to the LRT and an even lesser percentage of 0.28% went to the growth in infrastructure and services. This year, we are expected to spend $27 million on police while only spending $5 million on public libraries. Uh, but the most shocking part of the budget for me was that we are budgeting for no increase in affordable housing uh, in spending for affordable housing in 2021, but we will make an increase of 16 million for the police services. And this will also be partially be funded by a 0.9% in tax increase. So I wanna ask why is the city spending more money in punishing the community instead of providing the resources for them to live better lives? Aside from harming communities of color, what does the EPS do currently? According to the EPS itself, 30% of the calls made to them are related to mental health. Over the past few days, we've heard from countless sexual assault victims tell us stories of how they've been re-victimized by the police. The police also do not stop domestic violence, but rather just respond to it after the violence, and in most cases, it's insufficient. So clearly, the police are not equipped to deal with any of these issues, and they would better be dealt with professional uh, would be dealt better by professionals. People that do defend the police have the least interaction with them and don't live their daily lives in fear of being policed, as uh, said by lots of the panel members today, some of us do not feel safe to call the police. But the people that do defend the police, they have a perception of them keeping them safe because their neighborhoods usually have enough resources for people in them to be doing well and they aren't faced with the criminalization of poverty or health issues like mental illness and addictions. So I think it's time to stop investing more of our money trying to reform the police when it hasn't worked for so many years and invest that money back in the community. The, police, the police's initial intended purpose of serving and protecting white supremacy still stands today, and defunding and de dismantling this violent institution in, in the city is a first step to anti-racist work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hendu, and, and to all members of the panel for your thoughtful presentations. Uh, questions from members of council, starting with Councillor Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, everyone. Um, Rohit, I'm going to start with you. Um, it sounds like you were saying that politicians are creating the conditions for crime through budgeting decisions, which then give rise to uh, the perceived need for increased policing. And it sounds like you're saying that this is a predictable cycle. Um, yes, I think that's essentially what I'm saying. And I think what... Um, let me gather my thoughts here for a moment. But what I essentially mean is we should be taking this money that uh, we're using uh, to fund the police to put it back into the communities and help the communities at the initial stage of these problems uh, instead of funding the police basically and trying to react to problems that are created by criminaliz criminalization of poverty and mental issue, mental health issues and addictions, which should be treated like health issues and not criminalized. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, and some people are worried, though. They, they think, okay, so if they follow um, your submission and completely defund police immediately, what happens to violent crime? What happens to um, trafficking? What happens to all of these other issues that are, are present and real? Um, I would like to raise a counter uh, question of how have police effectively stop those issues, stop violent crimes. Uh, the police only comes and reacts after a violent crime is committed. I um, I don't know what the stats are, and if anybody on the panel can answer this better, I would um, ask them to, but I think that the police right now, it's more of a perception that the police stops these crimes from, hap from happening, whereas they don't, they really just react to it after the crime has happened. And if we spend enough money in communities and listen to what communities want, um, I think it wouldn't reach to the point of the violent crime that we need the police to stop. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, Ms. Walters, um, you gave us some examples and, and uh, um, very eloquent, but 
I'm just wondering, there's a, there's a concern here that, that um, we don't have enough information to make these moves, that we're going to need more studies because maybe there's not enough data and information and studies out there. People are worried about that. So what would what, be your response? Yeah, I think that I've tried to sort of address this concern in that it's fine that you don't have the answers because folks in community do have the answers. And I'm not sure if folks um, heard about the story that was circulating on Twitter. And it was someone who was sharing the story of the Freedom House Ambulance Service. And some of that incredible work, you know, ambulance services as they exist today didn't exist in the same way in the 1970s, just a few a few decades ago. And it was the work of Black folks in uh, more marginalized communities working with doctors who created and developed ambulance services that saved the lives of folks every single day now. And what was happening before was police were doing that work. Police were going to pick up people who were in distress, who were in medical distress, putting them in the back of a paddy wagon, driving to the hospital, and people were dying in the back of these paddy wagons because they didn't, they couldn't figure out how to solve the issue. Cities couldn't figure out how to solve those issues. But if you offer communities the resources, the time, and, and, and the space to really think through and get creative about these issues, we can find the, we can find these solutions. We actually don't want you to do it. We don't want you to do your studies anymore. We can do it. Thank you. And, and Mrs. Hassan, uh, a quick question. Um, we heard earlier this week that people are saying now is not the time. We need to give people time to relax and calm down and let cooler heads prevail um, because this is all new information and these are all brand new asks. Um, and so we're just not emotionally equipped to move forward. What would you say to that? I would say that there's been, can you hear me okay? Yep. Um, there's often in times like these, people who work to discredit feelings of anger and paint people who finally get a chance to be heard, who've been speaking this whole time, um, as irrational, as unjustified in their anger, um, but we simply see that that's not the case. This work has been going on for far too long. Literally just a handful of years ago, um, Black Lives Matter Edmonton came to council um, asking them to stop harmful practices like carding, and that didn't happen then, and here we are again. And I really hope we're not in the same situation a couple of years from now. So what I say to people that say, we're moving too fast, these are drastic changes, we don't call um, cuts to social services and programming drastic changes for some reason. We cut them all the time. And yet, um, police gets uh, assured increases year after year um, because of the underlying assumptions that we have about the work that they do. So I think we need to listen more closely to the voices that have been speaking forever and understand that these are not new problems. Many people have highlighted the problems that exist in policing that are foundational to the practice since the beginning of this place that we call Canada. Thank you for your question. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, am I out of time? I'm afraid so. Thank you, Councillor Knack, followed by Councillor Henderson and Councillor Banga. So far, Councillor Knack, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you to everyone uh, again for for just uh, for all of the submissions. Uh, Ms. Ms. Walters, I know you touched on uh, participatory budgeting a bit, and I, I've done some research on it, and I know there's more available. I think it's even been shared um by you recently and i haven't read through the most recent piece uh, but i'm curious if, if you can provide are, are there some really good examples some best practices of, of what you've uh, researched to date i'm just and if not that's fine I, I i will do research as well on it um yeah for sure i think um we've seen we saw that in uh, 1989 uh in allegro brazil they explicitly created a participatory budgeting programming. This is kind of where these ideas come from. And um, this 
social justice project resulted in the expansion of sewer and water connections, spending on schools and healthcare, and it spread to hundreds of cities across Latin America. And, and multiple studies have found that those social improvements brought about a national reduc reduction in Brazil's infant mortality rates. It had incredible positive effects on community in ways that folks weren't even necessarily um, anticipating. And we're also seeing that um, in cities like um, Greensboro, California, community members, they decided to spend $500,000 of the city budget on pools and recreation upgrades. Um, and in 2015 alone, New York City residents directed spending for over 30 million US dollars. And now we're seeing in cities like LA, um, people's budgets. So folks who are organizing with Black Lives Matter, other community organizations are putting together budgets that they would like to see the city implement. Um, and some of these budgets have policing down to 6%, um, but they have uh, community housing up and, uh, and investing in uh, mental health care up to 35 to 45%. So um, there's a lot of different ideas and, and inspiring directions for us to move in when we think about participatory, participatory budgeting. Thank you. And, and just to make sure I, I understand it. So if, if I've understood correctly from what I've read in the past, the way it works is, again, a certain amount of money is allocated. It is sort of entrusted to a group who is then required to go out and, and engage the community. So instead of, again, a, a, a city or a, a government led process, it's led, like you talked about in your presentation, by the community through various community groups. And ultimately, they're the ones that, that vote on different proposals and, and ideas that are presented before them. Is that is that my a fair understanding of it? Yeah, that's that's how that's how it has been done in the past. Um, we know that these funding amounts can also represent up to 100% of all new capital spending projects um, for the city. And it can in the past has uh, been up to 15% of the total municipal budget. Thank you. Uh, I believe I also had a question for uh, Mr. Panasar. Uh, and, and again, thank you for, for your what you provided to us. And you touched on that, that throughout your life you've been involved. Uh, I think you mentioned you were a founding member with the police chief for the Indo-Canadian organization. Is that correct? Did I, did I hear you correctly on that? Uh, the chief of police at the time, uh, Chief Lindsay and DeCosta, had set up liaison committees with uh, communities, uh, uh, various community groups. So it was a EPS initiative uh, and I, I was asked to uh, join and sit on that by, by a friend. So uh, I guess I'm curious because, because I mean you also talked about your experience uh, when, when you were uh, in school with working with the SRO. Um, understandably we've heard a lot of concerns about different programs including the SRO one which I know there'll be questions. I wanted to just find out what what your if you feel like you can share the experiences that you had, maybe particularly from the one organization, but how that went. Were did it actually produce results that you thought it was going to when you got involved? And if not, what what do you feel is maybe missing? Um, my mentors, one of which was the founding principal of Center High Downtown, forced me to join nearly every club in the school to technologize it. So. Uh, I ended up on the yearbook club and the student crime stoppers was actually to help them in some way. Um, I have a hard time. I, you know, I didn't get to finish what I was saying. I was speaking slowly. Um, I do have some really scary experiences. Uh, a photo of me was stolen from the yearbook room, put on a neo-Nazi flyer and distributed in my community, in my school. My SRO couldn't do much, but this is my story. And I don't want to speak over a much more relevant uh, experience of black and indigenous people. Um, do I think SROs, uh, the program could work? I don't know. I, I can tell you when I was there. Um, I have a hard time understanding how it would help when someone who's walking around with a gun in a space that's supposed to be safe uh, could help. Um, specifically, I'm a data-driven individual. Um, if the data doesn't exist, um, if the data is not shaped on top of that, we need to be able to openly understand what benefit is this supposed to provide before we fund it? And how do we measure it? How do we consciously understand that? Um, and same goes for carding. I see it downtown. I want to see the data. I want to see it open data. I want to learn how to navigate it. And I want to become literate in that. I don't want someone interpreting it for me. I appreciate that. Thank you. I, I believe I'm out of time. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Um, 
Really illuminating questions, though. Um, thank you for that. Next up is Councillor Henderson, uh, then Councillor Banga. Um, yeah, a question uh, for Ms. Walters, because I, too, am deeply intrigued and have been in a while on the idea of the participatory budgeting. Because um, I know, and it goes back, I think, actually, there was some work to, that we looked at oh, even a decade ago that came out of Seattle that had done some really effective things with those communities. My, my question, though, is, which I'm interested in, and I hope it's an unfounded fear, but I'm wondering if you have any answer to it, because I'm hoping I'm worrying totally unnecessarily around this, is that it already seems to me that part of the problem that we have here is we have, I'm going to say two cities, I think it's more complex than that, but we have, we have, we have two different parts of our community that clearly are having different expectations of the police, different relationships with the police, um, different feelings about what they're there to do or what they want them to do. So my, my worry, my, it's not a worry, I suppose, but empowering, empowering communities, which we've heard a whole bunch, which I think makes absolute sense to say, this is how we want to deal with it in our own community. I can imagine communities in this city whose response would be to put up the gates. And, you know, which is something that so far we've avoided here. Um, and I'm just wondering, just, it's just a question of how, if we go down that road, how we don't actually further the divide um, and maybe it's an, uh, it may be a completely unfounded fear, but I'm just wondering if you have any, if there's any evidence of that happening in any of the circumstances you've looked at. Um, I haven't seen that, no, in any of my research. And I think my question would be, if you're putting up the gates, who are you protecting yourself from? Because well, it's here to actually offer um, support and funding for communities who were coming up with solutions to keep themselves safe. Um, I'm not really sure what there would be to be afraid of, but I do think that it's fair and fine to have conversations about, okay, what, for folks who think that the current system is working, what is it that you think is working? What is it that you would like to hold on to? And, and that's something that we can make sure is integrated in uh, this new transformative system of justice that I think we really need to get working on yesterday. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. I just, I'm just, I, I just know, I'm, I'm imagining that conversation as we go forward. And I think a lot of what they, a lot of it's, people tend to fear what they don't know or don't understand. Um, and I think that's a huge part of it. Um, so I, my, my worry is that we accidentally create a situation where people understand less and fear more. Um, and that actually we dig. I think that's been the American story where they've dug, dug, dug themselves in some ways a bigger hole. So, um, I, I, great, thanks. That's really helpful. Um, and uh, and I, you know, I, I, we keep on hearing um, that we need to empower communities to say this is what we need to do for ourselves. And I completely buy that. I just trying. I'm just trying to think through what the best ways of doing that are. So thank you. Those are my questions, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Councillor Henderson, Councillor Banga. Thank you. Uh, thanks to the entire, uh, entire panel for uh, coming out today and uh, expressing their thoughts. Uh, I know I wanted to ask questions probably from each and, each and every one of you, but uh, only five minutes. I'm going to go to Mr. Penister first. Uh, Mr. Penister, I do understand that uh, you are saying that... Uh, the SRO program is uh, not, should be defunded. But I want to hear from you, and you also mentioned data-driven. When you're saying data-driven, first of all, what data do you want uh, to see? Who that should be presented to? Is it the police commission? Is it a community, community organization? Is it should it be on the website for each and everyone to view? Comments, please. I, I think, thank you, uh, Councillor Benga. Um, I, I think it's really important to become literate in understanding how decisions are made. And if we don't, we're excluded from how those decisions are made. Um, to that extent, um, what Ms. Walters is speaking about, for me, resonates very deeply. Um, creating change that people can participate in from the beginning is very critical. And the way to do that is by not uh, exposing the data, but letting the data be its own light. Um, if we can't see what the SRO does in the words of students, for example, I'm not sure if I have all the perspectives. 
perhaps if this great YouTube stream was also sent to the Facebooks and the Twitters and the Instagrams, we, we might, there might have been more perspectives. And I, I encourage this to be a starting line for this dialogue to continue to collect that information. Um, however, from data, yeah, defining what data is important. Uh, I think it's really important not to study this too much. I think it's important not to try to understand it before we begin, because the journey uh, of experiencing the data and, and having our eyes open collectively as a society to see each other uh, with our hearts as much as the data, uh, because data can be spun, and that's scary, right? Because it, we can fight over interpretations of data and justify anything we want. People do not fight over politics or religion. They fight over interpretations, personal interpretations. And we need to make sure that our bureaucracies and our institutions do not fund de this function. I'm generally in favor, I don't think anyone would disagree, that we should not fund this function. We should defund this function. Thank so you. I hope that answers, yeah. Yeah, it does. Uh, thank you. And one more question for you. Uh, Proactive social programming. It is, uh, uh, you know, it's not social engineering. Engineering is not typical engineering where you see a dam being built and, you know, in so much time, so much water is being uh, coming out of that. How do you measure all the, that stuff? I know we all saying that you, there should be measurement. How do you measure actually the proactive part of, uh, of the, I guess, uh, efforts? I'm just going to try to sum up this in a, a simple way. I think people's experiences of each other is at the heart of a lot of problems. Um, and, and it's easy to mistreat someone who's a stranger. We can mock them. We can direct ignorance towards them. It doesn't matter who's in a position of power, who's not. And, and as soon as we can dehumanize a stranger, um, it, it leads to a lot of problems. So in terms of social engineering, creating opportunities for people to have interaction. So multiculturalism is very different than interculturalism, where, where I participate and learn about the differences between my, my, my Malawian family and my Eurasian family and my Jamaican family. And I know the difference and I appreciate them and I learn and I'm a part of those families. When we break this, this barrier that's put in front of us of no one on this world is like me. We, we have to forget that. We have to understand this with our hearts. So one of the things that I've been involved with uh, from a young age in university was we, we created a, a student group uh, to create positive experiences interactions. So if they could have positive experiences with each other, they could not as easily resort to disputes amongst each other. And once that was set up as a safe spot, uh, we, we invited DPS who had even arrested some of those students. Yeah, we didn't know how Thank it was you. going to play out. Thank yeah. you. Mr. Mayor, is my time up or I um, still have some I'm afraid, seconds left? I'm afraid it is. Thank just, you. Just. Um, Councillor McKean. Thank you. Um, Ms. Hassan, I wanted to talk to you if I could. Um, I think I speak for more than just myself in saying these presentations have been um, a bit mind-blowing and uncomfortable for those of us who are used to institutions and, and, and the way they play out. So I want to thank all of you for, for that. So one of the questions I have, because I know that I'll get this from the establishment community when we talk about um, drastically altering, defunding, dismantling, whatever words we use, the police, what do we do with uh, criminal motorcycle gangs or, um, or hate groups or um, homicides, um, major frauds? Do you still see that we would have a branch of investigators that would still be doing that kind of work? Or what do you, how do you see that? Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thank you for your question. Um, I'll try to answer from my um, capacity, uh, from um, the limited, unfortunately, just because of uh, my life experiences so far. And um, hopefully I'll get more opportunities to explore this because this is actually something I'm incredibly interested in. The um, 
the so-called hate groups um, that exist in Canada, North America, and around the world. I call them so-called because um, we use this word hate, which is really interesting um, to describe them, rather than looking at the way that they are um, basically, um, which I mean, I hope that people don't have to be keep, uh, don't have to be re-educated over and over about this, but um, they're essentially white supremacists and otherwise like fascist organizations that have this idea of what Canada needs to be and what everyone's role in society is. And I don't, I think calling them hate groups just for a starter, right? As a starting point is incredibly misleading. So when we talk about addressing the problem of hate groups of other um incredibly bigoted organizations and people in our society we have to start by looking at how we understand them um how they understand themselves and what they continuously ask for which is you know we hear these sentiments all the time a bit of dog whistling in in um how they refer to the other and how they want to uphold law and order i think um I might be rambling, I don't mean to take up all of your time, but when it comes to addressing these groups, I think that's absolutely possible. I think it starts by not only acknowledging the incredibly racist history of these groups um, in our provinces that are ongoing, but also um, like changing the way we see who a terrorist is. Um, I don't know any terrorists in my community, but I think white supremacists are absolutely terrorizing people in our country. Um, and that's something that we should all care about. And yeah. so the way that we interact with them needs to change. And I think that's possible outside of police services. Well, um, I've seen the argument that uh, many of the members of these uh, groups, uh, white supremacist groups are marginalized and can be brought in from the cold as well. Uh, and, and there's some good examples written about that. Uh, Ms. Walters, did you want to comment on what we would do with people? I think uh, Chief McPhee calls them the people that we should be afraid of, the crime gangs, the people who, who do. Uh, well, it's rare, but they, there are murders in our city. And, and what we would do if we radically uh, defunded the police, uh, how would we deal with those, as, as well as the white collar fraud crime, that sort of thing? What would we do? What, what would be your ideas around that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely a complicated question. I think one of the things that we have to, to do is not take any of these words for granted. For example, we say the word gang. Um, I, re uh, maybe last year, wrote an article with a friend of mine who's incarcerated, and it's called Justice for Racialized Prisoners, and I can send you folks the link if you're interested. And we really unpacked this word gang. What does it mean to be a gang member? What is it that you actually need? What is, what is going on there? And I think that in, in, before we rush to, okay, like, what are the tactical, who are we going to give guns to? What are we going to do with all these guns? We should really think about, okay, what are the dynamics of these challenges that we're facing? How do we unpack them and, and, and comb through what their daily lives look like and then figure out how we address those things? And if at the end of the day, we need like some sort of small tactical unit that goes out and has a lot of education and a lot of patience, a lot of de-escalation training and it has a great relationship with their family and is respectful to their children and their wife, right? Those are the types of people that I would like to see doing this work moving forward. And, and if it looks like them having guns, then it looks like them having guns, but that's not where I go to first. And yeah. I also would just like to say that I, I think that we've been asking this question as the first question. And, and I think it was even the last panel that someone suggested, maybe that shouldn't be the first question. Um, the first question, in my opinion, is how do I make my interpersonal relationships more safe? What is my responsibility to the people that I need to look out for? And, and, and how can I take that on for myself? I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Jazz, I don't have a question for you, but it's good to see you, man. You Thank too. you. Uh, any other questions from members of council for this panel? Councillor Paquette, could you take the chair? I have the chair. Okay. 
Um, so first, uh, um, Ms. Walters, um, the, the principle of nothing about us without us is partly why we're here. Uh, it's in large part why we're here uh, to listen, but, but I, I hear that um, going forward is, is as much or more important than what we're hearing here in terms of any resources made available or reallocated from, from uh, anywhere else, you would like uh, community leadership in determining where it goes according to the principles of uh, participatory budgeting. Just at a, at a high level, would you, um, would you propose that that be allocated to specific communities or that a group of diverse communities um, come together to allocate it among diverse communities? Um, and, and what would be the right mechanism or, or institution? Would we work through the Africa Centers and the other organizations that exist or are there other coalitions or networks that you would propose would be the right partners to engage in making sure resources went to the kind of prevention and community empowerment that I think many people are advocating for here. Yeah, I think the, the although that, you know, we, we are concerned about data, this is where data can really come in. Because participatory budgeting at the heart of it is we, we look to the folks who are most affected, most negatively affected by the policies that we know are hurting us, and then we center them in the discussion. So I'm not necessarily pointing to one organization or the other organization, but I am saying, okay, how can we identify the folks in community that are most negatively affected by policing? And in order to do that, we would need data, and we're missing a lot of that data, okay? So, so first we have to figure that out. And then we have to center all of those voices in conversations about how to move forward. Because, you know, we're not a monolith. And we have challenges within our own communities. And so if we just kind of just haphazardly pull to this community leader or that community leader, we can really, there's, there can be some holes that are exposed. So I don't think that I can necessarily answer that question and say these 10 people, but I can say that I can come up with 10 people that I think are great and that I think are well-connected. And I'm sure other folks on this panel um, can also point to those people, and then and then we can kind of go from there. Uh, do you do you think it's possible? Because because I need to know what implementation, what the what the pathways would be to be able to make a credible case to the public about a change in approach. Because I'm in principle 100% supportive of the idea of participatory budgeting, uh, but you have to delegate a mandate and you have to delegate it and have accountabilities and all these other public policy things that that that. No one wants to talk about, but that I have to worry about as a leader. Um, so, so, so very specifically, do you think an institution that already exists, like Reach, that has a community services mandate or something like it, could engage the right people to do that meaningfully uh, and leverage the dollars that are already there and more that might be provided, or is it a brand new institution uh, or organization or network that needs to be created? Because it would be faster if I can repurpose something, so I'm looking for practical advice on implementation to be able to move quickly, which is a very, because we're being faced with a lot of urgent demand, and so I want advice about practical implementation. Please. Sure, sure, yeah. I think that there are definitely trusted institutions. Um, organizations like the Africa Center, organizations like Black Lives Matter, um, organizations like Black Arts Matter, um, a number of these organizations have roots in community and, and, and have trust from folks in community. And we did, so a group of us wrote a letter that I think you folks received about 11,000 versions of. And in that letter, we identified a number of organizations that just within the few of us who put the letter together were aware of and that knew um, were respected and, 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 and had cut. I guess, credibility within community. So, I mean, perhaps you could start there. I'm not, I think you have the 11,000 uh, emails in your, in your inbox, so I think you can grab one of them and check out that list and uh, definitely go from there. Um, I would just say, too, that in order for uh, this work to be, you know, seen as valuable and, and to provide folks the opportunity to, to really 
uh, invest time and effort into this work, those people need to be paid. Uh, we can't keep asking community to expose themselves and lay themselves bare and, and, and offer all of their education that they're in debt for um, free, of, free of charge. So we have to make sure that we invest that, that money into them as well. I hear you. I hear you. No, thank you. That's, uh, that's very helpful and practical. I have many more questions for others, but I, I'm, uh, my five minutes is up. Um, uh, but uh, grateful to uh, each of the panelists f uh, for your presentations. I will uh, take the chair back. I return um, the chair. Thank you. And just check one more time, see if there are any other questions from others. Not seeing any, then uh, again with gratitude for your uh, uh, time and wisdom, we'll recess here uh, and reconvene at 3.45 for uh, panel number three. Thank you, everyone.
We'll uh, roll call in right away here. Okay, welcome back to panel number seven. Um, I'll uh, orient uh, our guests to the panel shortly, but first uh, roll call members of council, just to make sure we've got everyone on the call here. Councillor Katarina. I'm here, Mr. Mayor. Welcome, Councillor Zadig. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I am here. <laughs> Accompanied as, uh, that's great. Thank Correct. you, Councillor Zadig. Councillor Essinger. Present. Thank you, Councillor Hamilton. Present. Great, thank you, Councillor Henderson. Very tempted to squeal as well. That was wonderful, John. Thanks. <laughs> Councillor Knack. I'm here. Good afternoon. Welcome. Councillor McKean. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, and I'm about to leave for the REACH board meeting. Right. Uh, you'll stay for as, as much of the panel as you can, but you do have uh, other business by virtue of your appointment, and I think the cross-pollination of, of that that work and this discussion is is probably an important link for you to make so with our with our blessing uh understanding you'll pop off the call for some related council business um, so that's what i was thinking too mr mayor so thank you appreciate that yeah you bet councillor nickel present great thank you councillor paquette <laughs> councillor paquette Okay, Councillor Walters. I'm here. Super. Uh, Councillor Banga. Yeah. Great, welcome. And Councillor Carmel. I'm here, thank you. Great, and one more check, Councillor Paquette. Okay, well hopefully he's able to, hopefully he's able to join us. Sorry, I'm just trying to get in the right, I was in the wrong hangout from earlier, or meeting. I don't know, still don't know the difference between a meet and a hang, but here we are. Um, Councillor Paquette? Okay, hopefully he's able to join us, but uh, everyone else is accounted for for now. So I would like to, for the benefit of our guests, I explain uh, the hearing process for panel number seven on the motion uh, that was referred regarding the Edmonton Police Commission. Uh, speakers have been paneled into groups and will present to council in the order in which you've registered. Each of you will be given five minutes to speak. The clerk will run a timer in our room here, but you may also wish to have your own timer to pace yourself accordingly. Once you've finished, please uh, mute your microphone, but do stay on the line as councillors may wish to ask you questions. After all speakers within the panel have made their presentation, um, each councillor will be given five minutes to ask one round of questions if they wish. I uh, see you there, Councillor Paquette, welcome back. After uh, each uh, panel, a short recess will be called to allow us to set up for the next panel of presenters, which at this point will be uh, next Monday afternoon is where panel number eight will convene. Um, uh, so if you wish to uh, continue to listen to these hearings um, after your participation in this panel today, you may do so, um, as always, at edmonton.ca slash meetings. This uh, process, being virtual, does require some patience from everyone to ensure that anyone who does wish to address council has the opportunity to do yes. so. Yes. No. Okay. Yeah, just make sure it's unmuted on your end. Yes. Okay. Because... okay. It is because unmuted. Will, if, you, if you could all mute yeah. yourselves just while I'm finishing the orientation. I'll unmute you, okay? Okay, so I have unmuted. Thank you. Thank unmute? Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. If you could mute again. Just while we're doing roll call here. So please refrain from using the chat function during the meetings as it can create issues, uh, can create issues of fairness or decorum. Uh, if uh, speakers are being interrupted by chats coming through. Uh, and it does provide unfair advantage uh, potentially um, and, and it can interfere technically with the live stream. So additionally, please remember to mute your microphone when you're not presenting or answering questions. 
If you're experiencing any difficulties, of course, the Office of the City Clerk has additional resources laid on to facilitate your participation in the meeting. Please reach out to them using the contact information provided in your registration uh, reply email if you need any help. A speakers list for each panel will be provided on edmonton.ca slash meetings for your reference. So, uh, members, the 11 members of uh, panel number seven are, and uh, just uh, unmute yourself when I call your name so we can uh, make sure we can hear you clearly. And also make note of the order so you know who's immediately before you so you can be ready to go. So first is, uh, and I apologize in advance if I mispronounce any of your names, please feel free to correct me. I'll do my best. Uh, Ferris Sopani. Hi. Welcome. Uh, Brendan McGrath. Hi, thank you. Welcome. Uh, Laura Collison. Hello. Welcome. Uh, Paul LeMay. Is Paul there? Are you able to unmute yourself? Uh, seven is Verenda Gupta. Yes, here. Great, thank you. Eight is Judith Beam. Is Judith there? Can you unmute yourself? We're not able to hear you, Judith. Uh, there we go. Can, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Great, thanks. Rob Jackson. Hello. Welcome. Beth Capper. Here. Great. And uh, Batol Karkash. Yes, hello. Welcome. And Carrie. I'm here. Welcome. And Brody Stenhouse. Hello, everyone. Welcome. All right. Uh, well, uh, greetings to all 11 of you. Uh, we appreciate you making the time. Uh, you will each have five minutes, as I indicated. So we'll start with um, Mr. Sobhani. Go ahead. All right. Am I, am I live? Yes, you are. The floor is yours. Fantastic. All right. Um, so I just want to start out by uh, adding my voice to the growing chorus of those calling for the abolition of policing in our city. Uh, I want to be clear, this is not a call for austerity. This is a call to redirect funds to focus on what actually works to reduce harm and increase the safety of our city. We all know that policing is likely the worst way to reduce crime uh, and improve safety. Police do a great deal of violence to all sorts of people, but especially marginalized peoples. Once a crime it is, is committed, it is then too late to stop that crime in the first place, and calling police does absolutely nothing to prevent that crime from taking place in the first place. We need to focus on creating the conditions to create communities and cities that are safe and healthy with thriving solidarity um, that works to uh, improve a general sense of belonging. Throwing money at police officers does not do this. In fact, in many areas, it actually exacerbates problems. We create vicious cycles when we underfund social programs that have been proven to work to reduce crime and give it to the police, because then we do see increases in crime, and along with it, further the calls to increase police budgets. We've been trapped in this vicious cycle for many, many years, and it's time to put a stop to it. Poverty is a real, real contributor to crime. Uh, it's a it's a problem that's created by policy, one that we can solve by reallocating resources uh, and changing the way we understand the role of governments uh, in relation to the economy and, uh, uh, and to the, the very uh, problem of poverty. Um, so I want to focus on some uh, areas that I think that if we put resources towards, we can see substantial decreases in crime. Um, I, a lot of people I've been listening for the past few days have done a great deal outlining the, the problems with policing, uh, and I, I'm not going to spend much time talking about that, but here are some areas that uh, we could reallocate funds towards. Uh, if, we, if we had a city where we had... Hello? Yep, yeah, okay. Uh, if we had a city where we had full, free access to an expanded 
uh, fully funded public transportation system, if we had full free access to publicly funded housing that was available to anyone uh, on uh, by income level or free, uh, full expanded free access to recreation facilities and programs for uh, youths and, and adults as well, uh, full access to childcare, full access to K to PSE education with no barriers uh, to cost full access to healthcare and expanding those services that we ha have in the public sector to vision, dental, long-term care, full mental health coverage and counseling services, uh, harm reduction, uh, addiction, detox, and rehabilitation services. If we had a society where all of those things were available to every single person in our city, the crime would dramatically be reduced. Putting money towards policing is not going to reduce crime. Another area is Crime itself is a social construct. Um, and one area that we have criminalized that we need to stop is drug use. The criminalization of drug use has caused countless, countless problems. Uh, one one uh, solution that has come forward was a recent program that existed that just had its funding cut. It was funded through the province called IOT. Um, this is a program that uh, took in uh, people who are looking for uh, um, uh, harm reduction services and what it did was actually distributed the controlled substances um, in a controlled manner with access to counseling and full uh, wraparound services. This uh, creating a system where the public sector actually removes drugs from the black market uh, and creates a, a controlled distribution stream for them would dramatically reduce uh, crime in two ways. One, it would change the way the drug prohibition impacts individuals who experience addictions. Um, who, who may then commit crime. The other thing it would do, would it would completely remove the incredibly lucrative market from the black market, um, which you know I heard in the previous panel, someone talking about criminal gangs and criminal activity. Well, if you didn't have these multi-billion dollar industries in the hands um, of the black market, that would dramatically change our understanding of, uh, of criminality. Um, so, those are, so those are some of the suggestions I want to put forth. Um, and... Uh, uh, so, so specifically, if the city were to fund something like IOT, and also then in conjunction with that, give a directive to the Edmonton Police Services to deprioritize um, the uh, the uh, enforcement of drug offenses, um, that would dramatically change people's lives. Um, so, yeah, so that's that's my my take. Uh, I would like to see um, funds dramatically redirected from the police towards public services um, and uh, and change the way that we understand drug use and its criminalization. That's uh, the end of my time. Thank you so much. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Sobani. Next is Mr. McGrath. Are, are we muted in here? Mr. Mayor, are you there? I think I'm, I'm muted here. I think Chambers is muted. I think Chambers, I think Chambers is muted. Chambers is muted. Oh, oh. All right. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Super. Um, next then is Mr. McGrath. Hi. Thank you. Um, thanks, Mayor. Thanks, City Council. Uh, thanks for running this public forum, first of all. And um, thanks for letting me, uh, you know, not physically get in front of you to speak, um, but um, to virtually get in front of you to speak in favor of the motion um, that's being put up at this forum. And thanks to all the other presenters from the public who have been voicing um, their views on a really serious problem that's uh, affecting the city um, and kind of the country at large. Um, uh, oh, just want to confirm, you can all hear me? Yes, we can. Carry on, sir. Oh, thank you. Um, we're, uh, I just wanted to address those speakers. Um, we've had a few speakers. Uh, I, I signed up after listening to the um, uh, forum on Monday. I wanted to address those speakers who feel that defunding the police would lead to more crime. Um, I hope to make the point that while the police force can be necessary in specific cases, um, ultimately people who defend the police overstate their effectiveness in curbing crime. For a, for a municipal system to be effective in preventing crime, a city would have to invest more heavily in mental health resources. 
the city would have to invest more heavily in people who are trained in de-escalation and people who are trained in dealing with issues surrounding domestic abuse. In other words, that's, that is to say that police are not a preventative institution. They are an institution that exists to deter or discourage people from committing crime um, out of fear of the punitive measures that uh, the punitive actions that would be taken against those who have already committed crime, which is to say that a police force isn't so concerned about the why crime happens. A police force is only concerned about what crime is happening so that punitive measures can be taken after the crime happens. Um, police uphold laws by arresting and detaining those who break them. Um, the police force on whole is poor at de-escalating. It's poor at showing respect and dignity to BIPOC people. The whole idea of the police is that they are a weaponized, punishing force that has been evolving for the past 150 years. The natural conclusion of which is intense militarization, which we're seeing with police helicopters and, uh, and uh, increased surveillance. The very core notion of the police is that you will avoid committing a crime because you fear being jailed, or if you're a person of color, beaten, or worse, killed by the police, which is an issue in itself, but there are further issues here that keep the system from being effective and keep perpetuating this cycle. One, it only works if we're afraid of police. In theory, police only deter crime if we fear punitive measures, and they only deter crime indiscriminately if we all fear those punitive measures equally, but we don't. BIPOC people fear being targeted by officers, they fear being jailed, they fear being hurt and killed by police far more than white people do. Number two, and I know this one from experience, individual police officers don't always know themselves if something is or isn't legal. Often police themselves don't know the rules they're trying to enforce, which is to give the benefit of the doubt that they're not deliberately relying on civilians not to know the rules. Not to mention the arduous and useless police complaint system when something does happen and a, and a civilian is a problem. And number three, punitive measures against crime committed happen disproportionately against people of color, whether those are legally sanctioned methods like incarceration or supposedly illegal like excessive police violence. And I say supposedly illegal because cops police and investigate themselves, and all too often nothing comes of those investigations. Really, ultimately, the idea of police is to deter crime through fear of retribution, but people of color can receive intense violent retribution for almost nothing based on the discretion of individual officers. So what would a preventative measure be? I don't want to go too long into this because I think other speakers have better laid out alternatives to policing um, and uh, certainly alternative sources of funding are, or alternative routes to, uh, um, alternative organizations to fund are on the Black Lives Matter website. Um, cops do things we could ask other organizations to, to do. They, they have to respond to somebody dealing with mental illness downtown. They have to respond to domestic violence and they shouldn't be doing that. Often police and proponents of police say that mental health and social workers would take on too much risk by responding to calls like this, but of course police would think that because they belong to an institution that specializes in escalating situations, not de-escalating them. We call to divest from that institution and to invest in organizations and people trained in de-escalation. Currently cops are our mental health workers and they shouldn't be. The police force might work if each and every cop was perfect, but it's a system that makes it impossible for even one good cop to exist because at its base, it's a punitive system. I urge the council to take stock of the people who've spoken here the past few days. I urge you to hear the voices of people of color who've spoken, and I urge you to be critical of those white speakers who have spoken in favor of the police. The fact is that for white people like me, generally the police work. They still don't work great, but they work. But if you're a person of color, the police aren't working for you. The argument against is if we defund the police, we won't be able to prevent crime. But implicit in that argument is the notion that police as they exist currently are already effective in preventing crime, which is not correct. They are, in very specific cases, only good at deterring crime through the threat of imposed violence. And lastly, for those who think the public is being too emotional, for those who think we need to sit and wait and think about this, I'm sorry, genuinely, I'm sorry that this is new information for you. But for Indigenous and Black communities, it's old news. These issues have been thought of by people of color for years. The thinking is done and the solutions have been laid out. These communities have been grappling with police violence for the past 150 years and we need to do something else urgently. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, um, Mr. McGrath. Next is Ms. Collison. Hello, oh, thank you. Um, my name is Laura Collison. I'm a white, queer, cis, neurodivergent woman. 
I use she, her pronouns, and I'm a settler here on Treaty 6 territory, and to this day unfairly benefit from the fact that the Northwest Mounted Police was created to displace Indigenous people from their land so white people like my family could settle there. And like Angela Davis, I identify as an abolition feminist. This means I work to build a world without police and without prisons. That word is new to a lot of people, but the struggle goes back to the movement for the abolition of slavery. This is not a confused emotional moment. What is happening right now is the result of hundreds of years of struggle. And I've spent over a decade learning and teaching about abolition. And again and again, when I give talks and facilitate workshops, I see people shift as they come to understand what police and prisons actually do in our society and how much that differs from the ideas we are taught. Um, I, also, I began volunteering with women in prison in 2009. Um, and as I got to know them again and again, I saw how prison wasn't solving any problems and it just made things worse. Women in prison don't need to be locked up. They needed support. Over 85% of them report having experienced abuse. And in fact, the majority of women in Canada serving life sentences right now killed an abusive partner or parent. And the murder rate in Canada dropped when divorce became easier to get and women had a way to leave. And some women have talked to me about how prison is the first safe and secure home they've ever had. That is horrifying and absurd. And I have seen how support, care, and resources can change women's lives. Abolition is a creative project. It is building up more than it is tearing down. It means offering support before things go wrong rather than punishment after harm. The point of abolition is building a supportive society where police and prisons are obsolete. It is a shift in the way we acknowledge and think about safety because we know right now our safest communities do not have the most police, they have the most resources. And Black Lives Matter has presented you with clear information on what you could start doing immediately to work towards abolition in Edmonton. The most common questions I get are what do we do with murders and rapists? First, we already know the police don't help much in this area. You can have a whole inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and a year later the police still are not doing what they need to. We know that very few rapists ever go to jail. We know that child abusers are usually close to their victim and they use the threat of police and jail to keep children silent. If we deal with abuse, we will prevent murder. Mass shootings are often connected to men who are abusive to their partners, including the recent killings in Nova Scotia. Alberta consistently has one of the highest rates of domestic violence, or domestic homicide, and domestic homicide suicide in this country. And one of the reasons people don't report abuse is they don't want the person to go to jail, and that's the only option police offer. What if we supported people to change? What if we helped them deal with their trauma? What if we help people leave? And as for dealing with sexual assault, we also know that few people report. And partly that is because they don't trust the police and partly is because they want justice, but again, they don't necessarily want that person to go to jail. And there are processes to help people address sexual assault and relationship violence based on community accountability models and transformative justice. I've been involved in these and they are difficult and they take a lot of resources, but the support they offer creates not only healing for the person who's been harmed, it actually changes the behavior of the person doing the harm and it changes the community conditions that allow that harm to occur. And I've submitted examples of this, um, to, of these processes with the city clerk. Um, one of the barriers to these processes is that if someone admits that they've assaulted someone else, they risk going to jail, even if the other person doesn't want them to. Police present a risk and a danger to healing. We know police do not keep communities safe. And this is also true in schools especially for Black, Indigenous, and kids of color, as well as queer and trans kids, the police are a danger and a risk. It is dangerous for kids to have cops in school. They risk going to jail rather than detention. And making communities work with police is not the answer. Communities know what they need. Rather than wasting their time, energy, and money asking people to teach police officers how to act, give communities resources to address the problems they see in ways that work for them. I became an abolitionist while trying to work with the police to address alcohol facilitated sexual assault in the city. And the campaign we created was groundbreaking and to this day it is used around the world, but that process was incredibly draining on community organizations, on unpaid community members, and it was a waste of time because it just drained so much from us. And I hear that from folks who try to work with the police again and again and again. If we had just been giving the resources to create that campaign without the police, we could have done so much more. And it's because of the imbalance of power that process with, was with good cops who wanted to change. The system makes it impossible. Um, and yes, you know, some police officers will lose their jobs, 
Many industries have faced this. Offer early retirement, buyout packages. Say if you're not on board, you can leave. And do not hide behind their union because the police union is not a union. In any strike, the police side with the bosses, not the workers. They have no class solidarity, and they need to stop using their so-called union as an excuse. Thank you, Ms. Collison. Thank you. Thank you. Also free transit. Thank you. Um, next is Paul LeMay. Uh, hi. Um, today I come to you to add my voice to the chorus of people calling to have the EPS defunded. Over the last couple of days, many people have come forward with stories of harassment and injustice at the hands of not only the police, but from an apathetic government apparatuses. They refuse to listen to well-researched and well-thought-out actions that can be taken to solve the, systematic, the systemic issues we are facing. The website www.blm.yeg.ca uh, yeah, has an action plan to transition away from our current system of policing, and I highly recommend everyone reads it. Uh, as a privileged white settler, my interactions with the police have only affirmed my observation that I am treated differently for being white. I was caught drinking in a public park after 11 p.m. and was told to dump out my beer and sent home. Other times I've had marijuana just taken away from me with no charges pressed. If I was not white, I'm certain these interactions would have not gone as well for me. Uh, this leads me to the point that uh, the war on drugs is what was started to oppress political dissenters and specifically black, black people by the Nixon campaign in 1971. In a 1996 interview with author Dan Baum, John Eldrichman, uh, Nixon's aide on domestic affairs, was quoted to saying about drugs, of course we did. The war on drugs was never started to protect people. And is, uh, is there anything we can do to nullify the Critical Infrastructure Act? It is clearly in violation of our charter rights as Canadians, and I feel the EPS enforcing it we only feel the assertion that the police are only here to enforce a white supremacist system with no regard for actual human life. Thank you for your time. You have an opportunity to be global leaders, and I truly hope you seize it. Thank you. Next is Virendra Gupta. Need to uh, unmute yourself, Mr. Gupta. On the uh, on the screen, you'll see a little microphone button with a that's red. If you can click that once, Is that good now? Ah, uh, fantastic, yes. Okay, no sorry about this. No problem, Thanks no so problem. Thanks so much for your patience. No anyway, problem, go I, ahead. As I was saying, so uh, I have lived in Edmonton for over 40 years, and I love this city. And I'm here really just as a citizen, a concerned citizen, and hearing all the voices of protest, I want to add my voice um, to your hearings. And my sole goal here is that I want Edmontonians, all Edmontonians from every community to feel safe and secure in the city and enjoy this lovely city. So before I begin, I want to commend the mayor and I want to commend the city council for holding these hearings because this issue is, has been in, around for far too long and it's really, really urgent in terms of attention. And uh, you really have, uh, as of even this afternoon, uh, you've already heard many, many thoughtful and caring voices, including those voices of people who are our frontline workers, who truly take care of our vulnerable and disadvantaged citizens. So 
uh, to be succinct, I have, I just want to address about uh, three, four topics. The first topic, topic I want to talk about is the role of police. I believe that the key question that you need to answer and the council needs to answer is what is the proper role of police? What role can they perform? And what kind of role they cannot perform? You know, issues of budget, issues of defunding, issues of recruitment, training, accountability, all of those of, can only be dealt with after we have fully understood what we want the police to do and what their role is. So we now know that at least, according to the police, that 30% of the calls to police are related to mental health issues, psychological or social issues. So when I think of the role, I think of the role in two parts. One, what I call the hard part, that is de dealing with the criminal activity uh, and so on. And the second part I call the soft part, that's the rest of the role that the police are right now playing. So you have to ask yourself, can the police really play these two roles well? Can they do it effectively? Especially when they are working for an organization that historically, and I think to this day, continues to prize their hard part role. I have not heard the police say that we are great at uh, the soft role. So these two roles cannot, I, you know, can they coexist? Is it possible? And even if they could, could co coexist, I, you have to ask the question whether in terms of funds, because I mean, the city is, you know, we have only so much money and the city is going to be under pressure as we go forward in terms of money, even more so than we have been historically. So, so the, you have to think about that. There are perhaps other issues, but it is very critical that we think through this role. And of course, people who are close to the action, and we heard even this afternoon a few speakers, strongly suggest that we need to reduce the role of the police in people's lives and increase the role of other service providers so that these issues can be dealt with properly. And even the hard part of the police role, I think people are saying that we need to do it mostly in a preventive fashion, not the hard fashion that is traditionally thought of. So that's the point one I want to uh, emphasize, uh, topic one, that is, let's figure out the role. Second issue is measures of success and accountability. How do we know that we are being successful or not at what we are doing in this area? We really don't, I don't know of any public measures which are available. So I think we really must establish what outcomes we want to have and what does success look like. And it's not only the we want to know, but the people who are in the jaws, the police officers, social workers, and others, they want the same. They want to know that they're being good at their, they're good at their job and they're doing it successfully. So they have some feedback, they have some incentive to do better and so on. So I think the other thing we could do here in terms of success and accountability is we must make details of police budgets and expenditures, you know, policies on the use of force, and, and the police success and failure public. We must do that okay? so that public knows what's going on. Complaints against police also must be investigated by an independent party. That is the only way to gain public confidence. More light on all of these issues, the better, and from my point of view. The third subject topic I want to just briefly I'm address to get is racism to, I'm going to have to and police misconduct. I'm going to have to wrap up there, Mr. Gupta, because we're at the end of the five minutes. Oh, we're at the end? Yeah, I'm afraid so. Ooh. There may be some questions Can I send you, you the rest of my submission? 
Yes, you may. You can send it to city.clerk at edmonton.ca and it'll be circulated to uh, uh, all members of uh, council here. So uh, thank you for that, though uh, there may be some questions uh, from members oh, of council. Oh, sorry, okay. No, that's, that's quite all right. I, I really appreciate your uh, uh, efforts to be um, part, of, part of this conversation. So, uh, but I, I must move on uh, to um, uh, Judith Beam next. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Okay, excellent. Um, so I've lived in Edmonton for over two years now in the neighborhoods of Riverdale, Montrose, and now in Newton. If you spent any time in Riverdale, you'll know that in that neighborhood, overwhelmingly white people are housed and Indigenous people are unhoused, living in the bushes of Dawson Park and the surrounding areas. You'll also know that bushfires, break-ins, and stolen property are common. The multicultural neighborhoods of Montrose and Newton are adjacent to 118th Street, areas with high concentrations of homeless populations, drug use, and prostitution. There is a known meth house on our street here in Newton. Populations experiencing obvious trauma in both neighborhoods are largely Indigenous, and this can be quantified as reflected in the most recent homeless counts provided by Homeward Trust stating that 57% of Edmontonians experiencing homelessness identify as Indigenous, while only 6% of Edmonton's entire population identifies as Indigenous. All three neighbourhoods, so Riverdale, Newton and Montrose, are heavily policed. If policing could solve social issues, have you considered that they would already be solved? The history of policing has always been problematic. The RCMP was the first police system in Canada, and while the RCMP doesn't fall under the city budget, it is important to acknowledge our history. The RCMP was created to facilitate the transfer of Indigenous land to the federal government and to control Indigenous people, segregating them to reserves, stri stripping them of their inal inalienable human rights, their language, their culture, and their children. The last federally operated residential school closed in 1996. Um, these schools rape, starved, and abuse Indigenous children, destroying families through generational pain and trauma. We see the fallout today in social problems disproportionately experienced by Indigenous populations. Indigenous populations have always had a relationship with the law born from trauma. And this legacy continues here in Edmonton, impacting not only Indigenous populations, but also Black people and non-Black people of colour. It is perpetuated by the Edmonton Police Services with carding, a practice that disproportionately impacts Black, Indigenous, and non-Black people of colour. Transit peace officers targeting poverty and homelessness in the name of fare evasion, again disproportionately impacting Indigenous populations. And school resource officers who charge students with criminal and non-criminal offences and have even used bait phones to entrap students. International data states that policing in schools creates a school-to-prison pipeline disproportionately impacting black students. The current system isn't broken. It is functioning exactly as it was intended to. However, it is unacceptable to stay silent in a society where we use the police to defend ourselves from the consequences of our own racism. Defund the police. Police don't belong in schools. Make transit free so it is more accessible for low income populations or at the very minimum, eliminate transit peace officers, eliminate carding. We need to listen to the most vulnerable of our community members. Having programs and support to keep the most vulnerable of our communities safe keeps everyone safe. When we listen to the most vulnerable voices, we will be reminded that social workers have contributed to the overrepresentation of Indigenous children and youth in government care and foster homes. We will be reminded that medical racism is alive and well. We will be reminded that removing one oppressive system and replacing it with another is not acceptable. We need community-based trauma and culturally informed supports to address the fallout of racism, which manifests in the most vulnerable populations in the form of poverty, homelessness, alcoholism, addiction, and prostitution. When community members like myself step in to intervene, we need to be able to call for help and know that vulnerable people in our community actually have resources available to get help instead of constantly having to determine if the impact of our intent to help will be resoundingly harmful. Lastly, I have sat on multiple committees in the government and in the nonprofit sector, as well as on boards. I know that listening to these stories is the easy part. Accountability is the hard part. 
How are you going to follow through making changes that increase the safety and well-being of our most vulnerable citizens? How are you going to ensure that any changes are trauma-informed, that they are cognizant of the colonial history here on Treaty 6 land? Will you be mindful not to replace one oppressive system with another? Thank you. Thank you very much. Next is Rob Jackson. Hello, uh, my name is Rob Jackson. I use he, him pronouns. I moved to Amiskwatsi, Waskahigan in 2013. And uh, I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Alberta and an adult educator. First of all, I'd like to acknowledge all the black people, indigenous people and people of color who are taking up the centuries long project of organizing, community building and consciousness raising to create a world of safety and abundance where the police are obsolete. They have made this conversation possible today. From my perspective, humbly and sincerely addressing the structural conditions of white supremacy in Canada cannot be used as an opportunity for reform or course correcting a system that is designed to criminalize indig indigenous people, black people, people of color, queer people and poor people in order to protect whiteness and property. White supremacy is endemic to our society. As Francis Lee Ainsley writes, white supremacy means the political, economic and cultural system in which whites overwhelmingly control power and material resources, conscious and unconscious ideas of white superiority and entitlement and relations of dominance and subordination are daily enacted across a broad array of institutional and social settings. White supremacy governs our collective ideas about whose lives hold value, whose safety we prioritize and how we engage in our world. It lives in budgets, policies, policing and personal interactions where, for example, the studied, measured, concrete and brilliant suggestions of black people, indigenous people and people of color are dismissed for being overly emotional or angry by elected representatives. But let me be clear, the problem community in this conversation is white people. Policing is invested in white supremacy and therefore it is necessary for white Edmontonians to recognize this is not a problem of communities our institutions have othered, but rather a problem we produce, reproduce and must dismantle. The origins of police in North America are intimately tied to white supremacy, foundationally expressed in the theft of indigenous lands and the legislated devaluation of black life, as well as racist immigration policies that have historically prioritized the migration of white settlers over uh, while criminalizing Chinese and Japanese Canadians, for example. Since their initiation, the police have been an integral part of these processes. As Sandra Hudson effectively synthesizes, the institution of modern policing was created in France as a mechanism to produce the property of wealthy men. The police acted as slave catchers to kidnap black people who had liberated themselves from slave owners. In Canada, this mandate was expanded when the RCMP was created to free up land of indigenous people to make the way for white settlement. Given this historical context, since their initiation, the police have not been designed to protect and serve communities, but rather to serve the individual interests of white people, landowners, and private property. As the statistics on carding and incarceration in Alberta tell us, this is a dynamic that persists today. It is not only an American problem. It is not only a North American problem. It is not only a problem in other cities. It is a problem in Edmonton. Any attempts to displace this reality to other places or other times is a willfully ignorant misrecognition of history and contemporary reality. And I do not mean to be bombastic or overly disrespectful when I say this, but despite good intentions and well-meaning individuals, the police are agents of class war, racial violence, and colonial domination. They should be held to account, defunded, demilitarized, and abolished in Edmonton. Unlike some of my fellow speakers, I have listened over the past few days. I do not believe that defunding the police is an impediment in any way to systemic change, but rather a small step towards a more holistically transformative push toward a world where everyone has housing, free and accessible opportunities for recreation and joy, free transit, dignity and safety regardless of their relationship to substances and feel safe because crisis diversion and de-escalation are prioritized as public safety measures. Unlike measures to reform the police, these solutions, like those concrete solutions proposed by Black Lives Matter Edmonton, do not look to create more effective or more just police, but rather imagine the freedom of a world without the force of the police and other coercive institutions. As a Canadian and an Edmontonian, 
the police act in my name and their actions are all too often reprehensible. I am in favor of defunding the EPS, but call for city council to go further, completely divesting from its relationship with the Edmonton Police Services and putting in place stern measures to make sure that the EPS officers are not replaced with provincial, federal, or private security forces. This means lobbying provincial and federal governments above your jurisdiction. As my representatives, I demand city council to be humble, to listen to grassroots community organizers and invest in non-coercive harm reduction strategies for advancing the well-being of everyone in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Jackson. Next is Beth Capper. Hi, uh, my name is Beth Capper and I'm a settler living on Treaty 6. A Métis Region Number 4 territory. One of the questions that I've heard raised by councillors over the past few days is, how do we make sure people are safe? This is a question that I've seen disproportionately posed to proponents of defunding and abolishing policing, rather, rather than to those who want to preserve the EPS. And yet, in the face of so much testimony from Black, Indigenous, and other people of colour, the policing does not make them safe, and that calling the police is basically a last resort. This is a question that could just as easily be posed to those who are here to argue that we need the police to keep us safe. We might then wonder whose safety and whose ideas of safety are being privileged here. So today I'm gonna to speak on this issue of safety and the common sense notions of it that often get propagated from my experience as a white middle-class cisgender woman and a settler. White middle-class settlers such as myself have been raised with a narrow understanding of safety. Many, if not all, white middle-class settlers are subject to a lifelong indoctrination in the belief that the police are the people who can protect us from violence. Within such narrow understandings of safety, there is no room for other ways of addressing harm other than retribution. The flip side of this white middle-class settler belief that the police and only the police are able to keep us safe is the ongoing and daily violence inflicted on black, indigenous, and other people of color by the police. This is the cost of the narrow white settler understanding of safety and justice. This is the violence performed on behalf of white settlers so that we may experience what we define as security and comfort. To actively fight against these narrow ideas of safety, we need to listen and to follow the lead of our black and indigenous community members and leaders who for decades have been at the forefront of developing new ways of thinking about safety and justice for all. As abolitionist thinkers and organizers teach us, abolition is not simply about dismantling institutions and structures, but is also centrally about imagining and building the kinds of structures that we want to create. It is foremost a work of the radical imagination. On a more pragmatic level, though, it is also a work of practice. And to those who have continually asked the question of who is going to respond to violence and harm, if not the police, um, there are countless examples out there. Organizations such as Project NIA in Chicago and Inside Women of Color Against Violence, among others, have created resources and toolkits that outline alternative models of justice, safety, and accountability, while others such as the Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective in Oakland and the Bear Claw Patrol in Winnipeg have formed groups that promote community safety, harm reduction, and where necessary, directly respond to and intervene in violence. But I also want to underscore that the question of who will respond to the most extreme forms of violence is itself the product of narrow understandings and limited horizons. In a recent talk, the abolitionist scholar and activist Angela Davis was asked the same question about who responds to violence when the police have been abolished. And her response was to ask why, when we think about abolishing the police, the first thing that comes up to our mind is the most extreme example. Those examples that, by the way, do not make up the bulk of police work, as we've heard, or that police have largely proved ineffective in preventing and addressing, such as rape and sexual assault. For Davis, this emphasis on the most extreme example acts as a way to dissuade us from moving in more imaginative and more just directions. Councillor McKean said on Monday that defunding the police and redirecting those funds to social programs is going to take a lot of political will. It's also going to mean that some of us will have to expand our horizons and think beyond extremes and uncertainties. Luckily, these past few days have shown us that we are surrounded 
by community members, overwhelmingly indigenous, black and people of color community members who are already working on expansive visions for safety beyond policing. For example, the Black Lives Matter platform for defunding the police mentioned in this forum many, many times now includes so many concrete proposals for emergency response and infrastructural transformations that if implemented might make policing obsolete. As Sergeant Curtis Hoopel outlined in his comments this morning, decisions made here have the potential to reshape policing across Canada. I agree. Let's take this opportunity to be at the forefront of the movement in Canada to defund and, yes, abolish the police. I call upon the council to defund the police and redirect those funds towards harm reduction and community-based alternatives. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Capper. Next is Batal Karkash. Hi, um, uh, I add my voice to the call for the defunding and abolition of the police. Uh, we don't want police training or more diverse hiring. We do not want different policing. We want no policing. Because the people who are criminalized, the actions that are deemed crimes are not a coincidence or a happenstance. It is a historically steeped context that makes certain communities policed. Policed as in under surveillance and criminalized at every turn for the convenience of the dominant society as they marginalize indigenous, black, and visible minority groups. The statement by the chief of Edmonton police that any cut to EPS funding leads to cuts to diversity and equity programs first are absolutely disgusting, but not a surprise because no matter how much police and dominant institutions try to hide behind wording like cultural differences and good PR, we know that ultimately people of color are not welcome in these spaces. Anyways, having a diverse police force is not really an answer because the whole institution of policing is racist and steeped in colonialism and white supremacy, just like the conditions of poverty in our society that are also ultimately criminalized. The council is responsible for approving budgets for police. I implore the council to recognize that there needs to be a look at the police union and the terms in that contract that may shield them from being held accountable or sanctioned. All public servants should be held accountable to the communities they propose to serve. I think something really powerful that Mrs. Walters brought up in the last panel is that what we're proposing, while new and a little scary and hazy to us, isn't actually unprecedented. Uh, many others have mentioned this as well. It has been done and imagined in other places, and now we have an opportunity to imagine a new world together in which violence against marginalized communities is not an accepted norm or something hidden behind good PR. The uh, school resource officer program is currently in junior and high schools in Edmonton and even being proposed to elementary schools, even though there have been no public oversights or checks to this program. This program seems clearly designed to criminalize youth in schools, establishing a school to prison pipeline for Canada, which has been already talked about a lot in America. I don't see any reason why we should follow that bad example. There's no reason, reason for students to be introduced to the criminal justice system in schools. As soon as someone is made into a criminal, by these institutions, they become entrenched in the criminal system and it gets that much harder for them to make a life for themselves, further marginalizing them. There's no reason this first contact with police needs to be happening in schools. On to the issue of carding. The practice of carding must be stopped. Despite activist opposition, carding still exists in Edmonton and according to uh, Avnish Nanda, the Edmonton Police Service is one of Canada's loudest champions of the use of carding and street checks, which by all studies is a racist practice that disproportionately targets Indigenous and Black people. This is the time to move forward with real decolonial and decri decriminalizing efforts. I've seen some questions pointed towards the basic idea of if we change the police, how will white communities continue to feel safe? Basically pointing out that white Edmontonians may not be ready for this change. Uh, and while that, may not be the, while that may be the case, Edmonton's people of color are not ready to continue living like this. This question itself perfectly illustrates that white and minority groups have wholly different experiences with police. The indigenous black and people of color of this city have never felt safe or protected by the police. And the fact that the white people of this, com of this community do feel safe and protected by the police is itself the problem. The, the police are an, a racist institution, a violent institution, and they're also weaponized by the white communities of Edmonton against black, indigenous, and people of color. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Carrie. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay. 
I am very thankful for the opportunity to speak to City Council and many others watching this online. The following statements I'd like to share come from police officers I know who provided these first-hand accounts of their experiences. Have you ever held the hand of an aspiring model while she gets 37 stitches in her faces after all the other girls at the party dragged her across a brick wall like it was a cheese grater, all because she was too pretty? Have you ever had a man collapse at your feet after you told him the doctor could do no more for his infant son? Have you ever had to tell a man that the cousin he just told to go kill himself did in fact go kill himself? Have you ever begged a man not to force you to restrain him in order to stop him from entering a crime scene to view his family member's mangled body? These are not random hypothetical situations. These are shared and common experiences that many people, many, many members of the EPS face in their first several years of policing. Now reflect on these situations that have occurred to you or someone you know. Now, have you ever had your home broken into, personal items that you hold dear, stolen from you, your peace of mind shattered? Now imagine having to call for police to only then be told it may be several hours or a few days to get back to you because of call volume and lack of police officers. Have you ever been in a collision on a busy road, frustrated and exchanging information with others who, let, who the other driver alleges that you, it was your fault? Now imagine calling the police to help resolve this confrontation, only to be told that you have to wait eight hours before a police officer can arrive due to call volume and lack of police officers. Have you had someone you love who is suffering from depression and contemplating suicide refusing to open their door for you, not knowing whether they are still alive on the other side of the door? Imagine calling social services for assisting, who reply back that you need to call the police. Continue to imagine calling the police but waiting for five hours till a police officer arrives to assist in determining the welfare of the one you love. There are approximately 1,780 members of the EPS and approximately over 972,000 citizens living in Edmonton. That is approximately one police officer for every 546 citizens. Yet, despite the struggles and being understaffed, EPS has consistently achieved an average of 94% approval rating staffed by the Edmonton Police Commission from the citizens of Edmonton itself. There has to be an open dialogue based on not just experiences, but on evidence as well. I want my city to be good and a safe place to live for everyone, but I believe that rushed and emotionally charged decisions may cause more suffering than intended. I am heartbroken and frustrated to see how the city has turned against our police very quickly due to the events in the U.S. I understand some of the challenges faced by minorities. My husband is a minority, and he is also a member of EPS. My children then, in turn, experience life as a minority as well. I believe you can be 100% in support of equality and 100% in support of police. Social media and the groups demanding the police be defunded or abolished are focused on incidences which include use of force. The statistics show that less than 1% of last year's 261,842 police files involved a use of force. I support my husband being a member of EPS, and I also support the experiences of minorities. The events in the States and protests in Canada could be a catalyst to continue the progression to, imp progression to improve policing. Police joining with civilian experts has already been progressing for years in this city. For example, the Zebra Center combines police officers and professional support to assist and investigate child victims of sexual assault. Currently, on all social media platforms, all I hear is people calling all police officers all racist murderers. Not all police officers uphold the high standards we in society demand of them. But with no police, there is no society and only chaos. I hope city councillors and Edmontonians are not quick to forget how, Ed how EPS was invested in apprehending a motivated suspect in a U-Haul in 2017 that tore through the downtown core. I also hope that city councillors and Edmontonians are not quick to forget the sacrifice of Constable Daniel Woodall in 2015, who died executing his duties to arrest a person who spouted hate and racism at the minority to call Edmonton home. Things do have to change for women, minorities, and for equality for all. I cannot say that enough but I refuse to let the few tarnish the excellent police officers who perform their duties while adhering to a very high ethical standard. Although this is an emotional issue for all sides, it is imperative to look at the statistics and understand the vital role that police play in protecting the community from those that victimize them. If City Council was to make their decision today, I ask that you decide on what is best for the City of Edmonton. If Edmontonians are like family, please make the decision that you would best make for your family. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And uh, last is Brody Stenhouse. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Brody Stenhouse. Uh, I'm a settler on Treaty 6 land. Uh, I'm a registered social worker uh, working with youth in a neighboring municipality. I support defunding the police and I support the Black Lives Matter Edmonton's recommendations. <clears throat> Further on in my five minutes, you're going to hear me draw on experiences in my previous work with Boyle Street Community Services, with Streetworks, with the EPL Stanley Milner Outreach Program, and group care with violent youth, as well as experiences I have as a resident of Ward 6 who enjoys interacting with everyone in that community. I'm not here to speak to hard numbers or personal negative interactions with police. You've heard a lot of those voices in the last few days and over the last few years. You've heard a lot of these speakers who are much more well-versed than myself, who have come to the table with data, research, and personal experiences. Many of these people are community members of the Black, Indigenous, and other POC communities. And frankly, it would be an embarrassment and shame of the City Council, City Administration, EPS, if these stories and re-traumatization all ends up being lip service. I call on City Council to put more weight in the experiences of these speakers than they have been. The information has been out there, and you all need to make a personal commitment to listen to it. It's a further embarrassment and disservice to these people if you had speakers like Curtis Hoople and Carrie Diod claim that events in another country are threatening to destroy policing here. We can all agree that those statements show a misunderstanding of the phrase systemic racism, systemic racism. They're either being willfully or unwillingly obtuse about the subject. I don't know which is worse. In Mr. Diod's case, we probably know the answer as he is someone who enjoys relationships with prominent white supremacists anyways. Bashir, Ray Cash, Batool, Avnish, Molly, Dusty, the list goes on. These people have been telling you and you need to listen to them. We need to go further than defunding the police we need to look at dismantling white supremacy in helping professions, looking at you fellow white social workers that have been listening or speaking today, as well as legalizing and regulating a safe supply for substances. We need to legalize and regulate sex work. We need to le stop finding ways to criminalize low income and BIPOC people. I call on city council to begin looking at what they can do in these areas at a municipal level, as well as pressure provincial and federal government where needed. Speaking to the last speaker as well, if you're using stats from the EPS to defend the EPS, I think that kind of speaks clearly to a misunderstanding of what systemic means. De-escalation has been a bit of a buzzword. Social workers or similar are generally who people think should be in place of these officers. Um, I've done a lot of this in my life. And I just want to get a sense of what de-escalation skills actually look like. Say there's someone on the street, a known member of the community who's marginalized, having a heated argument, potentially violent uh, with a partner. Some ways you can intervene are knowing their name, using it. This requires actually knowing your community and having trust in your community. Eye contact, when it's appropriate, you have to know when it's appropriate. Using proper proximity spacing, giving that person an out to flee if that's what they need to do. Their fight or flight response will be activated and police officers only allow for one of those actions to happen. Voice intensity and matching, mirroring, starting where they are at and bringing them down. Calming touch when appropriate, active listening, and I mean active smiling when appropriate, and being a presence, what police might call deportment. I didn't say use aggressive language, stand in an aggressive posture, or pull out one of your various weapons. Why do we need someone who, that's their toolkit, you know, in these situations? My 10 years of social work, I've de-escalated countless potential violence situations without calling the police, without resorting to violence. You've heard the story of the EPS officer crying to Michael Elliott because they had been under scrutiny, even though that officer saved someone's life with naloxone the week before. I didn't realize you needed a gun to administer naloxone. Why do we need someone with a gun who instills absolute fear in much of our community to de-escalate these situations? Police are not suited for this work. Dale McPhee agrees. He said as much last week. Ultimately, something needs to change. I think we can agree having a militarized presence in our schools is ridiculous. We can agree having a militarized presence responding to mental health calls is ridiculous. Furthermore, as a child of two former police officers, I understand the culture deeply, and I understand the resistance to change and the reticence to call out your fellow officers on bad behavior. Groupthink is not only prevalent, but it's deemed necessary among officers in some cases. This is why I call for more training or a kinder police force simply isn't enough. If there's any good cops out there, where the hell are they? Police forces across the globe can't look themselves in the mirror and say they have upheld point one of the nine Peelian principles, the guiding principles of modern day policing, aka policing by consent. I'm sure you're all aware of them. I hope you're all aware of them. At the very least, trust in the uniform has been broken. This is not policing by consent anymore. It is absolutely not on the community at large to repair that trust. It's on you. City officials and EPS need to do better starting today. Defund the police. Thank you. 
thank you to all members of the panel. Uh, I will check and see uh, from members of council here who may have questions for you. Councillor Paquette, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and I'm sorry, sir, I've forgotten your name, but you were using Helen Sadowski's computer. That's uh, Mr. Gupta. Mr. Gupta, um, you were about to embark on a third point, and I'm just wondering if you wouldn't mind um, uh, condensing it into about one minute of a response. Mr. Gupta, you need to unmute yourself now. You know what, while you work on that, I will move over and uh, maybe I would like to um, ask Laura uh, Collison a quick question. Um, and it's not about oh, the painting in your background. It yeah, is, you. uh, um, I'm just wondering if you can expand on the efforts that you made uh, with, the, with EPS for developing your program. You said that it was a, a difficult and exhausting process not because of the of the people who wanted to do good in the system, but because of the system itself. And I'm just wondering if you can uh, quickly expand on that a little bit. Absolutely. So, um, yes, it was at the time we were working on a campaign that basically said, you know, perpetrators, um, sexual assaults on them. At the time, it was revolutionary. Um, so we can see how ideas change. Um, but the thing that was difficult was we had to teach every single officer that came in the same thing again. And when we got pushback, it was... The power imbalance made it scary. I saw the way that police change from agreeing with you and it's all fine, it's all things. In its instant, the fear is there, the aggression is there, they have the power and there's nothing you can do. And that was around a boardroom table with organizations with mostly white people. And it made me terrified to think about what happened elsewhere. elsewhere. Um, and there was just so much conflict with all of the things that were happening while we were trying to teach the police what we knew and had known for years, getting through that resistance, getting through that power, um, it was so, so draining and draining on resources. And even though the campaign was super successful and I'm very proud of it, and I don't think that was a waste of time, I think the effort that it took was a waste of time and resources. And I honestly am still traumatized to this day. And I know other folks around that table are as well because of that you know, amicable sort of like working with the community sort of situation that we were in with police there. So it wasn't the people in the system, it was the system itself. And, and your contention is that if you had received those dollars directly without having to partner, you could have reduced uh, the conditions that lead to crime or the conditions that lead to police being called out more effectively and efficiently. Absolutely, because we would have been able to put energy and resources into um, the project, into um, the things we were creating for community, rather than again and again having to fight with the police at the table. And again, these were cops who were trying. They were trying so hard, but because of the way that they, that the culture that they worked in, it was almost impossible for them to break through that. Thank you. Um, yeah, back to, uh, um, again, sorry, the mayor mentioned your name, Mr. but uh, I was already <laughs> moving on with my question. So please uh, go ahead with your, uh, with my remaining time, maybe uh, make your- Okay, mind. so thank you. Uh, Councillor, I just have to say that uh, the issue of racism and uh, and police misconduct, uh, it's, there's, you know, people have tried and tried and I, it continues to persist. It's a deep, deep virus as far as I'm concerned. And uh, so what perhaps we can do, the city council is appoints all the police commissioners. So to begin with, we should start at the top and make sure the commissioners you appoint are qualified, are sensitive, and present all the communities, especially the communities which are, which sort of feel the brunt of uh, police misconduct. And secondly, I would say that police, all ranks of the police, not just uh, the recruits and so on, we need to have people from all communities at all ranks. And we should give the police commission a mandate that must report on annually so that we know what the police commission is doing and not doing, and the public knows what's going on and on. And uh, the other so constructive idea I had was that perhaps the police should do volunteer work in these disadvantaged communities 
and so that they understand their concerns, where they're coming from, and become sensitized to their issues. Finally, I would say in that area that uh, we should encourage police, if it's at all possible, I'm not sure it's possible, to report uh, if they see a colleague who's doing racist, racist actions or some other misconduct, they should report that. They should be required to report. Now, I mean, speaker has spoken to this issue and already said it may not be possible. Thank and you. finally, I want to urge this council to act now and not waste this crisis. This opportunity could disappear very quickly. So you really have to seize it. And I think to the degree people agree we need the police, our motto has to be police is part of the public and the public part of the police. And finally, we must not militarize our police. And I think we've gone only too far in that direction. Must not militarize. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I believe I have some condense it to one minute, so I must have many minutes left. <laughs> I'm, afraid, I'm afraid your time has expired, Councillor, but uh, thank you. Uh, I have yeah. Councillor Walters, then Councillor Henderson. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you all uh, for the time uh, and your thoughtful presentations. Uh, I can't recall the name of the person who mentioned uh, Project um, uh, NIA. Beth Capper. Oh, okay, Ms. Capper, thank, thank you. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about that? I, I have some uh, historical familiarity with that project. Uh, my memory of it is that it's a partnership with the police. It started as a partnership with police in Chicago, or it may not have started there, but it ended up there. So, you, so there's still a, it's been around for a while. There's still a police force in, in the city of Chicago. Um, and in many of the cities where uh, Project NAI, NAI uh, operates. So can you talk about that and give me any more information that you think would be relevant for this council to hear about that particular uh, project? Certainly. Um, so I don't know the ins and outs of what work they've done with the police. Um, I do know that um, abolitionist uh, thinker Mariam Kaba was one of the sort of main is one of the sort of main um, figures that had been driving that project in Chicago before uh, she moved to New York, um, and that uh, the uh, project itself defines itself in abolitionist terms. Um, it may be that they have done work with the police because the police uh, right uh, exist <laughs> and. There's no uh, kind of way for them to uh, not have to do that work at, at present, especially in a city like Chicago, a city that I used to live in, by the way, and uh, uh, had many, many, many run-ins with police um, who um, used uh, racist language to me as a white woman to talk about the minority communities that they policed. Um, one police officer once let me hold his gun. Um, so just thinking, I mean, you know, there's many reasons I think why they might uh, be forced into those partnerships, but I understand it as an abolitionist project. Um, what I do know about them is that they have a lot of kind of educational curricula that they build. They go into schools, for example, and they do workshops around kind of thinking about transformative forms of justice, um, like the kinds of forms of justice that I think Laura um, participates in um, and is is well versed in, uh, cool. and will be able to speak to like the local examples of that here in Edmonton. Right. And Laura can, uh, Miss Carlson could chime in. Forgive me, Laura. You can chime in on the question of whether that is something that would be better suited uh, for schools, uh, and youth communities than the SROs would. As as an example, that's more focused on because there's a big emphasis on restorative justice and understanding trauma and and leading kids away from. Uh, situations that may require police in our contemporary thinking. So maybe comment on that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that they would be very, very useful ways um, to deal with those situations in schools. And I would say that we should go beyond um, restorative justice towards transformative justice. Mm -hmm. And that's a, a way of looking at not just the one situation that happened, but the whole community around the situation that happened and how that was allowed to happen. Um, and especially with kids in schools like 
there's just so much, you can go down the two ways, right? Like you can have the cop involved and you can have that child enter the justice system and likely end up in prison. Or you can intervene with that, with that child who is still learning, who is making mistakes, who has so much potential to change and learn and grow. And that's the whole point, right? Um, and so that not only, you know, like change it or like offers the person who's been harmed healing, that offers the person who's done harm um, the ability to heal as well and to stop doing harm. Um, putting that child in jail just means that they will likely continue to do harm. Well, I, I wanted to note my appreciation for you raising that example of uh, an alternative a form of achieving community safety. Uh, so I think that's something worth, worth uh, spending some time understanding. Right. Uh, I sent several resources to you guys about it as well. Right. That's all I had, Mr. Mayor. Thanks. Thank you. Next, I have Councillor Henderson and then Councillor Banga. Um, yeah, actually, uh, uh, Mr. Stenhouse, this question came from something you said, but I'm actually going to ask it to Mr. Gupta, but I wouldn't mind, or maybe b both of you, because uh, I, I think, uh, Mr. Stenhouse, you said quite correctly that there are certain things that we don't need a militarized police to handle. But I think accidentally, and I don't think you, I'm, I'm guessing you don't believe this, that would begin to suggest that there are some things we need a militarized police to handle. And, I, and I'm not sure I'm there. And, I, and Mr. Mr. Gupta, you said that we don't need, a, you, you know, that, that we should resist the militarization of police. And I would say reverse, because I, even in my time, have seen us go down that road. So I'm wondering what, I, I guess, uh, uh, to Mr. Gupta first, what a demilitarized police looks like to you. Um, well, let I think me start of the I, we have to do sorry. Here. Thank you. So I don't, didn't realize how far we already gone down this road. I'll give you two things. One, in the Globe and Mail, I think last week, I saw a story where the city council, Halifax City Council, has canceled a contract for a militarized vehicle, which has guns on top, like about six guns, and it turns, and also has a thing in the front that can shove people. I was absolutely horrified. I cannot think of why police, our police needs that or wouldn't need that. And the vehicle was, I think, would cost over $300,000. So I, I, I just, last time I saw that was when the FLQ crisis happened and Pierre Trudeau ordered military into Montreal. Police is, has to be our force, our people. Military is for, uh, for attacking enemies. We are not police enemies, shouldn't be. Police shouldn't think that way. And so then I can tell you another example. About a couple of weeks ago, I was doing some gardening and I suddenly heard a crash to the fence in a, in a community garden. And I looked up and there was a truck that came through and the truck had crashed through the fence. And as soon as he finished, I mean, I looked up, sorry, I should say, there were seven, eight police cars that came. To, and there was, looks like only one person in the, in the truck and they, they got him, whatever. Then shortly after, I saw this black Garth Vader type of vehicle come down, you know. And I, to this day, don't, don't know what that was about and why that came, why that was necessary. I mean, I think my children will be frightened to see something like this. And I find it very objectionable. That's why I want the police budget item by item put in the public sphere, not just some big budget, $380 million. I want to know where the money is going, how much is going to the manpower, how much is going to, the, to, the, uh, to buy these kinds of crazy vehicles, and who needs them, what for? We should ask them how often they've used them. You know, it's Thank scary. You. It really is. So that's where I am coming from. I say get yep. rid of them. And I understand also that the council in the past, in some cases, have looked at it and said, oh, you don't need a helicopter. But the police still have found the money within the allocated budget already to buy that helicopter. So I think we need much greater accountability and understanding, it's up to you guys because you are 
the council and you have the responsibility to appoint the police commissioners, you have the responsibility to approve the budget. So you just have to own up to it, to be frank. You can't say, oh, well, you know, this or that or that. That just doesn't add up for me anyway. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's helpful. Mr. Stenhouse, I have a tiny little bit of time left, and you did. Your, it was your comment that triggered my thought. Um, and, yeah. you know, I, I guess essentially, knowing your background, your, your, you said your family history. Is there a reason to militarize the police on any level? No, that, that's um, a fundamental yeah. question that I'm asking. I'm thinking. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah. So by no means am I advocating for that at all. Um, and I'll echo that by no means am I an expert on this. Um, those are just two examples that are kind of low hanging fruit, right? I think everyone across the board can agree on those two. Um, and I'll echo Mr. Gupta's statements as well. And I believe you guys have been given uh, ample resources on demilitariz demilitarization and uh, defunding anyways. And I hope you guys uh, defer to that. Thanks. Great. Thank you. My time is out. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Banga. Thank you very much. After using uh, this technology for a few days, I still am not proficient at this thing. Anyway, uh, thanks to everyone for uh, coming out today and uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Um, my first uh, question is for uh, Mr. Gupta again. Sorry to put you on spot. No, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I know you referred to the police role, soft role, and hard role. Like, you know, what, what do you exactly mean by that? Is it preventative and uh, reactive? Like, well, I just want to get, uh, get an understanding. Of well, my hard role is where the police is going to be involved in a checking criminal activity and requires physical force. So I think those are the hard roles where some, you know, crime is underway and the police go arrest the person or check and there's some physical force required. Soft role is all those other roles. I mean, to me, police shouldn't be involved in traffic violations, shouldn't be involved in all kinds of mental issues, shouldn't be involved in so that we can cut back very severely and restrict the police to the roles police is qualified to do, police that loves doing, and traditionally that's all they have done. So I think we should really think about what are they competent at, what they enjoy doing, and what are the all expectations we have created. And unfortunately, as a society, in, uh, what we have done over the since the late 70s and early 80s, we have decided criminalization is the answer to all the social problems. Problems of poverty, problems of you know, mental illness, problems of homelessness, problems of drugs. And the police, unfortunately, are in their interface because it's not being picked up anywhere else. And I think a lot of people here, very thoughtful people, have said a lot of very intelligent things. And I really hope that we will not waste this opportunity. As politicians, I think you have to recognize that there are very few opportunities come in life to make a difference. And people are already very cynical. They don't believe anything can change. And if you let this go, it's on you. But all you do is encourage cynicism and promote a disaffection. Okay. And yeah. I don't think we want that. Okay, Mr. Gupta, one more question for you before sure. I move on to the next. Um, that question is, uh, since we are in the, let's say, we're in the phase of defining police roles. Yes. Or role, what do we do in the meantime? Oh, I think uh, some things are very obvious right away. I mean, I think you have to make you know, I think you have to be very active, very determined, because I think things are going to start cooling down. So you keep that role the way it is to the degree you can, but then you can start changing. Some things are clear now, and I can send you a letter if you want, that Please. we need to change right away, and we can change right away. Thank you. And you involve the public more in these decision-making. A lot of people think you want the community involved. Policing is a community service. It should... You know, I mean, police has this big banner that says uh, service and protection or something. 
And, you know, protection role is very limited in so many ways. It's mostly the service role. And the question is, are they good at it? Thank you. Or the best at it? Because the social Thank services, quite frankly, are about half the money than a particular police person. Do you want money, given that we're going to be so short of money in the coming years in this city, in this province, how do we spend those very precious dollars? We have to really rethink. And why should, I mean, even I was surprised to read that the police has this budget, or you people have decided in the city council, that the police budget is the one that gets increases every year Population plus inflation. Okay, I thank don't you. know why they, that's the only service that gets it. Do the other services, social services, health services, other services in the that city provides have that kind of built-in provision? We cut back teachers, we cut back even doctors, we are cutting back everything else. Why? Why this is so sacrosanct? What is so sacred about it? Thank you, Mr. Gupta, Mr. Mayor. Do I still have a few seconds? I'm afraid not. Thank you. Uh, I might pick up where, where you were maybe going to go next, uh, but, uh, oh, actually, Councillor Knack is next, so go ahead, Councillor Knack. Oh, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I didn't want to ruin the flow there. I, I, I had a question for, just one question, I think, left for Mr. Stenhouse, because uh, you touched on it in your presentation as uh, with two parents who were in the police service and I, I, you were talking a bit about the culture, but I, I didn't get, to, I was hoping you could maybe expand on some of that because I, I was trying to better understand what, what some of the specific issues were that they, they witnessed that you heard from them or, or were shared with you. Sure. Um, I was raised by two people who um, I believe joined the police force with the most noble of intentions um, at the time. They joined when they were very young. Um, neither of them had any sort of extra education at all. And in some cases it was um, one of their only options um, not to disparage my parents, but you know, they have, they have grown and learned as people then um, for, since then um, the culture being that I met a lot of officers. My father was very, very high up in, in the RCMP um, in the undercover and drug squad unit. Um, I've met some of the best, you know, what they would call the best officers in the country, um, personal friends of my father. Um, I see who these, I see the humanity of who these people are. Um, and this is where I think people are losing the meaning of what systemic racism means, not meaning that just because someone is a minority in the police force doesn't mean they can't be racist, not meaning that just because someone is, quote unquote, a good person, they don't act out in a racist way. Um, the systemic part speaks to the fact that there can be quote unquote good people in the police force that um, inflict pain on our BIPOC communities um, because that's what the police force is designed to do. They're designed to protect white property, uh, white safety, white feelings, and um, they act in that manner. Um, I think I spoke to their reticence to call each other out in the force. Um, both my parents have been involved in public lawsuits where they did exactly that. Both of them have won. Um, they're rare cases. For the most part, um, these people do not call each other out. Um, they don't hold each other to account because it's that groupthink mentality, right? And they need it sometimes in their world, right? In their minds. They need it to protect themselves. If you have members of the same team that are on the same page, um, then, you know, they're, you're not a united front, right? So by design, these people have created this united front that is um, free of or doesn't condone or encourage dissent at all in the ranks um, and in fact squashes it, um, sometimes to the point of violence within themselves. Um, and, you know, it's just... If anyone is a good cop, why aren't they standing and saying, I'm going to quit my job until this changes? I'm going to demand absolute change. Why aren't they doing that? They're just staying silent. They're not doing anything. We all know the issues. It's not a mystery. It's not rocket science. Um, all of these people know what the problem is. Um, if you're saying you don't understand what the problem is, you're either 
um, lying or unfortunately you're not qualified to be at the table for the conversation. Um, just, that's the design of the police force. I know the culture very well. Um, I talk about it with my father all the time. Um, and he agrees with me and, and, you know, that's just kind of, unfortunately, I think a lot of, maybe not a lot, but a few of these people do join with good intentions. Um, but as soon as they're indoctrinated into the ranks, those good intentions uh, fall by the wayside in lieu of job security. Thank you. And, and I think that, that was all my questions. Just meant to, again, thank everyone for taking the time on this panel to, to share their feedback on this. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Um, Councillor Paquette, if you could take the chair. I have the chair. Um, a, a number of speakers, and I'm trying to determine who's the best to ask this question to, um, have, have referenced, maybe I'll go to Mr. Jackson, um, have referenced the need for us to advocate to senior orders of government. Um, and, and that's a point that, that we've made for a long time, particularly through End Poverty Edmonton, that of the levers, because many of you have argued that, that poverty is criminalized and that, we're, that, that policing as it exists today is a reaction to that institutionalized and intergenerational and, and sometimes racist uh, poli uh, poverty or racialized experience of poverty. Um, and we heard all that loud and clear through our rich community engagement with M Poverty Edmonton. Uh, uh, well, I'll ask Mr. Jackson, and I'll see if anyone else wants to jump in on this. Um, do any of you believe that it is within the capacity of the city of Edmonton, just with the dollars available in the police budget, to sufficiently alleviate poverty within our jurisdiction? Or, or, or would you agree that provincial, mainly provincial, to some extent federal programs or resources would also need to be aligned to that strategy to make systemic change? Um, I think that the at the municipal level, there's a lot that can be done to reallocate resources, to invest in grassroots community organizations um, in a spirit of abundance. It's no, it's no uh, secret right now that we're in a state of austerity and that our provincial government has a fetish for austerity and that bears down with extreme violence on our communities. And I think that it's up to city council and at the municipal level to come into potentially antagonistic relationships with the provincial governments, reallocating the funds that you do have available to you, um, directing funds away from investments in development in the downtown core, for example, towards developments in um, community infrastructures rather than privatized land developments or partnering with corporations to build new tourist attractions in the downtown core, for example. I think there's a lot that you can do. Um, as a mayor, you have a lot more knowledge and expertise about what you can do within the municipal um, jurisdiction. But I think that there's a, a there's an opportunity for a real creativity and leadership at the municipal level um, that it's that that's going to be the problem that the city council and the U.S. mayor have to figure out and finding the appropriate ways of advocating for and standing up to the provincial and federal governments, for example, is your responsibility. Mr. Mayor, may I add, if you would? Yes, I'd love to hear your perspective on this point, Mr. Gupta. So, I mean, I, I appreciate what you're saying. And that is, uh, the city's uh, powers of taxation and sources of finances are relatively limited. And the other higher levels of government has the most money. The government, of course, that has the most money or ability is the federal government. Unfortunately, federal government cannot, even if it wants to, reach out to the city directly. There is a province stands in the way, and much of it has to flow through the province. And uh, so you know, I think uh, that's very unfortunate because the provinces and the cities have such large responsibilities and they fit. you are, in my mind, the closest to the people 
and real representatives of democracy. You are non-partisan. You are, uh, you know, represent your communities uh, and so on. But I think you have to do what you must, you can, and uh, think this through. Also, I would say to point out to, um, it is my understanding that Calgary, at least in terms of homelessness uh, uh, problem, they are ahead of us in Edmonton in terms of dealing with it. I don't know all the reasons behind it, but uh, uh, clearly that seems to be the case. And then I think you I, also, I, unlike I the would, feds... I uh, would. I would dispute sorry. that, and I'm I'm just about out of time. So sorry, sorry, Mr. Okay, Bruce, sorry I want to that. pivot no, to I to say that you have the ability to put pressure on the feds and uh, to see what they will do. Because I'm a, I'm just I'm not very hopeful that uh, uh, the provincial government here is going to see its way clearly in helping the cities. Well, this is. This is where it does get a little bit complicated, is we have eight cents of your money. And with that, we look after 60% of public infrastructure and a variety of services you depend on. So one cent of your money pays for policing right now. 20 or 30 cents pays just for health care, which is made more expensive because of inadequate uh, upstream prevention work, like housing, like poverty alleviation, so on and so forth. So, Mr. Stenhouse, is someone familiar with the system and, and uh, from that altitude, um, uh, which levers would you pull? Um, you know, the game changers in M Poverty Edmonton are mental health supports, housing, mobility, early learning and care, anti-racism, and uh, there's a sixth one that I'm forgetting off the top of my head, but what are the levers you would, you would pull hardest to make the change. Then House, please do answer. Mr. Mayor, your seven minutes are up. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I guess I'm, I don't quite know what you, can you clarify that question a little bit for me? I'm, I'm really out of time. Uh, so, so I, I probably can't, but uh, it's a, it's something I blogged about the other day and it's, it's sort of sure. the crux of implementation, which is the, the, the prevention, will allow. the prevention sure. levers are in, chiefly in the hands of the province. So, which one should I pull the hardest if I'm going to pull uh, the provincial lever in addition to the limited tools that are in my municipal toolkit? Which lever should I pull the hardest? We're pulling housing. Would you recommend something else? Right. Got it. Um, you know. I it's hard. I mean, I mean, like I said, I, I'm not the expert. I think you guys haven't given ample resources to answer that through the Black Lives Matter, um, you know, documents as well as, as you know, from other people. Um, so I, I do defer to that. And I do, please, I can't stress enough to listen to the leaders of our, our BIPOC community on this. Um, I mean, what I would do is find a way, um, you know, housing makes sense. But again, uh, like you said, that's where it gets complicated. Um, you, you know, housing first um, is a great concept, but then if you're still criminalizing what these people are doing um, when they're out on the street or out in their community or um, just living their life, then there's there's no point to doing any of it. Um, as we move further down the defund the police kind of um, path, um, you know, like I mentioned, social workers are kind of who's who, who's the next line. A lot of people say. Um, can deal with a lot of this stuff where there's a ton of white supremacy in, in social work as well. Um, it just keeps unearthing more and more and more things. So um, I guess my quick answer, um, and uh, I can't stress enough, my non-expert answer is pull any lever you can to get it done right now. Um, housing probably makes sense, um, but it, it can't end there, right? And it's not going to end there. Um, you know, we've talked about this for years. I, I've been in the social work field and the harm reduction field for a long, you know, relatively long time for a person as young as myself. Um, and I've seen that com these conversations, um, you know, shift from the uh, meeting room upstairs in street works to uh, here, right? Which is incredible. Um, you have to keep going. You have to keep starting. You have to keep chipping away at, uh, you know, where you can. And this isn't going away. Um, this isn't something that's going to die down um, and, um, you know, go away this time. This is for real. And I hope people, um, you know, just start doing the work wherever they can to start. Well, thank I don't you. think that adequately answered your question, but that's what I have. 
Well, it, your your answer honors the complexity of the task, which is what I was getting at. So <laughs> I'll, sure. I'll take the chair yeah. back. Uh, the sixth I, game changer was okay. is addressing and eliminating systemic racism and barriers to participation for all people. So can I, I, sh I should can I give that. two levers really quickly? Uh, I'm I'm out of time, so someone would have to ask you uh, the question. Okay. But if if you want to send no us an email, uh, um, I'd be happy to hear. Uh, further thoughts on all of that um, or comments on the blog post I mentioned from last weekend. Uh, it, it is the question of implementation. So um, uh, is there anybody else wishing to ask questions from members of council? Uh, am I able to field a question to Ferris? Uh, no, the questions have to come from members of council, I'm afraid. So perhaps oh, sorry, after... I you said two, perhaps, perhaps after... Um, uh, uh, October of 2021, some of you will be in a position to answer questions of panels like this. Um, so, uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Mayor? Yes, Councillor McKean? I'm back. Um, and, uh, and just to, and, uh, if Mr. Uh, Sabani can do it very quickly uh, on his two levers, I'd be happy to hear it, and then we could maybe be done. Sure. Well, I've still got that motion to deal with, so we'll need a couple more minutes to complete. Uh, can I just get a motion to complete the panel and the information motion? I moved. Thank you, Councillor Second. Patan, seconded by Councillor Knack. Uh, uh, I'll just seek unanimous consent rather than run the vote, if that's okay. Is there any objection to extend for just a few minutes? Not seeing any then uh, by unanimous consent, we'll adjust uh, orders. Um, Councillor uh, Hamilton notes she had to go, understood. Uh, we are beyond the allotted time. So, um, uh, Councillor McKean, go ahead. With yeah, questions. I was just interested in hearing Mr. Sabani's Mr. two yep. levers in one minute. Okay. okay. No problem. Uh, super quickly, I really want to make sure that City Council is not left off the hook. There are many, many avenues to generate revenue that, is not, that are not being looked at or pursued. One of them would be a land value capture tax. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail because it's, you know, it's, a, it's a big concept. It's being explored right now in Vancouver. Uh, the BCGU, the large public sector union in Vancouver, is pushing the municipal government on it. Uh, it's a huge form of revenue generation that the city is just giving tons and tons of money uh, to wealthy developers when it's a public good that is being exploited. Uh, when that revenue needs to be captured and used for municipal purposes. Another one is the Expropriations Act. We have an Expropriations Act in place. It gives the municipal governments power to take control uh, of land and give uh, what is a, a fair value to landowners, but is not the real value to the city and the public. And we need to greatly expand uh, publicly owned land, and we need to start using it to house people because there is a crisis. People cannot afford their rent. People are losing their homes, and the fact that the city is doing nothing on this right now is shocking. Right? Like, there is blood on people's hands because people are going to end up in the street. So we need to do something. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? I'm not sure we have that statutorily enabled authority, uh, even under the city charter, but uh, <laughs> that's an interesting suggestion. Um, the uh, uh, appreciate all of the wisdom of the, the panel here. I do have a quick motion with an information request to inform further uh, conversation about this. Uh, Councillor Paquette, if you could take the chair. I have the chair. Uh, and I wording may have changed slightly from the last version the clerk saw, so I will hit send on this presently. Uh, and it would be that of course, my screen's gone. Hey, where are on me here? That administration compiled the following data set with information from Edmonton Police Commission, if necessary, for the last um, 20 years up to the most recent complete year available in a machine readable format provided electronically to Council ASAP and published in the open data, the city's open data catalog, specifically total civic operating expenditure, total municipal tax levy collected, total expenditure on policing total tax levy operating funding allocated to EPS slash EPC, total provincial policing operating grants, total sworn members of EPS FTE count, total non-sworn EPS FTE count, total community operating grants, total fa community facility partnership grants, city housing expenditures, program operating and capital grants total, 
uh, total family and community support services expenditures, including administrative costs, FCSS grants from the Government of Alberta, and for real inflationary and population context, the population estimates and growth factors for each of these years, the general inflation factor we use for those years, specifically CPI, the municipal inflation factor we estimate for those years, aka MPI, the annual cost of living adjustment in the Police Association Collective Agreement, and Alberta Weekly Earnings Index change for each year. I will second that. Happy to take any questions. Just are, are we allowed to ask questions of the councillors? I'm afraid not. not. At this point. Uh, Mr. Mr. Mayor, just as, as a point, should we not do this as a, do we not need to vote to do um, a motion without customary notice? Um, you, yeah. Yes. We do. So I will so move. I'll move that you can make the mo motion without customary notice. Second. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, shall we vote? Uh, officially on this one? I would say so. Please vote. Yes. Okay. Are all the votes in? We're missing one vote. Clerks indicate they're missing one still. A couple folks indicated they were leaving, Mr. Mayor, so that could be it. No, it's McKean, I think. Oh, I, I said yes. I'm sorry, I don't have my vote bot. Okay. That's all the uh, votes. Display the vote, please. And that passes unanimously. Uh, now we'll take questions for the mover, if there are any. I'm not hearing any questions. Um, Mr. Mayor, would you like to close? Uh, just just to indicate briefly, this is not meant to be the be all and end all of, of data requests as there have been many others mentioned in this and also questions about how uh, these numbers might correlate to a variety of other indicators and, and also uh, charitable and provincial activity uh, that aligns with prevention. This is not designed to get at all of that, the main motion get set uh, some of those things, uh, so not to preempt that, but just to provide some of the financial context with raw data in a table um, that I tried to pull together out of the PDFs and, and I, uh, it will be more straightforward for the city to re retrieve this from the, um, uh, the city's databases, but, it, but in consultation with city manager it requires a formal motion. If I'd done an inquiry yesterday, it would be 12 weeks before we get this back so that's why it had to be a motion. Um, and, uh, and I want it to be accessible uh, to uh, the public as well uh, uh, for people to um, see the, the same information and provide their own interpretation of it as well uh, to um, uh, uh, points that um, were made earlier by, uh, by Jazz, for example. Um, so uh, anyway. Not to be all and end all of information, but um, important uh, financial context uh, for what the city has, has in fact done and what the province has done in certain areas um, where our levers are concerned over the last um, generation or so. Okay. And if no one else wants to hop on, um, with the understanding that this is just another step along the way of, uh, of engaging in this work, uh, please vote. Yes. We have all the votes. Display the votes, please. And that carries unanimously. I return the chair. Thank you, Councillor Priquette, for navigating that. Um, if it was budget, it wouldn't have required notice, but it's not budget, so it did. That was a good catch. Uh, I think that's our business for today. These hearings will continue at um, uh, Monday at 1.30 p.m. with panel eight and continue into Wednesday to uh, accommodate all of the registered panelists. Uh, so thank you all for your uh, presentations. And um, again, you can follow along continuation of these hearings at edmonton.ca slash meetings. We're in recess until then. Thank you. <laughs>